Welcome to the course. So this is just an introduction. In this lesson, we'll just look at the uh, introduction in terms of Microsoft Azure. Now you can see the exam number there. The official name is Developing Microsoft Azure Solutions. Quickest way is probably look for the exam number, which is 70-532. One of two exams you'll need to pass. The exam, according to Microsoft, test your knowledge of implementation, best practices and management of various Azure services. Now double check before you take the exam because this, uh, Microsoft reserve the right to uh, make changes. So just check. Create and manage Azure Resource Manager virtual machines. Design and implement a storage and data strategy. Manage identity application and network services. Design and implement Azure Compute, Web and Mobile Services. Now, um, who's the certification aimed at or who should take it? A whole bunch of people really, uh, especially if you find this kind of thing interesting. Project managers, business an analysts, project team members, solution architects. And by the way, this is just a suggested list. Um, as long as you find cloud computing interesting and it's such a fantastic career choice, I recommend you um, at least study the subjects. So um, you can add it to your resume even if you don't plan to take the exam. Uh, we've covered virtualization in other courses, creation of a simulated version of something, such as OS server storage device. You can run multiple OS uh, operating systems or multiple resources on the same server at the same time. Uh, we cover this definition in quite a few of our other courses actually, all the cloud stuff, virtualization courses and um, even the Network Plus actually. This will be an overview for those of you, and I hope you have, <laughs> have done some foundation uh, uh, cloud courses with us, uh, including the CompTIA uh, Foundation. Cloud computing is the use of a network of remote services, or servers, sorry, that are hosted on the internet to store, manage, and process data. I should say servers, sorry. Users no longer have uh, to no longer have to build and maintain computing infrastructures locally and pay only for what they use. The virtualization is a foundational element of cloud computing. It was actually uh, defined by Mike Adams, the uh, director of product marketing at VMware. So hopefully you got a nice big bonus that year. Virtualization allows us to create multiple resources, storage devices, OSs, uh, etc. on the same server. Cloud computing allows us to share a virtual server with multiple users over the internet. Now we'll look at the various types of cloud computing. Again, these uh, slides are a repeat of what we've done in other courses, but um, it's important that we we're on the same page before we launch into more stuff. Software as a Service (SaaS). -A -A this type of cloud computing provides answers to desktop needs for end users. Platform as a Service (PWAS). This type of cloud computing enables developers to create and test software without investing in expensive hardware. So a massive bonus to all of the developers there instantly saving on the um, equipment and hosting costs. IAAS, this type um, enables applications to run in the cloud instead of using their own infrastructures. Bad news, I guess, if you were working for the company supporting all of this equipment. <laughs> but uh, good news now because you're learning cloud, which uh, needs a lot of people. Now we'll look at the different type of cloud computing resources. Again, just an overview, hopefully building on what you learned in a, an earlier course, such as the CompTIA. These are the cloud computing resources an organization can use. This is obviously subject to change as time goes on. Email accounts, servers, virtual machines, data storage, websites, data backup. All right, so this lesson we've discussed uh, Microsoft Azure, just a, a real general overview um, of cloud computing, in, fa in fact. In the next lesson, we'll discuss some of the characteristics of cloud computing. Uh, there's a little challenge question. At the end, if you want to have a go without re-going uh, re over the lectures quite yet,
In this lesson we'll discuss the characteristics of cloud computing. A little bit dry this stuff but it's still need to know foundational stuff. And again, as I said earlier, I just hope this is a review. According to the NIST, cloud computing services consist of the below attributes. Elasticity, on-demand, pool computing resources that the provider site, monitored and measured service usage broad network access. So in the figure you can see that cloud computing has the five major characteristics. Measured on demand, the broad network access, the resource pooling and the rapid elasticity. We'll just have a an overview look of these characteristics Obviously they're discussed in far more detail in just cloud specific uh, courses. Elasticity uh, enables us to add or remove the cloud computing resources or users at any time based on the client's business activity. On the host and I use you can just slide the dial and get more um, resources and slide it back down. On demand users can access the service from anywhere, anytime and any place. Uh, this will increase the availability of cloud computing resources. So when you, if you're ever, ever logged in, for example, to Amazon, you can set stuff up in just a couple of minutes. Pooled computing resources. The cloud computing provider has to invest its money in proper hardware configuration and maintenance. The provider has to keep an eye on the physical infrastructure usage. So they're doing all of the hard stuff that you would have previously had to do if you were hosting all of this equipment. Monitored and measured service usage. Mostly cloud computing services will come with monthly subscription and usage fees. Cloud providers will charge by usage of measured resources like disk space and processing capability with respect to time. They often do deals as well and free trials as I'm sure you'll be able to avail yourself of. Broad network access. The client can access the services from any device, smartphones, tablets, laptops or desktop computers over the internet. In the picture you can see that the cloud services can be accessed from anywhere, just a nice little trendy icon or infographic I suppose that people like to use. So in this lesson we just covered some of the um, characteristics of cloud computing. In the next lesson we'll discuss some of the deployment models that are available for you to choose from. In this lesson we'll discuss the cloud computing deployment models. Based on the usage and availability, the cloud computing deployment models are classified as below. You've got private cloud, community cloud, public cloud or a hybrid. This will be a, a brief uh, overview of each of these uh, so solutions. I've put it in a graphic here for um, maybe you could do a screen grab. Used for a single organization, they can be externally hosted. A community cloud is shared by several organizations, typically externally hosted, but uh, can be internally hosted by one of the organizations. The public cloud is provisioned for open use for the public by a particular organization who also hosts the service. Hybrid is obviously a composition of two or more of the other solutions that you can see are available and these are bound together. 
you've got the uh, benefits of multiple deployment models as uh, internally and externally hosted. We'll just have a look at each of these in a little bit more detail. In the private cloud, in this type of model, organizations use their own hardware and software resources to achieve cloud services. This model mostly sticks to the uh, virtualization. In private cloud, organizations use their own hardware and software resources to achieve cloud services. This uh, model mostly uses virtualization. For the community cloud, the um, model consists of a pool of computer resources. These resources are available to the different organizations with common needs. Clients can access the resources quickly and securely. In this particular model, clients are referred to as tenants if the question uh, should pop up. Although clients are accessing the same computer resources, each has its own computing environment with its own configuration and data. These details are stored securely. For the public cloud, this cloud model services can be accessed by any internet user. These computer resources are available to all public users. Examples of this particular cloud model are Gmail, Google Docs and uh, Hotmail. In fact, I think Hotmail was the first in use, if memory serves me correctly. The hybrid is a combination of both private and public clouds. Oh, just some of the benefits, I'm sure these are pretty obvious to you anyway. You can use these for websites, backup and recoveries, archiving, disaster recovery, development and testing, is a huge one actually, big data, high performance computing, databases, digital marketing, e-commerce, big long list of stuff obviously, uh, application hosting, mobile services, the IoT, enterprise uh, computing, business applications, content delivery, health, gaming, close to all of our hearts obviously, media and entertainment, probably a much longer list if we spend more time thinking about it to be honest. So uh, in this lesson we discuss cloud computing deployment models. Next lesson we'll discuss the history of Azure. Thanks for watching. In this lesson, we'll discuss the history of Microsoft Azure. Azure was announced uh, back in October 2008, and it was released finally on 1st of February 2010 as Windows Azure. Eventually, it was renamed as Microsoft Azure on March the 25th, 2014. Microsoft Azure is a cloud computing service created by Microsoft. Its use, its purpose is to build, um, test, deploy and manage applications and services through a global network of Microsoft managed data centers. In 
it provides software as a service, platform as a service, and infrastructure as a service. It also supports many different programming languages, tools and frameworks. This includes both Microsoft specific and third party software and systems. We'll look at some of the Azure products available next. looking into these in more detail later. In Compute the available options are Linux virtual machines, Windows virtual machines, uh, virtual machine scale sets, web apps, app services, functions and batch. Storage and content delivery Some of the available products are storage, blob storage, disks, file storage, queue storage, data lake storage, or data lake store, sorry, store simple, and backup. Databases. You've got your SQL database, SQL data warehouse, SQL server stretch database, Cosmos database, PostgreSQL, MySQL, Redis cache, and Data Factory. Networking products for Azure include uh, the virtual network, load balancer, application gateway, VPN gateway, Azure DNS, CDN, traffic manager, express route, network watcher, security and identity, Security Center, Key Vault, Azure Active Directory, Multi Factor Authentication, Security Information, Data and Analytics Products, HD Insight, Machine Learning, Data Catalog, Data Factory, developer tools. These include Virtual Studio Team Services, Azure Dev Test Labs, Application Insights, API Management, Hockey App, for monitoring and management under Azure you've got Application Insights, Log Analytics, Automation, Backup, Scheduler, Azure Monitor, under Web and Mobile Services you have, uh, no surprise, Web Apps and Mobile Apps, API Apps, Logic Apps, CDN, and Media Services, Mobile Engagement, For enterprise integration, we have Service Bus, Store Simple, Data Factory, BizTalk Services, there's more than 30 uh, services for Microsoft Azure. All right, during the course, we'll discuss the most important services. Um, mainly looking at the ones that are covered in the certification of course. Uh, feel free to check through the documentation though to look at anything else that may apply to your business or that you're particularly interested in. Next lesson we'll look at the Azure Cloud. Thanks for listening.
In this lesson we'll discuss Microsoft Azure Cloud. Microsoft Azure provides on-demand cloud computing resources and services with a pay-as-you-go pricing model. So what is pay-as-you-go pricing? Well, the clue, <laughs> the clue's in the title, I guess. Pay-as-you-go pricing means that you only pay for the resources you use. Similar for how you pay for utilities such as electricity and water, obviously if that's the way it works wherever you live, you only pay for what you consume and once you stop using them there are no additional fees. Again this may differ in your country, you may have other fees on top. So obviously there's benefits to this particular pricing model in your favour as a customer. You pay for what you use, you no longer have to build and maintain costly infrastructure including all the servers and software licenses and all of the um, additional stuff you need to do to rack it and power it up. It allows you to adapt your changing needs at a lower cost. For example, if you wanted uh, more specs on your server, you normally have to buy another server and do all the migrations. Common ways to use Azure. There's a whole bunch of ways, really. Create a student lab, host a static website, store public or private data, process business and scientific data, host a dynamic website or web application, support students or online training programs. Azure offers a wide range of services that help us move faster and scale applications rapidly and with lower costs. We'll now look at regions, Azure fault, domains and availability sets. Azure operates in multiple geographies around the world. An Azure geography is defined by the area of the world that contains at least one Azure region. An Azure region is an area within a geography containing one or more data centers. Similar setup to Amazon by the sounds of it. Regions. Azure operates in multiple data centers around the world. These data centers are grouped into geographic regions. They give you the flexibility in choosing where you build your applications. It's more important to understand how and where your VMs operate in Azure along with your options to maximise performance, availability and redundancy. So you've obviously got a choice where your customers are if you're hosting some sort of public resource or where you are if you wanted uh, faster access. Within each region, multiple data centres exist to provide for redundancy and availability. So this gives you flexibility as you design applications to create VMs closest to your users and to meet any legal compliance or tax requirements. I won't go into all the complexities of your business being in one country and your equipment and data being in another country. Each Azure region is paired with another region within the same geography, together making it a regional pair. You do have the exception of Brazil South, which is paired with a region outside its geography. This is for, I guess, logistical re reasons on behalf of Microsoft, if you wanted to um, check their support site. The benefits of a paired re uh, region, physical location, platform provided replication, region recovery order, and sequential updates. Oh, sorry, and uh, data residency. Now there are some special Azure regions. These are special regions that you may wish to use when building out your applications for compliance or legal purposes. You'd have to obviously have a, a few people together on your business to work out what the best choice is here. And maybe a team of legal uh, people. Uh, the US government Virginia and US government Iowa. China East and China North, Germany Central and Germany North East, uh, 
for the US government, Virginia and Iowa. Physical and logical network isolated instance of Azure for US government agencies and partners. They're operated by screened US persons, so I presume security verified, security checked. Includes additional compliance certifications such as FedRAMP and DISA. If you want to um, Google those terms, if you need more information. China East and China North. These reasons are available through a unique partnership between Microsoft and 21 Vionet, whereby Microsoft does not directly maintain the data centers. Germany Central and Germany North East. These regions are available via data trustee model, whereby the customer data remains in Germany under control of T-Systems and Deutsche Telekom Company, OA Deutsche Telekom Company, acting as the German data trustee. This is the uh, pictorial representation of various regions of Microsoft Azure and the respective data centers. As always, this map will be updated from time to time by Microsoft. Green circle represents the generally available regions. The blue triangle is the coming soon. So perhaps by the time you come to do this course, the blue may have changed to green and there'll be more blue appearing. On to availability sets. This is a logical grouping on VMs that allow Azure to understand how your application is built to provide for redundancy and availability. It's recommended that two or more VMs are created within an availability set to provide for a highly available application. An availability set is comprised of two additional groupings that protect against hardware failures and allow updates to be safely applied, vault domains and update domains. In the picture there you can see that the Azure region with three fault domains and an availability set. This is where the instance has been shared across three different fault domains. Same way uh, we have to do it for different application roles. So in this image you can see the web tier, the application tier and then the data storage cluster. These have been shared across different fault domains in an Azure region. Now we'll take a look at fault domains. A fault domain is a logical group of underlying hardware that share a common power source and network switch similar to a rack within an on-premises data center, which I'm sure you're familiar with. As you create VMs within an availability set, the Azure platform automatically distributes your VMs across the uh, fault domains. This approach limits the impact of potential physical uh, hardware failures, outages, or um, power, in power interruptions. In Azure, a fault domain defines a group of VMs that share a physical power source and a network switch. You use availability sets to spread across VMs or spread VMs across multiple fault domains. When instances are assigned to the same availability set, Azure distributes them evenly across several fault domains. If a power failure or network outage occurs in one fault domain, at least some of the sets VMs are are in another fault domain and these will be unaffected by the outage.
And now we'll look at an example for the fault domain. Here uh, you can see the compute resource pool. It has fault domain 1, fault domain 2, and likewise up to fault domain whatever the number would be. In each fault domain we have a rack and their respective uh, applications, uh, application or applications have been installed. Below you can see each fault domain has a power supply and network switches. Here we can see that if web role application in fault domain 1 is down, you can access the same from any fault domain. So I like it there in a yellow, bright yellow. So in this way, we have to spread the application in a different fault domains for high availability. High availability. This uh, compute resource pool will be managed by a fabric controller. Uh, the fabric controller has provisioning, management, and system resource pools via the Azure portal. Moving on to update domains. An update domain is a logical group of underlying hardware that can undergo maintenance or be rebooted at the same time as you create VMs within an availability set. The Azure platform automatically distributes your VMs across these update domains. This particular approach ensures that at least one instance of your application always remains running as the Azure platform undergoes periodic maintenance. The order of update domains being rebooted may not proceed sequentially during planned maintenance, but only one update domain is rebooted at a time. When VM instances are added to availability sets, they are also assigned an update domain. An update domain is a group of VMs that are set for planned maintenance events at the same time. Distributing VMs across multiple uh, update domains ensures that planned update and patchy, patching events affect only a subset of these VMs at any given time. So in this particular graphic you can see that there are three fault domains, FD0, 1 and then 2. Now in the case of maintenance, one fault domain and one update domain will be re rebooted. It will not affect the update domains in other fault domains. The up do update domain maintenance window will be different for different fault domains, obviously. I hope it's obvious anyway. This will ensure the high availability of the application in the Azure region. Paired regions. In Azure, you use paired regions to support redundancy across two predefined ge uh, geographic regions, ensuring that even if an outage affects your entire Azure region, your solution is still available. Paired regions are usually separated by at least 300 miles. It's intended to ensure larger scale disasters only impact one of the regions in the pair. Neighbouring pairs can be set to sync database and storage service data and are configured so that platform updates are rolled out to only one region in the pair at a time. Azure, Azure Geo Redundant Storage is an auto automatically backed up to the appropriate paired region. 
For all of the resources, creating a fully redundant solution using paired regions means creating a full copy of your solution in both regions. In the image you can see the geographical region with the regional pair. We have to create a solution in both regions which are paired together. So this will ensure the redundancy and high availability of the application across different regions. Each Azure region is paired with another region within the same geography, such as uh, US, Europe or Asia. This approach allows the, uh, for the replication of resources, such as VM storage, across a geography that should reduce the likelihood of natural disasters, civil unrest, power outages or physical network outages from affecting both regions at once. Obviously nothing is impossible, but it's extremely unlikely due to the geographic distance between the two. Additional advantages of regional pairs. In the event of a wider Azure outage, one region is prioritised out of every pair to help reduce the time to restore for applications. Planned Azure updates are rolled out to paired regions one at a time to minimise the downtime and risk of application outage. Data continues to reside within the same geography as its pair. This is except for South Brazil uh, for uh, tax and law enforcement jurisdiction purposes. Some examples of regional pairs, primary and secondary, you can see them yourself, West US, East US, etc, North and West, South East and East. Uh, the ones on the listed on the left are the primary ones as marked in the table here. All right, this is the um, lesson we discussed Azure Cloud. Next lesson, we'll look at free trial. Thanks for listening. In this lesson, we'll discuss how to create a free Azure account so you can do lots of your hands-on practice and get some experience. For that, you have to go to the website address listed up at the top there and you can click on Start Free. Create a new account, a Microsoft account. You have to obviously put in your account details in the relevant boxes, uh, usually a email, password, a tick if you want to get any promotional stuff. Might be worth it if you want uh, updates on um, products, etc. It will send uh, an OTP code to whatever email address you've created there. After entering the code, click Next. You have to enter the CAPTCHA. And after doing the CAPTCHA, which normally takes me about three or four goes, to be honest, click on Next. country code and phone number. I've actually got a Skype phone number that I use for all of this kind of stuff. Just give it a, a 
few seconds to set up the account. You have to enter some more information. Uh, identity, um, identity and verification via phone. All right, card information. Click on next. Um, make sure you read up on it. You're not normally charged until the end of the free trial, and obviously, at which point you can cancel it if you so wish. Uh, agree to all the terms and conditions, and then sign up. And you've successfully created your Microsoft Azure account. Congratulations. You can click on get started with your um, Azure subscription. Obviously these boxes can change over time or they can change the design of the site. But the process should be pretty similar. So you've now successfully logged into the dashboard after creating your free trial account. Now you can see your subscription amount in the top there. So this is obviously the free trial. Now for accounts and subscriptions. The Azure subscriptions are grouping or a grouping of resources with an assigned owner responsible for billing and permissions management. Subscriptions are assigned uh, three types of administrator accounts. The account administrator, the subscription owner and the account billed for the resources used in the subscription. The account administrator can only be changed by transferring ownership of the subscription. Service administrator. This account has rights to create and manage resources in the subscription and is not responsible for billing. By default, the account administrator and service administrator are assigned to the same account. The account administrator can assign a separate user to the service administrator account for managing the technical and operational aspects of the subscription. Uh, there's only one service administrator per subscription. Co-administrator. There can be multiple co-administrator accounts assigned to a subscription. Co-administrators cannot change the service administrator. Uh, otherwise, they've got full control over subscription resources and users. This is the pictorial view of the accounts and subscriptions for Microsoft Azure and the account types that we mentioned. You can see the admin account will have full access to the Azure account. On the left side you can see the service admin and service co-admins that have access to the technical aspects of Azure. They can only manage and operate the Microsoft Azure resources. These two admins are not responsible for billing. Now we'll see uh, resource management. The term resource in Azure means any compute instance, storage object, networking device or other entity that you can create or configure within the platform. And we'll be going into all of this throughout uh, later um, lectures if nothing makes sense at the moment. Azure resources are deployed and managed using one of the two models, the Azure Resource Manager or the older Azure Classic Deployment Model. Any new resources are created using the resource manager model. Now we'll just take a brief look at the resource groups. The Azure resource groups that organize resources such as virtual machine storage and virtual networking devices. Azure resource is uh, always associated with one resource group. 
A resource created in one resource group can be moved to another resource group, but can only be in one resource group at a time. Resource groups are the fundamental grouping used by Azure Resource Manager. Resources can be also be organised using tags. Tags are the key value pairs that allow you to group resources across your subscription irrespective of resource group membership. Management interfaces. Azure offers several ways to manage your resources. Some examples are web management, shell prompt and CLI prompt and allowing you to manage these resources. We'll go into these as we progress through the course. Okay, we're in module two of the course now, the compute module, where we've got a few lessons to get through. And in the previous lesson, we successfully created a free trial account on uh, Azure. Now you can see the actual Azure dashboard, which you'll get used to, obviously, the more you log in and uh, look through it and look at the different features and go through the features. Uh, log into the account only and you'll see this window. On the left side you can see all of the Azure products and on the right you can see the dashboard features there. In the dashboard you can see service health. It shows the service health of your resources. If you select it You'll see all the outputs listed here. You go back to Microsoft Azure. You can see Marketplace and Quick Start tutorials here in the dashboard as well. And I recommend in your own time you go through those. As with anything, the more you play with it, the more familiar you become. If you want to create a new dashboard, just click on New Dashboard. Nice and easy. Drag and drop the products, uh, whatever you want to use, into the dashboard. So it creates a simple dashboard for you as soon as you drag the first product over. Add a few more, just drag and drop. This way you can add resources to the new dashboard. Once done, just click on Done Customising on the top there. I said before, these buttons may move as time goes on, but um, the process should be the same. So you can edit the dashboard that you can created. Just click on Edit Dashboard. If you want to remove any of the dashboard items, select that item and then click on Unpin from the dashboard. and off it goes. After that click on done customizing again and if you want to add any other resources just drag and drop here. So this is the way to edit the dashboard. If you want to see this dashboard in a full screen you won't be surprised to hear that you just click on the full screen button and you can see it's changed. Come out of that by clicking exit to full screen once you're done. If you want to clone this dashboard, click on clone. And again, if you want to add anything to this clone of your dashboard, just drag and drop. So this is a time saving utility here, quite handy.
After that, click on Done Customizing, and this way you can clone the dashboard as well. Now, if you want to delete it, you click on Delete Dashboard. Obviously, you get the confirmation as you do with any software challenging if this is really what you want to do. And you've successfully created the dashboard and their components and seen how to use the, um, the buttons on the top here. If you want to share this dashboard, click on Share. And you can see the sharing and access control. Dashboard is currently set to private. If you want to, you can rename the dashboard to Dashboard 1 or something that has a specific meaning for you or your company. After that, subscription type, then the check mark published to the dashboards. Select the location and click on publish. And in this way, you can share your dashboard. In order to share this dashboard, we require Azure role-based access control. Let's determine who has access to this dashboard. After giving the dashboard the name and subscription checkbox, the option Publish to the Dashboards Resource Group. So you have to check that little box there. Dashboard will be published to the Dashboard Resources Group. After that, you can select the region where you want to share the dashboard. You can see the drop down list there, which may expand or reduce, and then uh, click on publish there. So, this is the way you can share the dashboard to the dashboards resource group. So, in this lesson, we just had a quick whistle stop tour of the Azure dashboard. And next lesson, we'll be moving on to another topic. Thanks for listening. So this module we're going to be looking at virtual machines. It's the second lesson so far in module two, unless we add a remover of the lessons if the syllabus changes. Microsoft Azure is a growing collection of integrated public cloud services. It includes analytics, VMs, databases, mobile, networking, storage, and web, which we actually discussed all of the modules in an earlier presentation. Azure provides a scalable computing platform that allows you to pay only for what you use when you want to use it, without having to invest on on-the-site software. Azure is ready when you are to scale up your solutions out to whatever scale you require to service uh, the needs of your clients. So there's a few ways in which the Azure virtual machines can be used. Developing and testing. The Azure VMs offer a quick and easy way to create a computer with a specific configuration required to code and test whatever application you want to do. Applications in the cloud. Uh, because a uh, demand for your application can fluctuate from launch to uh, closure, it might make economic sense to run it on a VM in Azure. You can pay for extra virtual machines when you need to, and then obviously when you don't need to, you can shut down 
any particular resources you um, no longer need and then you stop paying paying for them uh, extended data center VMs in a Azure virtual network can easily be connected to your organization's network. Steps before creating a virtual machine. There's always a multitude of considerations when you build out an application infrastructure in Azure. These aspects of a VM are important uh, to think about before you start. Depends what level in the network you are, but there normally be a meeting take place and an agreement of who's going to spend the money. The names of your application resources you'll need, the location, where they're going to be stored, the size of the VM, maximum number of VMs that can be created, the OS that you're going to run on the, on the VMs, configuration of the VM after it fires up, related resources that the VM needs, on to naming. Uh, a VM has a name assigned to it and it has a computer name configured as part of the operating system, same as standard PCs. The name of the VM can be up to 15 characters. If you use Azure to create the operating system disk, the computer name and the virtual machine are the same. If you upload and use your own image that contains a previously configured OS and use it to create a VM, the names can be different. It's recommended that when you upload your own image file, you make the computer name in the OS and the VM the same. Onto locations. All resources created in Azure are distributed across multiple geographic regions around the world. Usually the region is called a location where you create a VM. For a VM, the location specifies where the virtual hard disks are actually stored. VM size. The size of the VM that you use is determined by the workload that you want to run. The size that you choose then determines the factors such as processing power, memory and storage capacity. Azure offers a wide variety of sizes to support m many types of use. This all obviously comes with experience and reading documentation and possibly an association with Microsoft support if you have access to their support. VM limits. Your subscription has a de default quota limits in place that could impact the deployment of many VMs for your project. Current limit on a per subscription basis is 20 VMs per region. You can drop a ticket to Microsoft and in um, request an increase. Obviously the higher level support contract you have, the faster you get support and that extends probably to phone support as well I'd imagine. OS system disks and images. VMs use virtual hard disks to store their OS and data. VHDs are also used for the images you can choose from to install an OS. Azure provides many marketplace images to use with various versions and types of Windows Server operating systems. Marketplace images are identified um, by the in, by the image publisher, offer and version. Extensions. VM extensions give your VM additional capabilities through post deployment configuration and automated tasks. These common tasks can be accomplished using extensions. Run custom scripts. 
The custom script extension helps you configure workloads on the VM by running your script when the VM is provisioned. So it's a time saving uh, device. Deploy and manage configurations. The PowerShell desired state configuration DSC extension helps you set up DSC on a VM to manage configurations and environments. Collect diagnostics data. The Azure, uh, the Azure Diagnostics extension helps you configure the, the VM to collect diagnostics data. This can be used to monitor the health of your application. So in this lesson we uh, discussed virtual machines. Next lesson we'll discuss the Linux VM. Thanks for listening. In this lesson we're going to discuss the Linux virtual machines. Pretty meaty uh, section this one, so buckle in and take some notes. The Azure Linux VMs provide on-demand, high-scale, secure, virtualized infrastructure using Red Hat, Ubuntu or the um, Linux distribution of your choice, whichever that may be. Now we'll see the practical sessions of how to create the Linux virtual machines in Azure. So we're back on our dashboard here, which we saw earlier. First, I have to create a SSH key pair. For that, you click on the Cloud Shell. And then select Bash Linux. Maybe you say Linux where you are, but uh, I'll uh, stick to Linux. So you have to first create storage. This storage will save all of the files related to the cloud shell. So it's creating the storage account for us. So the cloud drive has been successfully created. And now you can make use of Cloud Shell. You've successfully created a storage account for Cloud Shell, you can see here. After the creation of the Cloud Shell, you'll have to create the SSH key pair for our Linux virtual machine. So for that, run the command SSH-keygen-t RSA minus B, then you can choose your size. It'll create the SSH key pair for our Linux virtual machine. After that, you press enter. Press enter to proceed further. You've successfully created a key pair for that Linux machine. After creating the Linux machine, you'll have to create the virtual machine in the GUI.
you can close the um, cloud shell after creating the SSH key pair. Okay, so now how to create the Linux virtual machine in the GUI. Go to virtual machines and click on create virtual machines. You have to select the operating system here. I'll select the Ubuntu. I'll select uh, server version 16.04. You may have different options here by the time you come to do this yourself. I'll keep the default settings and just click create just for the purposes of the demonstration. Specify all the details for the VM. We'll give it the name Ubuntu VM. After that, select the VM disk type. The SSDs are all um, solid state drives that give high performance. HDD or magnetic, they give low performance. We'll select HDD again just for the purposes of the demonstration. Username will give us admin. After that, you have to select the authentication type. You've got the SSH public key and password. So you can use either, either of the two, you can see the options change. Previously we have created the SSH public key, so we'll use that public key here. We have to go to the cloud shell and run the command cat. What's that symbol, the wavy line, I don't know what it's called, forward slash dot SSH slash ID underscore RSA dot pub. It'll give the public key which we have created earlier. Copy this without any uh, spaces. You have to be careful that no spaces are um, added there. Then go and um, enter that public key. Here you can see the tick mark indicates that the public key is valid. And then you have to select the subscription. Selected page you go and after that you create a resource group. Here I'll create a resource group, um, i.e. AZ resource group. Select the location. I'll select South India, you obviously select wherever you wish. Uh, the admin account is not uh, valid, I'll put a uh, Callum P. And we'll go and click OK. Here you have to choose the size of the actual VM. These are the recommendations as given by Azure. If you want to see all of these sizes available, click on View All. You can see all the VM sizes that are available for this virtual machine. Quite a number to choose from, obviously. Here I'll select A0 Basic. After that you choose Select. 
you'll see more settings for the VM after you've done this previous step. You can see storage, network, extensions, auto shutdown, monitoring and so on. We'll see these one by one. In the storage you can see use managed uh, disks, no or yes. If you select yes, uh, Azure automatically manages the disk availability. These provide um, data redundancy and fault tolerance without creating and managing storage accounts um, of your own uh, cognizance. Here we'll select it as no, uh, we'll create our storage account ourselves. After that click on storage account. You have to create a new one for this virtual machine. You can specify the name, I'll put KP SIS storage. Name should always be in lowercase here. Select performance as standard. You can see the little information buttons here. And uh, re replication type is locally redundant. All right, click on OK when we've done that and it will create a new storage account. After that, network. Azure will automatically create a resource group for the network. Here I uh, will create a resource group manually for this network. I'll specify the name SI Network. After that, we'll keep the remaining options as default and click on OK. I'll keep all the default settings and I won't use any extensions here. Yeah, I'll keep auto shutdown as off, monitoring enabled, guest OS diagnostics is disabled. Again, we're just playing with different settings here so I could show you um, what they all do. You'll um, learn more as you become more familiar or you may have default settings for work. After selecting the field, you click on OK. Now you can see the summary of our virtual machine as it loads the information. Then here we go. So price per hour, summary of our virtual machine, Callan set this up in India so you can see it in India, rupees, after that I click on create. I don't know if he's getting good value there because I'd have to do a, good, a currency conversion and see how much he's been charged. But you, you, obviously you've got a free trial here so it doesn't cost anything. So our virtual machine has been created, it'll just take a little bit of time. You'll see it scrolling around. You can see the status of the virtual machine in the virtual machines tab. Status is creating at the moment. The Ubuntu, Ubuntu virtual machine has been successfully created and we can see the status has changed to running. In order to connect to this machine, just click here. Few options, obviously. Connect is the one we're looking for. Show you the command that we have to give in the uh, Cloud Shell. So if we go to the Cloud Shell, Pop in the command that we were told to add, which I'm just going to paste in to be lazy. After that, press enter, and you've successfully connected to the newly created Ubuntu virtual machine. Congratulations. Here we'll run a few commands to check whether it's working well or not. I'll install nginx uh, packages. For that, we uh, have to run the command dash sudo apt dash get minus y
and it'll update the package. After that the package will install NGX um, and you can see all the output here. After the command dash sudo apt dash jet get minus y install NGX and that will do what it says at the um, at the end of the prompt here. And we've successfully installed NGX. This will act as a web server on this particular Ubuntu server, like an Apache server. After creation of the web server, we'll see whether it's working well or not. You can close this shell when you've uh, done all this. And we have to open port 80 to enable the web view. Go to the resource group. Click on the network security group. And it will open a security group for the Ubuntu server. Just click on the inbound security rules and click on add. Select source as any, source port range as uh, asterisk, destination as AT and destination port range as AT, which is for um, HTTP. Name should be web traffic and click on OK. These settings will enable incoming web traffic for this Ubuntu server. You successfully create a security rule for the web traffic. In order to um, see whether it's been added or not, click Overview. We can see this port has been successfully added. Now we'll see whether NGX is working fine or not. For that you first have to connect to this Ubuntu server and check the status of the NGX. Or NGINX. Alright, so I've pasted in. Um, dash studio, pseudo system CTL status NGX you can see the status of the service that's running Nginx is running, go to the resource group and check the security group. Click on inbound security rules and check the port details. Source should be any, source port range should be asterisk, destination should be any. Uh, destination port range AT, protocol any, action is allow, priority set to 100. And this way we can specify the inbound security rules. Now 
Now we'll see whether Nginx is working fine or not. For that get the public IP address copy the public IP address and put it in a tab and you should see the welcome page for Nginx. So it's successfully installed on the server and it's all working well. If you got this far, congratulations. If you didn't, go back and have a play with it. Best way to learn. You'll now we'll look at other settings for this virtual machine while we're here. If we click here, we can see a few options for the virtual machine. Restart, stop and delete. We'll click on restart. It'll ask for confirmation, just click on yes. It will restart our virtual machine. And we can see the virtual machine has restarted successfully. If you want to check whether the VM has been successfully restarted or not, you can connect to it. And you just copy and paste as usual. And go to the prompt. Paste it in there. Run the command uptime. And you can see the VM has been stopped and the uptime is one minute, which is what we'd expect to see. After that, close this shell. A couple of more options there. If you want to stop it, click on stop. Click yes if you want to proceed to that, executing that command. And it'll stop the virtual machine running. And as you can see the status is uh, deallocating. If you see the status is stopped, deallocated in brackets. And now we can see how to delete this VM. Go back to options and there's a delete option there. Click on that and uh, yes if you want to execute that command. And as you can see the status is deleting. And that's it, it's gone. This way we can create and delete virtual machines in Windows Azure. Next lesson, we'll be moving on to another topic. Thanks for listening. In this lesson, we'll look at how to build a LAMP server stack. Note that we can build a new virtual machine from the different stack models, as you can see in the output here. Now we'll create a new virtual machine for this LAMP stack. For that, go to the virtual machines and click on create virtual machines. Select the Ubuntu server here. I'll select server version 16.04. You may have different options when you come to this uh, particular part. 
Select the deployment model as resource manager and click on create. I'll specify the name as LAMP server. Select the VM, this type as HDD. I'll have the username as CalanP. I have to provide the SSH public key here. I'll copy the public key and paste it in. After that we have to select the resource group. I'll select use existing i.e. the AZR AZ resource group and location of South India. You could um, choose your own location there when you're going through this. We have to choose the VM size. I've clicked on view all and I'll scroll down. I'll choose A0 basic and hit select. Here we have to validate the storage and network details. I will select use manage disk as no and I'll uh, storage account as KP SI storage. After that, validate the virtual network details. I'll keep the default settings here. Here we can see the diagnostics, uh, diagnostic storage account. I'll change the storage account to KPS, i.e. storage. And after that, click on OK. Now we can see all the details of that virtual machine. After that, click on Create. It'll take a little bit of time to create this uh, virtual machine. You can see the status by clicking here and you can see the status is creating. Now it's changed to running and we can connect to this server now. Just click on the connect option here. And you can see the command we have to run, which you can copy and paste, the SSH command. Paste that in and press enter. Type yes when prompted. And you've successfully logged into the alarm server. First step we have to do is update the packages, run the command sudo apt update, and after that press enter. This will update all of the packages. This will take a bit of time. And now you can see they've all been updated. Now we'll install the LAMP server. Run the command sudo apt install LAMP dash server the up key, press enter. This will install Apache, MySQL and PHP on this LAMP server. 
press Y to proceed further. Have to give the MySQL password. Press Tab and then press Enter. After that, retype the MySQL password. Press Tab and then click OK. You can see the progress bar running here, 5%. Lamp server insulation hits 18% and so on and so forth. It'll take a little bit of time to complete this part of the process. We've successfully, successfully installed Apache, MySQL and PHP on this server. They can check whether all the packages have been successfully installed. Try the Apache server first. Run the command Apache 2 minus V. You can see the server version and the build date. Check whether this Apache is working through the GUI. For that, you have to open port 80 on this server. And click on networking. Here we'll add the new inbound port rule. We did, did, did this earlier actually on a different video. Specify the service as HTTP. Click on Advanced and you can see all of the available options. I'll select the protocol as NE. After that, click on OK. This will create a new inbound port role for port 80. And we can see that port 80 has been successfully added. Now we'll go to the virtual machines. And we'll test whether the Apache server is working or not for this LAMP server. Go to the LAMP server, copy the public IP address and paste it into a tab on your browser and you can see the Apache web page. So we can pr prove off that the Apache server has been successfully installed on the LAMP server. Now we'll check whether MySQL and PHP has been successfully installed or not. For that we have to go to Cloud Shell, run the command MySQL-V. And press Enter. You can see that the MySQL server version has been successfully installed. And we'll see how to secure it. For that you have to run the command MySQL underscore secure underscore installation. And after that hit the enter key. Enter the root password. After that, press Y to proceed further. You have to select the password validation policy. Just for ease of use, we'll keep it as low. Uh, we'll ask whether you want to change the password or not. We're not changing it at this moment in time. 
After that it will ask to remove anonymous users and I'll select Y. After that it will ask to disallow root login remotely and I'll select as Y. After that it will ask to remove the test database and access it. Access to it, sorry. I'll select as no because I don't want to remove the database. After that it will ask to reload the privilege tables now. We'll select Y. And press enter. And this way we can secure the MySQL. If you want to create a MySQL database, add users or change any configuration settings. You have to log in using the command mysql-u root-p. Press enter. We have to give the password for the root access. And you can create the database and add users to the SQL here. When done, run the command forward slash Q. And this is the way you can work on uh, MySQL. We'll check whether PHP has been successfully installed. Run the command PHP minus V. You can see PHP version has been successfully installed on this LAMP server. If you want to test the PHP server, run the command dash sudo sh minus c. In fact, <laughs> there's a long command there, I'm not going to read it all out. Hopefully you can pause the video and um, enter this command. After that, press enter. Here will create a .info.php page under the var forward slash www forward slash html directory copy the public IP address uh, here and paste it into a tab type forward slash info dot php in the address bar so access that test page and you can see the PHP details here are listed. All right, so that proves off that PHP has been successfully installed on the LAMP server. So we've covered a lot here, LAMP server. Uh, we're going to be discussing a new topic in the next presentation. Thanks for listening. In this lesson we're going to discuss the LEMP stacks. You can see we're on the dashboard here. We'll go and create a new virtual machine. You'll be familiar with this part of the dashboard I'm sure. Create virtual machine. We'll select the Ubuntu server again, version 16.04. Uh, deployment model as resource manager and click on create specify the name as LEMP stack I'll select the VM disk type as HDD I'll specify the username as Callen P Copy the SSH key from the command line. We'll paste it in here. 
I'm sure you I'm going over this fairly quickly because we've done it before use the existing resource group click OK select the VM size view all we're going to go and use the same uh, option as before a zero basic and then click select Uh, select the use manage disk as no and storage account as KP SI storage. Let all the remaining settings be the default. And click OK. You can see the summary of your virtual machine you've created. Click on create and it'll take a little bit of time to uh, create this virtual machine. You can see the status under virtual machines. Just give it a moment to update. Uh, it's creating. Now you can see the status of the Lempstack virtual machine is running. Uh, click on connect. Uh, copy the SSH connection details and paste it in your cloud shell. Hit enter and yes. You can see the Limpstack virtual machine has been successfully installed. Um, install the Nginx MySQL and PHP on this Limpstack. You have to run the command dash sudo apt and then update and press enter. It'll update all the packages on this virtual machine. Packages have been successfully updated. So we'll install Nginx, MySQL and PHP on this uh, LEMP server. You'll run the command sudo apt install, well you can see the command there nginx mysql-server php-mysql php php-fpm quite a mouthful maybe uh, pause the video to give yourself a bit of time take a little bit of time to install these packages uh, you have to give the uh, MySQL password and press tab and then uh, enter then retype the password after that press tab and enter uh, the process is going on now as you can see and it'll take some time to install these packages Now the packages have been installed successfully. We can hit clear. Now we need to check the installation. Run the command nginx minus v. And you can see the version installed here. Check whether nginx is working fine. Um, open port 80, go to the virtual machine and click on networking. Add the uh, inbound port rule here. Service is HTTP. 
click, click on advanced and check the options protocol as any click on OK if you're happy with all that which I am this will open up port 80 this is the port 80 inbound rule has been successfully created so we'll check whether the Nginx is working copy the public IP address new tab here and you can see that it's successfully installed and is all working fine now we'll check for the MySQL installation MySQL minus V successfully installed we'll check PHP now where you run the command PHP minus V you have to back up the configuration of Nginx You have to run the command that's on the screen. So I suggest you pause the video for a moment because there's a bit of a mouthful and then you press enter. Now after that, you have to edit the Nginx configuration file. Run the command dash sudo dash sensible dash editor. Choose the editor, so we'll select three here. Uh, we'll replace this file here, and for that we have to remove all the files. So we'll replace the file with the content below. In the server name we have to provide a public IP address that the of the LEMP stack virtual machine. And then we save this file and then we'll quit. We'll see whether this file has been successfully edited or not. For that we run the command cat and then the uh, file path. Should paste it in here. Press enter. You can see the file has been successfully edited. Now we'll check for any syntax errors for this Nginx configuration file. For that, you have to run the command sudo nginx minus t and press enter. You can see that the Nginx configuration syntax is OK and the test is successful. After that we have to restart the Nginx service. We're in the command dash sudo service Nginx restart and press enter. So the Nginx service has been successfully restarted. If you want to see the status, you're in the command sudo service nginx status. Here we can see the nginx service is active and running. To make use of the PHP by nginx, you have to run the command sudo sh minus c. In fact, you can see the whole command there again. It's a bit too much for me to um, dictate out. When you've entered it, press enter. 
you can now make use of the PHP using the Nginx web server. You can see whether it's working uh, using the um, Nginx web server. Give the uh, public IP address and then the add the info.php to the address bar. Press enter. And the PHP page has been successfully loaded. So you can conclude that the PHP is working fine. All right, so that's all we need to discuss about the LEMP stack for now. We'll be moving on to a new topic next. Thanks for watching. So in this lesson, we're going to discuss the mean stack. We're already in the dashboard, so we'll create a virtual machine for this mean stack. For that, we'll go to virtual machines, create virtual machines, and Ubuntu 16.04. Select the deployment model as resource manager and then click on create. Now we'll specify the name of this virtual machine as mean stack. We'll select the VM disk type as HDD and we'll do the usual SSH key here, which we'll copy here and paste up here. I'm going through this fairly quickly. Uh, Calium P and uh, the existing resource group. Just saying we're going through this quickly because we've done it before. I'm selecting South India and then OK. Choose the size. View all and scoot all the way, all the way down to A0 basic. And then select. Then I'll select the use manage disk as no. And the uh, virtual network, KPI storage. Virtual uh, network settings, default, default, and default all the way down. Let all the remaining settings be default and then click OK to proceed further. Here you can see all the details of your virtual machine. Click on create to proceed further. Take a little bit of time to create this virtual machine. And you can see the status from the virtual machines tabs. And here you can see the status of the mean stack. Virtual machine is currently creating. And then it moves to running status. Now you create to the virtual machine and create a mean stack. For that, click on connect and copy the SSH command. After that, open the Cloud Shell. Paste the SSH command here and then press Enter to proceed. Type yes. 
and you've successfully logged into the MeanStack virtual machine. First we'll install node.js. This is a JavaScript runtime built on Chrome version 8 JavaScript engine. Now you'll see how to install the node.js here. For that you have to run the command sudo apt-get install minus y node.js just as we have displayed on the screen here. And then press enter. This will install node.js on this server. Here we can see that Node.js has been successfully installed. After that we'll install MongoDB. It stores data in the flexible JSON-like documents. Now you'll in, uh, see how to install the MongoDB on the server. And this MongoDB we're adding book records for our testing purposes like a book name, ISBN number, author and number of pages. We have to run the command sudo apt-key key server key server ubuntu and then key name. This command will, command will set the Mongo database key. Now run the command echo. This will show the Mongo database packages. After that we have to update the package manager with the Mongo database key. After that press enter. It will update all the packages with the Mongo database key. So packages have been successfully updated and we'll install the Mongo database here. For that you have to you know, run the command sudo apt-get install minus y mongodb. and then press enter. It'll take some time to install this Mongo database. Here we can see that the Mongo database has been successfully installed and after that we have to install body parser package. This will help us process the JSON request to the server. For that we have to install the npm package manager. And in order to do that the command is sudo apt-get install npm. And then press enter. Press Y to proceed further. Take a little bit of time to install the NPN package. And it looks like it's installed. After that you install the body, par body parser package. For that you run the command sudo npm install body dash parser. And press enter. Takes a bit of time to install the package. And you can see it's successfully installed.
Let's create a folder called books under the home directory. For that the command is sudo mkdir books. And then press enter. And you've successfully created a folder called books. After that run the command cd books. And here we have to create the server.js file. You can get those configuration files from the course content. Just copy and paste here. Just create the file server.js. For this you have to run the command sudo vi server.js. And press enter. You can get these file details from the course content. Just copy that and paste it here. Press I in order to edit this VI editor. After that paste the details over here and save this file. You have to click escape and enter colon WQ um, exclamation and press enter. So it's been saved. Now we'll check whether it's been successfully saved or not. For that you run the command cat server.js and here we can see that the server.js file has been successfully created. And now we'll install Express. Express is a minimal and flexible node.js web application framework. It provides uh, features for web and database. Here's used to pass book information to and from our MongoDB, our database. To install Express, we have to run the command sudo npm install Express mongoose. Mongoose provides a straightforward schema-based solution to model our application data. Mongoose is used to provide a book schema for the database. After that press enter. This command will install Express and uh, press enter. It'll take some time to install Express. And it's been installed here. Now we'll go to the books directory. And we'll create one more folder called apps. For that we have to run the command sudo mkdir apps. and run the command cd apps. Now you have to create the root start.js with the express route defined. This route.js will set up routes to the server. Run the command sudo vi routes.js And then after that press enter. Copy the details from the course content and paste it here. And now we'll save this file.
Now we'll check whether this file is created or not by running the command cat routes.js. We can see the file has successfully been created. After that we have to create a folder named models under the apps directory. Run the command sudo mkdir models. And press enter. Then run the command cd models. Here we have to create the book.js file. This file contains a book model configuration. We will create this file by running the command sudo vi book.js. And after that, press enter. Copy the book.js and paste it here. And after that, save this file. Now we'll check whether this has been successfully saved or not by running the command cat bootjs, cat bookjs. And we've successfully created the bookjs. After that, we have to access the routes with AngularJS. This provides a framework for creating dynamic views. So we go to the books directory. And we have to use the command cd dot dot forward slash dot dot. And we can see we're in the books directory here. And we have to create one more folder called public. So sudo mkdir public. After that, press enter. And then we have to go to this public directory. For that, we have to run the command cd public. This file will control a configuration uh, defined. Create a new file by running the command sudo vi script.js. And after that, press enter. Copy the details of this file and paste it here. And save this file and then quit. Now we'll check whether or not this file has been successfully created or not by running the command cat script.js. And we can see the file has been successfully created. After that we have to create index.htm file in the public folder. For that they have to run the command sudo vi index.htm. Copy the index.html detail files and paste here. And then save this file. Now we check whether this file has been successfully saved or not by running the command cat index.html. And you can see the details of that file. After that, you have to go to the books directory and for that run the command cd. So we're currently in the books directory. And you have to run the application here. Run the command node.js server.js. And 
after that press enter. You see the servers up and the details of the server here. Now we'll check whether this application is working or not. You have to open port 80 for this mean stack. Go to virtual machines and click on networking. Click on the inbound, uh, add inbound rule. Select services HTTP. Click on advanced and validate all the details here. Select the protocol as any. And this will create a new security rule for port 80. And here we can see that it's been successfully created. And you have to add one more inbound port rule. For that, click Add Inbound Port Rule. And you have to give the port ranges 3300. After that, click on Advanced. And then click OK. This will open the port 3300. And then click on OK. So it will create a new rule for that. And we can see that port 3300 has been successfully created. And now we'll test the stack. We have to copy the public IP address of this virtual machine and paste it into a new tab. Add 3300 in the address bar, which is a port. And you can see the application is running successfully and we can see the details. Now we'll add a few details here. Specify the book name as Java Applet. ISBN number is 1234-5678. Author is Steve. Pages as 400. And then click on Add. and then refresh that page and you can see that it's successfully been added we can also delete these details here if you wish you just click on delete and then refresh the page and you can see these details have been successfully deleted and removed from the database This way we can create a book database and add remove the details accordingly using the mean stack. This lesson we've discussed using the mean stack. In the next lesson we'll move on to another topic. Thanks for listening. In this lesson we'll see how to install the WordPress package 
on a LAMP server. For that we have to go to the Cloud Shell and connect to the virtual machine. Copy the SSH login details as you can see on the screen there and paste it in on the shell. Now we'll see how to install WordPress. For that we have to run the command sudo apt install WordPress. and then press enter. This command will install WordPress and press Y to proceed further. And we can see the progress of that installation. It takes some time to complete this installation and you can see the WordPress package has been Install successfully. Clear the screen and you have to configure WordPress now. For that we have to run the command sudo sensible dash editor forward slash etc forward slash WordPress forward slash config dash localhost dot php as you can see on the screen in fact. This will open the config localhost.php file in an editor. After that press enter. And enter these lines. Here in the database password replace the old password with the new password of the MySQL which you created earlier. And uh, save this file and quit. We've successfully edited the file and we'll check whether the file has been successfully edited or not by running the command cat and then the file name. Here we can see that the uh, it's been successfully edited. You saw how to do the SQL earlier as well in an earlier video. And now we configure WordPress. After that we have to create a database for WordPress. We have to run the command sudo sensible dash editor wordpress.sql and this will create a new file wordpress.sql. Paste these lines and save this file. We have successfully created the wordpress.sql. Now we'll see whether it's been successfully created. Run the command cat wordpress.sql. You can see the commands for the creation of the new database for WordPress. To execute this command we have to run the command as you can see on the screen <laughs> you have to pause the video I think and write that down and then type it in press enter and we've successfully created a database for uh, WordPress After that we'll delete the wordpress.sql, that's uh, no longer required. For that run the command dash rm wordpress.sql You can see wordpress.sql has been created. After that you have to move the wordpress installation to the web server document root. 
run the command uh, as you can see on the screen with all the forward slashes and press enter after that you have to execute one, co one command to move the WordPress installation to the web server document root as you can see on the screen and after that press enter and you've successfully created the WordPress and database for it also we've successfully moved the WordPress installation to the web server document root now, now we'll test whether WordPress has been working correctly or not for that you have to copy the public IP address of the virtual machine paste it into a new tab add WordPress in the address bar press enter and you can see that WordPress has been successfully installed and is working correctly here we have to specify the information needed here I'll go to I'll give the test um, title of test site and we'll give the username Callion P enter the password checkbox to confirm the password and then the email ID and discourage search engines click on WordPress install WordPress sometimes WordPress does an update and this changes this particular screen so it'll be as this is or similar after that click on login here give the username and password we've successfully logged into the dashboard of WordPress you can customize WordPress here If you want to create a new page, we can do so here. If you just want to see the view of your site, you can click on view your site. Again, these, these buttons may have moved because WordPress regularly does major updates. So this is how we install WordPress on a LAMP server. We've discussed WordPress now. In the next presentation, we'll discuss another feature from the exam syllabus. Thanks for watching. In this lesson we're going to look at installing Drupal on an Ubuntu server. We um, covered the Ubuntu server earlier, the installation uh, procedures. We'll take a backup of the HTML first. For that we have to run the command sudo mv forward slash var well you can see it here www.html dot bkp this command will make a backup of the HTML directory after that press enter we'll create a backup directory by running the command sudo mkdir 
here we'll create a backup directory running the command mkdir forward slash Drupal. After that we'll create a hard link for this Drupal directory which is var www.html as you can see. After that press enter. Now we'll install additional modules for this Drupal. For that we have to run the command studio apt install and you can see the um, PHP commands there. Press enter. Why to proceed further? And you've successfully added additional packages here. After that we make the Apache read write module. For that we have to run the command sudo a2enmod rewrite. And after that we have to restart Apache. You see the command here, Apache 2 service, Apache 2 restart. And then we edit the Apache configuration. Studio VI and then the Apache configuration file. After that press enter and here we have to edit the Apache configuration file. In this configuration file we have to edit the directory var www and we have to change the allow override to all. And then we have to save this file. Alright, we've saved the file and now we have to download Drupal. Go to the Drupal directory and then we create a temporary directory here by running the command sudo make directory forward slash temp after that give full permissions to this de uh, directory um, sudo chmod triple seven forward slash temp We'll download the Drupal software here. For that go to the directory forward slash temp and in this fo uh, folder we'll download the Drupal software. Run the command wget and then the path of the Drupal software. And it's been successfully downloaded. We'll check now running the command is dash lai ls sorry and here we can see the Drupal software has been successfully downloaded after that we have to extract the software after that you're in the command sudo tar dash zxvf And you have to um, edit and um, quote the Drupal tar file there. And press enter. This command will extract the Drupal software.
Now we check whether it's successfully extracted by running the command ls lai dash lai. And you can see that the new folder Drupal 8.4.2 has been created. Now you'll copy this Drupal 8.4.2 folder with the Drupal directory which we created earlier. For that you have to run the command sudo rsync avp and then the Drupal home directory and then the home username Drupal. Press enter when done. A copy all the files to the Drupal folder which we created earlier. All the files are copied to Drupal. And now we'll check whether it's been copied or not by running the command dollar command cd Drupal forward slash. After that, run the command ls-lai, and we can see that all the files have been successfully copied. Now run the command cd sites forward slash. After that, go to default and run the command ls dash lai. Here we have to copy settings. Here you have to copy the settings PHP to default dot settings dot PHP. For that, we have to run the command sudo. So you can see the commands sudo cp settings dot PHP and then default dot settings dot PHP. Settings dot PHP. After that, press enter. After that, you've done that, press enter. New file has been command again is ls uh, so dash lai. You see, the new, see the new files have been successfully created. created. Now, give permissions to the Drupal directory. Run the command sudo chown dash r, then the username, group name, and Drupal. Here the username is Callium P and the group name is www data. After that, press enter and it's been successfully renamed. This command will update the ownership of Drupal. After that, we'll give the uh, permissions to this directory. For that, we have to run the command sudo chmod dash r g plus w and then Drupal. After that press enter. We've successfully added ownership and permissions to this folder. For that we have to run the command mysql dash root dash u sorry root dash p. After that enter the mysql password and we've successfully logged into mysql. After that run the command create database Drupal. After that, we'll create a user. 
a Drupal and the password Drupal. And we have to grant permissions to this particular user. For that we run the command grant all on Drupal dot asterisk to Drupal and press enter and once done we quit from my SQL. Before installing Drupal in GUI we need to add, um, edit the HT access file. Go to the Drupal directory and run the command ls dash LIA and you can see the HT access file here. To edit this file you run the command sudo vi dot ht access and here we have to edit the rewrite database uh, the rewrite base sorry here you can see that we have to edit this line here press i to edit this configuration file and then you can edit the line after that save this file and restart Apache and we've successfully restarted we're now good to install Drupal in the GUI copy the public IP address of the virtual machine and paste it into a new tab and you can see the Drupal 8.4.2 installation wizard is there choose the language save and continue After that you have to select the profile, I'll select standard and then click save and continue. Then we have to give the database details. I'll specify the database name as Drupal. Add the username as Drupal and password as Drupal. After that click on the advanced option and we can see the advanced settings. Save and continue and you can see the installation is in progress. Here you can see the installation has been complete, uh, completed. Give the site name as test Drupal. Uh, email address next. After that, we have to specify the site maintenance account details. I'll give the name as admin. After that, enter the password. Select the regional settings. I'll select India and IST. Uncheck the uh, option there, updates automatically. Save and continue. You can see a warning for this configuration here. All the necessary changes have been made, we just have to remove the uh, right permissions.
we can do that later. Here we can see Drupal has been successfully installed. To view our existing site, just click on the existing site. We can see the Drupal web page and we can see that Drupal has been successfully installed. Now we'll see how to add content to this Drupal website. For that, just click on content. Click on add content here. After that, select basic package, no, basic page, sorry. And give it any title, I'll, I'll put basic type something into the body select text uh, format as basic HTML uh, you want a preview And you can see the preview of this particular page here. Go back to continue edit, uh, to continue editing. If you want to edit, click on save. And so the basic page has been created. Click on basic here and it will show the page. content we can add web pages to this website. If you want to organize these web pages we have a click on structure and we can modify the structure here. If you want to change the appearance go to appearance. After that if you want to add any extended plugins then click on extend. Select configuration to configure the file settings. Select people to add people or users here. Click reports to see the reports. To get any help just click on help here. So you can see um, so far how to install Drupal on the LAMP server. Thanks for watching, I'll see you in the next lesson. In this lesson we'll see how to install the Moodle on a newly created LAMP server. We covered LAMP servers earlier so refresh yourself if you need to do that. First we log into this virtual machine here and connect. As usual uh, copy the details and you can paste them into the cloud shell. After you've done that, press enter. And yes, to proceed further. You've successfully logged in to the newly created virtual machine there. And we have to update the packages. Run the command sudo apt dash get update. You'll update all the packages. Alright, all the packages have been successfully updated. We have to next install Apache My, uh, MySQL and PHP here. For that we run the command sudo app-get install and then the respective package names. 
press enter to proceed further you have to give the mysql root password and then retype the password After that, it takes some time to install all these packages. All the packages have been successfully installed. And after that, we have to install additional software packages that support Moodle. Command on the screen, sudo app-get install, and then the respective package names that support Moodle. You can um, uh, pause the screen I think and do that. It may take some time to install the respective packages. And you can see that that's happened. After that you have to restart Apache, sudo service Apache 2 restart. And press enter. Apache server has been successfully restarted. We're using git core to install Moodle. For that purpose we have to install an additional package. sudo apt-get install git-core After that press enter. Here we can see the git core application has been successfully installed. Now we'll download Moodle. For that you have to run the command cd forward slash opt and we'll download the um, Moodle software here. After that we have to run the command sudo git clone and then the path and then press enter. This command will download Moodle in the OPT directory. Take a bit of time to download the software. All right, you can see it's all been downloaded successfully. Check whether it's working, you can uh, use the command ls dash LIA and you can see the Moodle directory has been created there. Now run the command cd Moodle after that press enter after that uh, here you have to retrieve a list of each branch available for Moodle For that you run the command sudo git branch dash a and then press enter and you can see a list of branches available in Moodle. We'll use 33 stable branch. For that you run the command sudo git branch and then the track branch name press enter here we can see that the branch Moodle has been used further
After that, finally, we have to check the Moodle version. sudo git checkout moodle underscore 33 underscore stable and we can see that the branch is up to date after that come out from this directory And then we have to copy the Moodle data to var www.htm. For that, you have to run the command sudo cp dash r and then the source and destination. This command will copy all of the Moodle data under html, and after that, press enter. Now we can see that the data has been successfully copied and the Moodle data directory under forward slash var. You have to run the command sudo mkdir var and then Moodle data. And then press enter. After that you have to change the ownership of this Moodle data. Run the command sudo chown minus r www dash data and then the directory name. And you have to change the permissions as well. You can see the command on the screen. Uh, permission 777. So this is full permissions to this directory. After that you have to change the permissions for the Moodle directory which we've copied under HTML. And the command you can see there tmod minus r 0755 and then the Moodle directory and press enter. We've successfully changed the ownership and permissions of the respective Moodle directory. After that we have to set up MySQL. Uh, MySQLD.cnf file and you can see the command um, sudo vi and then the configuration command. After that press i to edit this file and then add the default storage in the line here. You can add one more line the InnoDB file per table and you add one more InnoDB line. After editing this configuration file and quit, save it and quit. We can check whether this is successfully created or not by running the command cat after and then the file name. You can see that the other three lines have been successfully added to the configuration file. After that you have to restart the MySQL server. Uh, sudo service MySQL restart. And it will restart MySQL server. Alright, that's successfully restarted and now you have to create a database for Moodle. MySQL minus U and root minus P. Enter the password. T 
So you're logged in now to SQL, you can see by the command prompt. And we'll create a database. Run the command shown on the screen, a bit too much for me to uh, read out. And then you can press enter when you've done that. After that you create a Moodle user and a password for that user. For that run the command shown on the screen and press enter. We've successfully created the database. After that run the command shown on the screen to grant permission to the Moodle, Moodle user. Unfortunately it's so long you just have to pause and um, type it out. So you get a bit more used to typing the commands out. Maybe make a note of them as well. So you can issue the command quit now to quit from this SQL. And now we'll proceed with the in, uh, installation of Moodle in the GUI. Before proceeding to that we have to change the permissions for that Moodle directory. Uh, this command should be executed during the initial installation of Moodle. Execute this command here. After completion of Moodle installation we have to run back this command and revert the changes for this Moodle directory. We have to rerun this command um, but I'm not going to run the command at the moment. Now we'll see how to install Moodle in the GUI. We have to open port 80 as usual. And for that we go to the server and select network and then click add inbound port rule. Select services HTTP and then advanced and check all the settings. Change the protocol to any and after that click on OK. It create a new inbound port rule for this virtual machine. Here we can see that rule for port 80 has been successfully created. Now we can now we can go to the virtual machines. Select the public IP address of that virtual machine. Copy the public IP address and paste it into a new tab and add Moodle in the address bar. Copy the public IP address and paste it into a browser and you can see the installation page for Moodle. First you have to choose the language. Here I'll choose the language as English, press enter. And here we have to validate the paths. Uh, here we change the data directory, i.e. var forward slash Moodle data. Click next. And you choose the database driver here. And we use the uh, MySQL I type. Specify the details here. Database is localhost. Database name is Moodle. Uh, username we'll just put as Moodle. Enter the password for that user. I'll keep the default settings for the tables prefix and then click on next. After that we have to accept the conditions and click to continue and proceed further. Here we can see the environmental checks for Moodle server. 
and the status of all the plugins. Here we can see the statements that your server environment meets all minimum requirements. After that you can press continue to proceed further. It will take some time to install Moodle Server. And here we can see the installation status. You can see the status of the respective plugins here. And the installation of all the plugins is successful. Uh, the process is continuing as you scroll down actually. All the plugins have been successfully installed. Click uh, continue to proceed further. After that we have to create the site administration uh, administrator account. Here I'll specify the username as admin. After that we have to specify the first name and the surname here. Here I'll give the first name as Callion and the surname as P. And we'll just issue the test at test.com as the email address. Is there any additional names we can give them additional names here there's the options tab if you want to fill those in and then you can click on the update profile button after that you have to edit the front page settings And here we have to give the full site name. Here I'll give the name as Moodle Test. After that I'll give the short name as MTest. After that we have to give the front page summary. Here we'll type the front page summary as Hi, welcome to our website. After that I'll select the location, sessions as Asia, Kolkata. After that new settings and manage authentication. Select it as disable and save. Uh, successfully now logged into the Moodle dashboard. Now we'll see different options for Moodle. This is the dashboard. Here we can see course overview, private files, online users, latest badges, calendar and upcoming events. You can see the course names by clicking on the courses here. And after that you'll see the site home here you'll see the available courses that we can add a new course also here we have to specify some details course names as Moodle course just for example After that I'll select the category as miscellaneous. 
and I'll keep the remaining settings as default. After that we give the description I give the description as hi welcome to the Moodle course and here you can add the files by drag and drop I'm not adding any files as of now next we can see the course format I'll keep all these settings as default and next we can see appearance here we can see the appearance details and I'll keep all the default settings files and uploads we can edit the maximum upload size here and next we can see completion tracking Our next tab is group keep all the default settings here and then you can see role renaming I'll keep all the default settings for this one too last I'll click on save and display and here you can see the Moodle course web page if you want to enroll in this course just click on enroll users I'll select the assign the role as a student and then click on enrol then click on finish enro enrolling users in this way we can enrol to the, mod um, the Moodle course you can see that a new user has been enrolled in their respective time and date here on the left side you can see the, the uh, M course page just click on that you can see all the details on the course here and the participants list and the participants and their respective usernames after that you can see the badges and here you can see all the Moodle badges and then you can click on competencies here you can see the course competencies and then we can see grades here you can see the grades for the respective users and the course topics here these are the topics of the course and this is where we can create courses using Moodle after that you'll see a few more options just click on site home here you can see the available course pages which we have created earlier in the calendar we can see events and subscriptions and below you can see the monthly view as well after that we'll see private files and how you can save the private files just drag and drop files to add here and finally we can see the site administration So administration you can see notifications, competencies and badges and if you want to add anything you can do so here. You can add users and you can change 
permissions. Uh, if you're not in any courses, you can add here and also take a backup of courses. After that, you can see the grades and report settings here. If you want to add any plugins, we can do so in, under the plugins tab. And you can see many settings like antivirus plugins, authentication, etc., etc., all here. After that, you can see appearance. If you want to change the appearance of the website, we can change here. After that, we can see the server and email settings here. Uh, you can see reports and you can generate reports here. And finally, we can see development. Development and experimental settings. You'll see uh, now how this website looks when a new user logs in. Uh, we'll do an incognito, incognito window. The main page looks like this. If a new user wants to enroll, they just click on the Moodle course. After that, they have to log in uh, to this website. We can create the same courses that can have guest access. Just give a try whenever the guest access is there or not by clicking login as guest. You can see that guests can't access this particular course. This Moodle course has not been enabled for guest access. Alright, so this is how to create Moodle on a virtual machine. And we can create respective courses on the server. Well, the next lesson we'll look at uh, Windows Server, I believe. So, thanks for watching. In this lesson we're going to discuss how to deploy Jenkins on a Linux virtual machine. Let's get into it. We've created an automatic uh, configuration and implementation that configures a Linux, a Linux virtual machine. We're going to. First uh, we have to go to the Cloud Shell. Successfully logged into the Cloud Shell. Now we'll create uh, an automate configuration for the Linux virtual machine. For that, we'll use the Cloud Init file. We'll run the command cloud in it jenkins.txt. Press enter. Press I to edit this file. Here we'll paste the pre configuration that should be implemented on a Linux virtual machine. This is the initial configuration that should be implemented on the Linux virtual machine. And here we can see a package upgrade is true and we're giving the right, uh, we've got the right files here. After that we'll run these commands and save this file and quit.
We'll see if this file has been successfully created or not. For that we'll run the cloud init jenkins.txt and press enter. And you can see the cloud init configuration has been created successfully. We'll use this configuration to create a new virtual machine. I deploy Linux uh, Jenkins on the Linux virtual machine. For that, uh, we'll uh, first create a resource group. We have to run the command AZ group create name, the resource group name, and then location. You can um, write down these commands and then put them in when you come to do the lab and then you press enter so the resource group has been successfully created and we'll create a virtual machine here for that we run the command az vm create and then the resource group name After that, the name of the virtual machine and the image name, uh, the admin username you can see here, VM and size is a, a zero basic, uh, generate the SSH keys, custom cloud data in it Jenkins.txt, which we created earlier. Uh, we'll press enter at this point. This may take some time to create this virtual machine. Now we'll see whether this virtual uh, machine is created or not in the GUI. Here we'll see the Linux virtual machine has been successfully created and you can see the power state, private IP address and public IP address. You'll see in GUI as well whether or not the virtual machine has been created or not. And you can see it's in running state which is good news for us. You've successfully created Linux machine and installed Jenkins on that virtual machine. After that we have to open two ports for this virtual machine. And for that we have to run the command. Listed here. <laughs> I can't read all that out, it's too much. So if you... Um, just pause the video for a moment and write it down or put it in a text file even better. We're opening the port 8080 for this Linux VM. Priority 1001, press enter. And we've successfully opened up the port. After that we have one more to open. And for that we run the above command, port 1337, priority 1002. All right, we've successfully opened up the port 1337. After that, grab the public IP address of this virtual machine. For that, we have to run the command azvm show resource group, etc., etc. This is the public IP address of this virtual machine. Now, we'll log into the VM machine by running the command ssh username and then the public IP address. 
public IP address is the IP address of the virtual machine and press enter. Type Y uh, yes or Y to proceed further and we've successfully logged into the Linux virtual machine here. Now we have to grab the initial admin password for Jenkins. For that we have to run the command sudo cat and then um, several other commands after that which you can see. The initial admin password will be here and we have to use this admin password to use Jenkins further. Here we can see that there's no such file or directory. We have to wait for some time to create this file. It's because the automatic configuration is doing a few changes on this virtual machine. Try the command after a few minutes. We'll run the same command again and we can see the admin password for Jenkins. Copy this password. Now we we'll use it to log into the Jenkins admin portal. Make a note of that public IP address of this virtual machine and password that should be used to log into Jenkins uh, admin portal. After that we will paste the IP address into the new tab. Give the public IP address of this machine and also the port number in the address bar. You can see it's 8080 here. And you'll see the Jenkins portal. We'll log in to the portal by giving the username as admin and then enter the password we have copied earlier and then click login. We've successfully now logged into the Jenkins portal. After that you have to install the GitHub plugin. For that you go to Manage Jenkins. Here we have to click on Manage Plugins. After that click on Available here. And we have to search uh, for the GitHub plugin. And you can see the one that we need to install on this Jenkins. Click on download now and install after restart. This GitHub plugin will be downloaded and then installed. Here we can see that the respective plugins are being installed. And you can see the related plugins all down here as you scroll. You can see they will be activated during the next boot. Now we'll restart Jenkins as the installation is complete and there's no jobs running. We can see that Jenkins is restarting. It may take some time. Automatically Jenkins will be reloaded after a successful restart. Here we can see the GitHub plugin has been successfully installed.
After that, we go to the GitHub website for Azure sample repositories. For that, we need to open the new browser tab. All right, go to this website. You can see the URL on the top there. You will have to register with the GitHub website. After that, just click fork. Forking is our samples, da da da, you can see there. And you successfully forked the Azure samples, hello world. After that, we have to integrate the Jenkins service. For that, go to the settings and click on integrations and services. Uh, click on add service here. And then we have to select Jenkins here. Here we have to choose the Jenkins GitHub plugin. Uh, we have to uh, create the Jenkins hook URL which we created earlier. Paste it in here. You give the Jenkins IP address along with the port number and then the GitHub webhook. After that, click on Add Service, and we've successfully added the Jenkins service in GitHub. After that, we'll create a Jenkins job. For that, we have to go to the Jenkins portal and then click on create new jobs here. Type the username and password to log into the Gen uh, Jenkins portal. After that, we have to enter the job name here. Here I'll enter the name as Hello World. Choose the Freestyle project. After that, click OK. And we've successfully created a new job. Here we have to choose the GitHub project. Here's the URL which we have forked in GitHub. After that, to go to the source code management. And we have to select the Git. After that, we have to give the fork repository which we have given in the GitHub. You can see it here listed. After that, go to Build Triggers and select GitHub Hook Trigger. And then select Add Build Step under Build tab. Here we have to select the execute shell. Type echo testing in this window. And then click save. And we've successfully created a Jenkins job. Now we'll test GitHub integration with Jenkins. For that, go to the GitHub portal.
and here we have to edit the index.js. After that, edit this file. Uh, we'll edit typing welcome to my world instead of hello world. After that, click on preview changes. You see the changes in line six here. And then you can commit changes. And then go to the Jenkins portal. Changes we have done will be appear under the build history. This way we can test the GitHub integration that we've done. Each time we commit in the GitHub, the webhook reaches out to the Jenkins and triggers a new build. Now we'll see whether the note.js app running is based on the Git as a comments that we have to build a darker image to run the app. Darker image will build from the file. Now we have to log into the Jenkins server. For that we have to log into the IP address. And uh, after that press enter. Go to the Jenkins workspace directory. And type ls. You can see the directory is hello world and we have to go to that hello world. Type ls. And we have to create a docker file in this directory. After that you can press enter. Enter these lines and then you can save this file. Make sure all the lines are properly copied. And we've successfully created this file. Uh, we check whether this file has been created or not by running the command cat docker file. And here we can see that this file has been successfully created. This docker file uses the node.js image using Alpine Linux. Exposes port wonderful three seven to the hello uh, that the hello world app is running on. It copies the app files and then initializes it. These are all the files that are captured from the GitHub website. Now we'll create some Jenkins build rules. For that we go to the Jenkins portal. For that we have to go to configure. Scroll down to the build section here. Remove the echo testing and click here. And after that, select execute shell here. We have to enter these lines here. Here the docker build uh, creates an image and tags it with the Jenkins build number. Any existing containers running the app are, sto are stopped and then removed. Here a new container is started using the image and runs node.js app based upon the latest um, commit commits in GitHub. And after that click on save.
To test the pipeline, go to the GitHub uh, website. After that, click on index.js. After that, click on edit. Here I'll edit the file as hello, welcome, and after that I've committed the changes. Here we can see that commit has been successfully applied. Now we'll test whether this docket is successfully working or not. For that, copy the public IP address and paste it into a new tab along with the port number 1337. You see the page is successfully loaded after we press enter. Now we'll do another change in index.js. Hello here, I will click on edit. I will type uh, welcome to my world. Click on commit changes. And here we can see that a new commit is in progress. So commit has been successfully done. Now we'll retest this web page and just click on refresh. You can see welcome to my world is now showing. In this way we can see the Jenkins file and Docker are working fine. Uh, we'll look at a few more options in Jenkins in the last couple of minutes now. Uh, here we can see the project is created with Hello World. If you want to add any new item we can do so here. If you want to add people, we can here. If you want to see build history, we can here. Here you can see the build history of that project. If you want to manage Jenkins, you can do so here. Here we can see configure system. Configure global security, configure credentials, and then we can configure many settings here. After that, we'll see my views. Here we can see the currently running project. You can see last success, last failure, and last duration. And we can also see the build history. After that we can see the credentials. If you want to add any credentials this is the place where you would do it. A system, add any domains or um, other factors I think you can add here. If you want to change the admin password you can do so up here. Click on configure. You can change the password here. I'll change the admin password and click on save. Uh, you can change the admin password and um, manage Jenkins from here. So this is the way we can build apps and we can work accordingly. We successfully tested Jenkins on uh, Docker on a Linux virtual machine. 
I'll remove the resource group and delete the virtual machine now. For that we quit the Linux VM and go to the Azure console. You can see the command that we have to issue. That deletes the resource group and the VM. Press enter to proceed further. Alright, so I hope you enjoyed the lesson. We'll move on to something else in the next lesson. Thanks for watching. In this module will look at um, creating virtual machines in the cloud shell. We already used the cloud shell in some um, some of the earlier lessons here. So there's no virtual machines present as you can see. This time we'll use the command prompt to do that. So instead of using the GUI the GUI. So obviously we need to be in the cloud shell as we are now and we'll create a new virtual machine in here. Uh, the first thing you need to do is get all of the VM Im images that exist in Azure. You're in the command AZ VM image list and then output table as you can see here. This command will provide the most popular uh, VM images in Azure. Obviously your output may differ over time uh, to mine as they add or remove different images. If you want to see all of the images that exist in Azure, we have to run the command. AZ image list, output table and we append all to the end. This will give you all of the images, which will obviously be a fairly large output. You can see the warning messages um, been displayed on the top there. And you can see the command has successfully been executed here. And the list is pretty long. So in this example we'll create an Ubuntu server virtual machine. In order to get the right Ubuntu VM image we have to run the following command. AZ VM image list offer Ubuntu server all output table and you can see where we need to have the spaces and dashes there in the output. This command will list only the Ubuntu server images and we'll select one image among them and we'll use it to create the virtual machine. Press enter to run the command. And you can see from all the output here that the command has been executed. All of these are the Ubuntu uh, server VM images that exist in Azure.
we'll select this VM image here to create our Linux virtual machine. Don't worry too much if it isn't there when you come to do your lab you can pick something nearby. After selecting the VM image we have to select in which region we have to install the virtual machine. There are many regions that exist in Azure as you saw in an earlier presentation. Now in the region we need to know the VM sizes. So if you want to check the VM sizes in East US we have to run a command to do so. All right, AM VM list sizes, location, East US output table. So this will give us the VM sizes that exist only in East US. And here we go. Here's the list as of uh, now. In this example, I'll install a Linux virtual machine in South India region. For that first, we'll get all the VM images that exist in the South India region. Look at, and we're in the command. So these are all your options. Here we'll select the basic A0 VM size. So we've selected VM image and VM size and now we're ready to create a Linux virtual machine. And before proceeding with the creation of the virtual machine we have to create a resource group. So these are all the steps we took when we did it on the GUI. A command is fairly long, I've pasted it in here, az group create um, name IG Linux VM location South India and you can press enter to execute the command. Here we can see that resource group has been successfully created. Now we'll create a virtual machine using that resource group. Okay, this is the command we issue to create a Linux virtual machine. You can stop the video, write it down. This is a um, AZVM create. Resource group name RG Linux VM. Name of the virtual machine and the image we've uh, selected. Size is basic A0. Then we have to generate the SSH keys, which obviously does as it says on the command there. Uh, press enter at the bottom, and you can see the status of the creation of the virtual machine there as running. You could also see if you drop back into the GUI, you could see it was creating there. You can see the virtual machine has been successfully created. And you can see more details of the machine here. MAC address, power state, VM is running, private address. Public IP address that's used to connect to this VM and um, a resource group name. So this way we can create a virtual machine using the command prompt. Now we'll see the different commands to work with this in uh, to work with the Linux virtual machine.
we'll see what the IP address is that are connected to the VM. You have to run another command AZVM list IP addresses resource group RG Linux uh, VM output table. This command will list the public and private IP addresses of that virtual machine. Make a note of the public IP address that's used to connect to the VM. Now we'll see the status of the Linux virtual machine. For that we run the command azvm get instance view. And after that the virtual machine name. You can see resource group and query. You can see the power state of that virtual machine and we can see it's in running state. Now we'll connect to this VM. For that we have to run the command SSH and then the public IP. Press enter. Yes to proceed further. And we're successfully logged into this um, Linux VM. If you want to see which user's logged in, run the command who am I? Here we can see that this VM has been created for the user Kalyan. We'll now log out from the virtual machine. Command is pretty easy, just type exit and you can see you successfully logged out. Now we'll see a few more commands that are related to this virtual machine. You'll see how to stop a Linux virtual machine in the command prompt before this. I pasted it in here to save time the azvm stop command resource group and then the name press enter this will stop the Linux machine temporarily and you can see the command has been successfully executed now we'll see the status of uh, this virtual machine For that we have to run the command azvm get instance view and after that the name of the VM resource group name and query. Got a lot to type and you can see the uh, state of the VM has stopped. And now we'll look at restarting this virtual machine. For that we have to run the command azvm start the resource group and then the name. After that press enter and this command will restart the stopped virtual machine. Here we can see that the command has been successfully executed and we'll check the status of this virtual machine for that we run the command azvm get instance view and then press enter here we can see the status of the machine is running
and I will see how to delete the resource group and their respective Linux virtual machines. For that we have to run the command az group delete the name and no wait and then yes. This command will delete the resource group and their respective virtual machines. After that press enter. May take a little bit of time. And you check whether the Linux VM and resource group are deleted or not. And it's uh, deleting currently is the status. And you can see the virtual machine has uh, been successfully removed now. Well now we'll see whether the resource group is also deleted. And you can see the RG Linux VM resource group has also been successfully deleted. So this is how we create virtual machines in the cloud shell. We move on to a new topic, but thanks for listening. In this lesson we're going to see how to automate a configuration using cloud init for a Linux VM. We'll also create a key vault and we will secure a web server. We're going to implement an SSL configuration on a Linux VM using cloud init and a, a key vault in Azure. For that we'll have to do a task we're pretty familiar with now which is create a resource group. You can see there's only one resource group that exists here at the moment. We'll create a new one. Uh, we'll do that in Cloud Shell because we've used the um, GUI a few times. So obviously we need to be in the Cloud Shell. Run the command az group name name RG Linux VM location South India after that press enter here we can see the resource group has been successfully created we can check whether or not it's actually there if we wish in the resource group and there we go Now we'll create a key vault for our Linux virtual machine. Key vault can be configured in two ways, in GUI or CLI, the command line interface. Here we can see the key vault details, obviously in the GUI. We can see there's no existing key vaults here. Now we'll create a new key vault using the command line interface. For that I'll go to the CLI and we'll create a new key vault. First we need to define a name, a key vault name. It should be unique and we will have to enter the name in a lowercase. After that, press enter. I'll 
pasted in uh, the command there, which you can um, some of the values, which you can stop and uh, look at yourself and write down. Now we have to run the command az key vault certificate create. Name of the certificate and then the policy. After that, press enter uh, to proceed further. Some time will pass while it creates this certificate. And you can see that the key vault certificate has been successfully created. And for production use, we should import a valid certificate signed by a trusted provider. This is just to practice the commands. In this example, we've generated a self-signed with an AZ key vault certificate create. Now we'll check whether the certificate has been successfully created or not. For that we have to go to certificates. Select certificates here and we can see um, my cert. You can see that the certificate has been successfully created. We can validate uh, the certificate that way. All right. After that, we create a secret key for this certificate. You have to run the command secret vault name, certificate name, and policy. You can see the values here. After that, we have to specify the VM secret in this format. So this way we can create a secret key for the key vault. Now we'll see whether this key has been created or not. For that, we have to go to the key vault and select secrets. And you can see the secret has been created. If you want to see the keys, we can see them in key the key section. Go to the secrets and keys. Uh, the secrets and keys are su successfully created. Now we'll embed these secret keys and certificates in the Linux VM during its installation. For that, we'll use cloud init. Cloud init will be used to customize a Linux VM during its first boot. For that, we have to create a new file. You're in the command vi cloud um, init.txt. After that, we have to paste the configuration that is to be configured during the first boot of the virtual machine. In this file, you can see the package upgrade is true. The package nginx is installed. Write files with owner and path, port 443 command, certificate and key pair that we created earlier. Write files with the owner and path, port 443, um, and the certificate values here. After the, we give uh, issue these commands, we'll specify the uh, contable run at the time of boot. Save this file and then quit.
this file will automate the configuration of the Linux virtual machine during its initial boot. The file has been successfully saved. Now we'll see whether or not the file is working. For that run the command cat and you can see the file has been successfully created. Now we'll create a Linux virtual machine with cloud in it automatic configuration and the keys which we have created earlier. For that we have to run the command az create a vm create resource group name virtual machine name image admin name size of the vm generate ssh keys uh, cloud custom data where we have to specify the automate uh, configuration we wish to use and then secrets which we created earlier and then press enter might take a few minutes for the command to execute then we can validate the virtual machine details in the GUI alright we can see the v v VMs in creating state VM automatically installs Nginx and their respective packages that are specified in the automate configuration. Here we can see that the VM has been successfully created. You can also see the details of the VM like MAC address and power state private and public IP addresses and the resource group name. Make a note of the public IP addresses here. And in the GUI we can see the status of the VM is running. Now we have to open uh, port 443 for this VM we just have to run the command azvm open port the resource group name, the virtual machine name and the port number that we have to open after that press enter here we can see the command was successfully executed and port 443 was open Now we'll test whether the secure web server has been created or not. For that grab the public IP address of this virtual machine. A uh, long command there to run which hopefully you'll pause the video and make a note of. Here you can see the public IP address of the virtual machine. Copy it and paste it into a new tab. The C connection is not private. Click on advanced and then proceed to the website. You see the welcome to Nginx page there. So Nginx has been successfully installed. Uh, SSL layer keys and certificates are also successfully installed and working. So this is a uh, a way to create a secure web server. After the completion of it you can delete the resource group. The command um, is shown on the screen there. And that ends in no wait and then yes. Then press enter. 
So that will delete the resource group and the resources related to that resource group. So that's how to create a secure web server with SSL. That's the end of this lesson. Thanks for watching. In this lesson we're going to look at how to create a Windows virtual machine. For that we have to go to virtual machines and click on create virtual machines. You see all the selections here. I'm going to select Windows Server this time. You have to choose the server version from the options on the right. I'll choose 2016 data center. Here I'll select the deployment model as resource manager and after that click on create. and we have to give the virtual machine name. I'll specify it as a Windows VM. A disk type I'll choose as HDD. Username as CaliMP. And I'll enter the password. and then retype it. Select the subscription as page you go and we'll create a new resource group for this virtual machine. Select create new for resource group and I'll specify, specify the resource group name as rgwinvm After, the, after that we have to select the location. I'll select the location as South India and after that click on OK. Now we have to choose the VM size. Click on view all to see the available VM sizes. Here I'll choose the VM size as A2 Basic. Click on select. Click on storage as yes. After that we'll keep the default settings. If you want to add any extensions you can do so here. Just uh, click the extension topic and you'll see what you can and can't do. Click on Add Extension to add it. If you want any additional software, this is where you can add it. Click on Load More to see more options. This way you can add any extensions that you wish to. For the purposes of this uh, lab we're not going to be adding any. Just click on close. And we'll keep the auto shut down as off. Select monitoring as disabled. And select the guest OS diagnostics as disabled. Click on OK to proceed further.
Here we can see the overview of that virtual machine. You see the details and the summaries here. If you're happy with everything, you can click on create. And the creation is in uh, progress. You can check the uh, VM creation status in virtual machines. Just refresh. And you can see the status is creating. It may take some time to create this virtual machine. And you can see the Windows VM has been successfully created and the status is running. Now we'll connect to this virtual machine. Click on the VM. Click on connect here. After that, it will download the RDP file. Just open up that file. Click on connect. After giving a username and password, we have to click on yes. And you can see the session firing up. All right, you can just close this particular window. You can see the Windows VM is successfully running and it's loaded on our local machine. I'll just click on yes. Just, just to close the wizard. Now we'll install IIS software to create this virtual machine as a web server. For that just click on Windows, select Server Manager here. Here we have to click on Add Roles and Features. Click on Next to proceed further. And we have to select Role Based or Feature Based Installation. After that click on Next to proceed further. And here we have to choose on which virtual machine um, and which server we're installing. We're installing on the same server, so just select Windows VM here. You have to choose option Select Server from the Server Pool and click Next to proceed further. You have to choose the web server that is the IIS service. So choose this option. This will pop up a new wizard. Click on add features to add any features from this web server. And we're not adding any additional software so just click next to proceed further. Just read the details of this web server and then click next to proceed. And here we can select the additional features for that web server. I'm not going to add any additional features of now so just click on next. These options can be modified later as well. Just click on next to proceed further. Here we can see the summary of that installation of the IIS server.
After that, uh, click install and we'll start the installation of the web server. Installation will take some time to complete. Here we can see the web server has been successfully installed on this Windows virtual machine. Just click on close to close the wizard. After that we have to open port 80 and we'll test whether the web server is working correctly or not for this virtual machine. In virtual machines we have to go to the Windows virtual machine and uh, here we'll click on networking. Add a new inbound rule. Click on add inbound. Here I'll select the services HTTP. After that click on advanced. Select the protocol as any and after that validate all the details here. And then click on OK. This will add a new security rule for port 80. Here we can see that port 80 has been successfully added. Now we'll test whether the web server is working correctly or not for the Windows VM. Go to Virtual Machines and select the Windows Virtual Machine. Copy the public IP address and paste it into a new tab. And here we can see that the web server of the VM is working fine. So it's all been validated up to this point. Now we'll see how to add tags to this virtual machine. Go to virtual machines and select assign tags. Just uh, want to add a new value, just click on the plus mark. So we can add tags to the virtual machine this way. We're not going to do that uh, at the moment. Just click on cancel. And now we'll look at how to delete this virtual machine. Click on the dots and then delete. Make sure they uh, prompted you to make sure that's what you would do want to do. So this will delete this particular virtual machine. Uh, you can see the status is now deleting. and the virtual machine has successfully been removed. After this we'll remove the resource group for the virtual machine. Just go to resource group and then select the resource group name. And Then you can click delete resource group. You have to retype the resource group name that you have to delete. The resources that are assigned to this resource group will also be deleted here. After validating these details, just click on delete. So this will delete the resource group name which we've created for the Windows Virtual Machine. and you can see the resource group has been successfully removed. Alright, so we've created our Windows Virtual Machine and seen how to connect to it. We've reached the end of this particular lesson. I'll see you in the next lesson. Thanks for watching.
In this lesson we're going to look at creating Windows Virtual Machine through PowerShell. Quite a lot to this so you'll probably be looking at this uh, lesson a couple of times through. Maybe one time through without doing anything um, hands on and then another time follow along and pause the video. You can see we're in the GUI and there's no virtual machines present. So we're going to create a VM using uh, PowerShell. For this uh, purpose we go to Cloud Shell and we have to choose the PowerShell up here. Click on Restart and after the restart it will load the PowerShell. Here you can see the PowerShell has been successfully loaded on the command prompt there. After that type clear, you'll uh, look at the existing VM images for the South India region. Here's the command to do it get us or RM VM image publisher. This will return a list of image publishers. We've specified location South India and you can see all the images that exist in the South Indian region. Here we'll use uh, Microsoft Server. Now we'll look at how to list the images with specified uh, output parameters. We're, try we're trying to install Microsoft Windows Server. So I'll run a command that filters only the Microsoft Windows Server offerings. You run the command Azure RM VM image offer the location and then the publisher name. This command will list our only filtered publisher's name that um, belongs to Microsoft Windows Server. After that press enter and here we can see the three offers that exist in this region Now we'll see how to filter both the publisher and offer names in that specified region. For that we have to run the command get us all RM VM image SKU the location publisher name and offer. After that press enter. So these are all the existing Windows Server editions that exist in our particular region. We'll use the 2016 Data Center Server. And we've opted for the 26 Data Center Server just here. Now we'll see what we uh, what the existing VM size is exist at this particular location. For that, for that we have to run the command get to so RM VM size and location. These are all the existing VM sizes which we can use to build our Windows Server. Here I'll use basic A2. So we've chosen the Windows Server, the version and then the VM size. Now we'll see how to create a virtual machine in the PowerShell. For that, first we have to create a resource group name. 
you run the command new as or rm resource group resource group name and then location After that, press enter. We'll see that the resource group has been successfully created. We can also verify whether the resource group has been created or not in the GUI. Go to the resource groups and here we can see that the resource group has been successfully created. After that we'll see how to create a virtual machine. Before creating the VM we need to create the subnet uh, virtual network. Also the public IP address, network interface card and network security group. So let's look at creating the subnet first of all. For this the command is uh, the subnet config new azure rm virtual network subnet config name and then address prefix. After that press enter. This will create a new subnet with the name my subnet. So we've successfully created the subnet here. After creation of the subnet you'll have to create the virtual network. For that we have to run the command vnet new azure our own virtual network resource group name and location. You've got the name of the resource group, location, address prefix, subnet, um, the subnet config. After that, press enter to proceed further. Here you can see that the virtual network has been successfully created. Now we'll see whether or not it exists in the GUI. For that, click more services and search for virtual network. We can see the option there has appeared. You can see that my VNet has been successfully created under the resource group. Uh, this is the, uh, the, the way to validate the creation of the virtual network. OK, we have to create the public IP address next. For that, we've pasted in the command pip new azure rm public ip address, the resource group name, location, allocation method, and then the name. After that, press enter. The output object of this type will be modified, so you may see have a different option when you come to do it. You can see the public IP address has been created. Now we'll see whether the public IP exists in the GUI or not. Click on more services and search for public IP address. Here we can see that the my public IP address has been successfully created for the resource group. If you want to see the details just click on my public IP address. This is the IP address that has been assigned for this public IP address. After the creation of the public IP address we have to create the network interface card. For that, run the command NIC new resource 
RM network interface and resource group name. Location, name, subnet ID and public IP address. After that press enter. So the virtual network interface has been successfully created. Now we'll check whether this virtual interface card exists or not in the GUI. Click on more services and search for network interface card. Click on network interface. And you can see that my NIC has been successfully created for the resource group. If you want to see the details, just click on my NIC. You can see the private IP address and public IP address that are assigned to this network interface card. After that, we have to create security group rules. Here I'll create a security group rule for the port 3389. Long command here, the NGS rule, new Azure network security rule config. And then you can see the output below, the name of the security group, the protocol, direction, priority, source address prefix, source address range, destination address prefix. And then um, destination port range is 3389 which should be used for RDP. Access will be allow. After that, press enter. This will create a new rule for RDP port 3389. After that, I'll create one more rule for port 80 that can be used to work on the web server. For that we have to run the command nsg rule web new resort rm network security rule config so same command as before you see we're just um, it's tcp and we're looking at destination port 80. You can press enter there and you've successfully created two rules for the security group. Now we'll create a security group for this virtual machine. For that we have to run the following command. NSG new Azure RM network security group. The resource group name, location. Uh, the name and security rules. Here we have the security rules that we created earlier. After that press enter. The new security group has been successfully created. Now we'll check whether this security group is actually existing in the GUI. Back to more services and search for network security groups this time. Here we can see that the My Network Security Group has been created for this resource group. If you want to see the details, just click on the um, that My Security Group. Uh, these are all the rules and we can um, also see the two rules have been added previously. Now we have to add the virtual network to this subnet. Set Azure RM virtual network subnet config. 
the name, virtual network, network security group and the address prefix. After that press enter and we can see that we've added uh, the network security group to the subnet in the virtual network. After that we have to update the, update the virtual network. For that we run the command set Azure our own virtual network and the virtual network alias name. After that press enter this will update the virtual network So we've successfully updated the virtual network. After that we'll create a virtual machine. First we have to create credentials for that virtual machine. For that we have to run the command cred equals get credential. This will set the username and password for the administration of the virtual machine. After that press enter and here we'll have to give the username and I'll specify it as Callion P and after that enter the password. Okay we've successfully created the admin account. Now we have to create the initial configuration for the virtual machine. Run the command vm new azure rm vm config, the vm name and the vm size. Vm name is winvm and the size is basic A2. After that press enter. We've completed the initial configuration for the Windows system. After that we uh, have to add the operating system information to the VM. Pasting in the command here, set a VM set as or RM VMO a VM operating system. So you've got your virtual machine, Windows, computer name, credential, provisional VM agent and enable auto update. After that press enter we've successfully added the operating system image to the virtual machine. After, after that we add the image information to the VM. We've already selected the VM image previously. So for that we run the command VM set as or RM VM source image. Got the publisher name, the VM, the offer, SKUS and then version. Here the publisher name is Microsoft Windows Server. You can see um, 2016 data center version latest. After that you can press enter and we've successfully added image information to the virtual machine. After that we add the operating system disk settings to the VM config. Run the command vm set as or rm vm disk. You see the vm name, disk size in GB, create option, and caching.
After that press enter. After that you add the network interface card for this virtual machine configuration. We run the command VM add Azure RM VM network interface and then the VM ID. After that press enter. This will add the network interface to the virtual machine configuration. Now we'll add the operating system disk settings to the virtual machine configuration. You run the command vm set as all rm vmos disk. vm the name the disk size in GB. See the create option and the caching. After you've got all that, press enter. Now we'll create the virtual machine with the virtual machine configuration settings that we created earlier. Run the command new Azure RM VM resource group name, location and VM. After that, press enter. It may take some time to create this virtual machine. In the GUI, you can see the status of the virtual machine is creating. So it'll take a little bit of time to create the virtual machine. And you'll see that it's successfully created in the PowerShell there. You can validate the same thing if you go back to the GUI. Now we'll get to the public IP address of this virtual machine. For that you have to run the command get Azure RM public IP address resource group name select IP address. After that press enter. Here we see the public IP address of that virtual machine. We'll now RDP to this virtual machine. You see the command here on the screen. You run this command at the um, command prompt to connect to the Windows VM that we created earlier. You'll have to enter the uh, username and password. And you'll get to this window here. You have to click yes to proceed further. And you can see that the Windows virtual machine is now loading. Click yes here. We'll install the uh, web server on this Windows machine now. Search for PowerShell and select the PowerShell here. You have to now run the command install Windows feature, name web server, include management tools. Press enter to proceed further.
now you can see that the web server has been successfully installed on this Windows server. And now you test whether the web server is working correctly or not on the Windows server. For that copy the public IP address and paste it into a new tab. You can see the web server has been successfully installed uh, because we can access it. Now we'll see a few more commands for PowerShell. Now we'll see how to get the power state of a particular VM uh, through using PowerShell. You're in the command get as or RM, VM, resource group name, name and then status. After that press enter. Here you can see the power state is running. Uh, we can now stop a virtual machine using the PowerShell. For that you have to run the command stop Azure RM, resource group name, name and then force. Here you can see that the VM status is running. By running this command the status of the VM will be changed to stop. After that you can press enter. And in the GUI we can see that the status of this virtual machine is deallocating. All right, now it's successfully been stopped. Now you can check the power state again. Same command as before. And the power state is now deallocated. You can validate this in the GUI if you need to. Oh, you can see this in the GUI now. Stopped and deallocated. Now we'll see how to start a virtual machine in PowerShell. You start as a VM, resource group name, and then the name. After that, you can press enter. And it will start the Windows VM, uh, which was stopped um, just earlier on. You can see the command has been successfully executed. And we'll check the status in the GUI. Here you can see that the Windows Virtual Machine status is running. And this way we can see how to start and stop the virtual machine using the PowerShell commands. You can now uh, delete the resource group. We'll do it using the PowerShell. You run the command remove Azure RM resource group name and then force. This command will remove the resource group and their respective resources such as virtual machines, network interface cards, etc. Execute the command. After that, press enter. Here we can see that the command has been successfully executed. Now we'll check whether the virtual machine and the resource group have been removed or not in the GUI. You just refresh the virtual machines tag and you can see the 
uh, virtual machine has been successfully removed. Check the resource group now while we're here. And you can see the resource group has also been removed. Alright, so we've looked at creating virtual machines using the PowerShell. We've covered a lot of ground. Hopefully um, you'll follow along next time and do the commands also. I'll see you on the next lecture. In this lesson we're going to discuss how to use custom script extension to create automatic configuration using PowerShell. First thing we need to do is go to PowerShell and we've connected to the PowerShell. We covered how to do this earlier actually. So we'll demonstrate the automate configuration using PowerShell. We'll create a secure web server on a Windows virtual machine. First we have to create a key vault. Azure Key Vault safeguards uh, cryptographic keys and secrets. We'll create a key vault here. First we have to create a resource group. For that we run the command resource group name my resource group secure web. You can see the location here. This is the command to create the new resource group. When you get to the end press enter here we can see that the new resource group name with the name My Resource Group Secure Web has been successfully created. We can also check this one in the GUI in the resource group section if we wish. I'll now create a key vault. Each key vault value should have a unique name and should be in lowercase. After that we'll create a key vault in the GUI. Click on more services and we'll search for key vault. And then we'll select key vault. Click on create key vaults here. I'll specify the key vault name as WinCalPval. I'll use the existing resource group that we created earlier. After that, click on Create. This will create a key vault for us. Here we can see that a key vault has been successfully created. Uh, we'll now generate a certificate and store it in Key Vault. For the creation of the Key Vault, we have to add a certificate. For that, click on the Key Vault and then select Certificate. After that, click on Add. Here, I'll give the certificate the name MyCert. After that we have to select the type of certificate. Here I'll select self-signed and then we have to select the subject. So 
Select the validity period as 12 months. Content type PKCS number 12. And then click on create. You can see that my certificate's been added to the key vault here, my cert. After that, we'll create a Windows Virtual Machine. For that, we have to create some credentials. And then we have to run this command here. Specify the parameters. I'll give the username as Kalen P and enter a password. And we've successfully created the credentials. After that, we'll give the uh, entire virtual, get the entire virtual machine configuration. This automatically creates a new Windows virtual machine. Now you have to issue the correct commands to make this happen. I'll paste it in the configuration here. You can stop the video because there's so much and you can see the subnet has been configured. Uh, virtual network interface, public IP address, we've created a network security group rules for RDP session, covered all this in other, other um, presentations so I'm going through this a bit quicker. Security group rule for port 443. After that, we create the network security group and add the respective rules. Network interface card. And you can see the virtual machine configuration. Virtual machine name is MyVM and size is basic A4. And we've added the credentials an image as Microsoft Windows Server. SKU's version is 2016 data center. We've added the NIC ID. And finally, run the command that's shown on the screen here with the resource group command at the bottom. This will create the virtual machine. Go back to the earlier presentations if you want a bit more detail on this because it was all broken down in the uh, respective lectures and then it takes a little bit of time for the virtual machine to be created and you can see the status of the VM successfully created. We'll now validate this in the GUI. You can now see the status is running We'll now implement custom script extension for this virtual machine. For that we run the command set Azure RM VM extension resource group name. After that the extension name is IIS and we're installing the IIS web server on this VM. VM name, location, publisher, extension type, type handler version, setting string. This custom script extension automatically installs IIS web server on the VM that we created earlier. After that press enter to proceed further. We can see the custom script extension has been successfully created. Now we get the public IP address of this virtual machine. For that, for that we have to run the command get Azure RM public IP address resource group name select uh, IP addresses. After that press enter. Copy this public IP address. 
We'll use the public IP address to test this secure web server. After that we have to add a certificate to the virtual machine from the key vault. For that we have to get the certificate URL. For that go to key vaults. We've been here before. Click on more services and search for the key vault. Uh, we go to secrets. Select the certificate that we created earlier. Select the current version and then copy the secret identifier. This URL will be added to the virtual machine. After that we have to go to the PowerShell. Here we add the certificate to the um, VM from the key vault. Go to the command, the VM getters or RM VM, resource group name and virtual machine name. After that we have to get the vault ID. We have to run the command VM, add as or RMVM secret, the source vault ID, certificate store and certificate URL. The vault ID can be gathered uh, from the key vault that we were in earlier. So there you go. See it at the top here of the screen next to the key. Copy this vault ID and use it in the command prompt. If you're happy with that, press enter. And you've successfully added the certificate to the virtual machine. After that you have to update the VM. For that we have to run the command that's shown here and press enter to proceed further. After that get the public IP address of this virtual machine. Copy the public IP address and open it in a new tab. And here we can see that the web server has been successfully loaded for that newly created virtual machine. After that I'll remove the VM and the resource group that we created. Uh, you run the command remove as our own resource group and then force. We covered this earlier. So hopefully this is just a refresher. Here we can see that the resource group has been successfully removed and now we'll validate the same in the GUI. And you can see the VM has been removed there. Resource group has been removed. All right, so we've done the custom script extension in this presentation. I'll cover a new topic next. Thanks for watching. In this lesson we're going to discuss how to resize the virtual machine using both the GUI, which is the easy way, and then the command prompt, which as you know is the harder way, unless you get used to it obviously. 
What's uh, difficult becomes easy with a lot of practice. Uh, you can increase or decrease the size of the virtual machine. These are both options available to you. For the first option, we have to create a virtual, <laughs> have to create a virtual machine. I know it's stating the obvious, and then we'll create it, and then we can resize it uh, accordingly. We'll go to a familiar part of the GUI now, which is virtual machines, and we can create one using the click button there. We'll uh, we'll go to Sent OS here. In fact, sorry, we'll search for it. Save a bit of time. And we'll choose version 6.8. After that, click Create to proceed further. And we have to choose the virtual machine um, virtual machine name up here. I'll put Linux VM. I select the VM disk type as HDD. Specify the username as Callion P. And we enter the SSH public key. Copy and paste it here. We did we did all this in earlier labs, which is why I'm going through some of these uh, sections a little bit faster. So you go back and review if you need to. Add the uh, or create the resource group. We'll call it RG Linux VM. Specify the location. We'll choose South India because this is where the uh, lab was created. The video was created and we have to choose the virtual machine size obviously you can go back through these videos and change uh, as many parameters as you wish especially during your free trial scroll all the way down to A0 basic and then select to proceed further keep the default settings Oh, scroll all the way down. I'll change the monitoring to disabled actually. And then OK to proceed further. Here we can see the summary of that virtual machine. And click create to Continue with our lab. All things being equal, this will create our virtual machine. You can see the status of the virtual machine under the relevant tab there, which we're familiar with. Click on refresh and you can see the virtual machine is creating. May take some time to create this virtual machine. And now we can see the status of the VM is running. Now we'll log into this VM. For that, click on connect, copy the public IP address and copy it into the cloud shell. Enter the command here to SSH and press enter. Yes to log in. And we've successfully uh, logged into the sent OS virtual machine. To see the disk information, run the command DF dash H. And you can see the uh, disk details. You'll see that the RAM information, the memory, if we run the command here, cat proc meminfo, press enter, 
mem total size make a note of it actually you can see the CPU information run the uh, command cat proc CPU info and there you can see the CPU now we'll resize this virtual machine for that go to Azure select this virtual machine you can see the size here basic A0 1V virtual CPU 0.75 um, gig gigabytes of memory and now we're going to resize click on the size tab you choose the new VM size scroll down we'll choose A2 basic three and a half gig memory, two virtual CPUs and slick, um, click uh, select. While resizing the virtual machine just take note that it uh, restarts just so you know if you're running a, a live website or some live services. Uh, we'll check whether the uh, machine is resized or not. it's uh, successfully been applied and now the machine's running so we'll check if the resize actually worked for that click click on uh, Linux virtual machine go to the overview we'll see the size of the virtual machine which is now A2 with two CPUs and three and a half gig of memory Check whether the resize changes have been done now in the cloud shell. Uh, go to cloud shell and connect to the virtual machine. Hopefully these tasks are becoming pretty familiar to you now so you can probably do without um, me showing you when you come to repeat the lab. So log into the virtual machine, run the command to check the memory information, which we ran two commands earlier cat proc mem info, and we can see three and a half meg of memory. Previously it was 0.75. Now we'll validate whether the CPU has been resized or not. For that you have to run the command cat proc CPU info. Now we can see we have two processors. Processor 0 and model name. Processor 1 and the model name so two virtual CPUs are now working on this machine uh, this way we can validate hardware information from inside the Linux virtual machine now we've successfully increased the uh, VM size of the virtual machine we'll see how to decrease so we'll go the other way. Handy to do this if you're just overpaying for resources that you don't need. I've, I've done it before on cloud servers that are hosted elsewhere. Uh, just no point and then you can always upgrade later on. So in the command prompt we have to get the size of the existing Linux virtual machine.
so AZVM show resource group name virtual machine name query hardware profile here we see the size of the existing virtual machine is basic A2 after that we have to validate the existing VM sizes that are available for this Linux virtual machine run the command azvm list vm resize options these are all existing vms that we can make use of here i'll decrease the virtual machine size to basic a0 Run the command AZVM resize, resource group name, virtual machine name and size. Basic A0, uh, if you don't remember, contains 0.75 gigabit RAM, RAM and one CPU. Uh, you can press enter to receive early, uh, um, to execute the command. If you remember from earlier, the uh, virtual machine has to reboot in order for these changes to take. And uh, some time will obviously pass during the reboot. Just factor it into um, any downtime. You can see the command has executed. And now we need to check whether the resize have uh, has, has taken effect or not. Run the command AZVM show resource group name um, query hardware profile the virtual machine name press enter and no surprise to see we've got a basic A0. You can also validate the same in GUI. Click on the Linux virtual machine click on overview and the basic A0 has been updated in this um, readout here check the same details by connecting to the virtual machine go to a cloud shell and log into that virtual machine Run the command cat proc meminfo. And we'll see the memory size is back down to where it was. Uh, validate the CPU uh, cat proc CPU info. And you'll see there's only one virtual CPU there. So we've seen how to increase and then decrease the size of our virtual machine. Now we'll quit this virtual machine. We'll delete the uh, resource group for this virtual machine. So we'll have to go back to resource groups. And click on delete obviously. This will also delete the virtual machine, as you know from earlier labs. Uh, give the uh, resource group name here, RG Linux VM, and after that click delete. This might take a few minutes. And here we can see that the resource group has been successfully removed. And now we'll move straight into resizing a Windows.
virtual machine especially because in the exam you could be asked about either so we'll do our creation and then our selection and resize we'll select Windows Server uh, 26 data center is our usual choice click on create to proceed Uh, we have to give the VM name, so I'll specify Win VM. HDD, Kalyan P. Enter a password. And we'll create a new resource group, RGWin VM. Select the location and click OK to proceed further. Click on View All here. Choose A2 Basic. And then click Select to proceed further. Keep all the default options and I'll change monitoring as disabled. After that click OK to proceed further. Check the summary and if you're happy with everything you can click on create. This may take some time to create this virtual machine. You can also see the progress in the Virtual Machines tab. Here we can see the Windows Virtual Machine is creating. Alright, and it's successfully deployed now. It's running. And we can check on the size of the Virtual Machine. Go to the Windows Virtual Machine, uh, go to Overview. So we've got Basic A2, two virtual CPUs and a 3.5 gig memory. We'll connect to this virtual machine and check the hardware status. For that, click uh, Connect. Click Connect to proceed further. And you can click on Yes. And you can see the Windows Virtual Machine is loading. Click Yes to proceed further. We will check the hardware information. For that, right click on Windows and select System. And you can see there are two processors and installed memory is 3.5 gig. So now we need to resize it and then look at the hardware information. So go to the Azure portal again. Click on this virtual machine name and the uh, size option. We have to choose the VM size here. I'll choose A3 Basic, which is 4 vCPUs and 7 gig RAM. So click on A3 Basic here. After that, click Select, and then this will resize the virtual machine. It's going to be rebooted, as you would expect. And you can see the virtual machine status is running, and it's been successfully resized. Now we'll check to see if the resize has actually worked. 
click on the virtual machine name and select overview and you can see the size of this virtual machine is basic A3 for the CPUs 7 gig memory For that you need to connect to the virtual machine so click on connect click yes to proceed further RDC will fire up And we'll check the hardware status now of this virtual machine. Back to system. And we can see uh, processes are updated and we've got 7 gig of memory installed. So in this way we can resize the virtual machine. Next step is to uh, reduce back to where we were. So we'll go to the Azure portal, resize this virtual machine from basic A3 to basic A2 via uh, PowerShell. Go to the PowerShell and click on reconnect. and then you choose PowerShell here we've done this before this connection ok restart and we'll load the PowerShell and you can see PowerShell has been successfully loaded you get these virtual machine sizes that are available for this virtual machine uh, get the uh, get Azure RM VM size, the resource group name and VM name press enter and you can see all of the available options there again we've done this in an earlier lab as well we will resize to a basic A2 We have to run the command uh, vm get us all rmvm the resource group name vm name vm hardware profile basic a2 update azor rm vm and then the resource group name press enter this will resize the machine back to basic a2 Uh, you've got to get a reboot as usual and the resize may take a, a certain amount of time here we can see that the resize has been successfully completed now we'll validate that it's been successfully resized or not in the GUI go to virtual machine, select the virtual machine Go to overview and the virtual machine A2, two CPUs, three and a half gig memory. We'll now validate the same in the virtual machine. Just want to click on connect. Our usual drill here. So you successfully logged into this virtual machine and now we'll see the hardware information right click on Windows and select system uh, 
Uh, you can see the processor info and the memory size has indeed been reduced. All right, so we've come to the end of this particular topic. Obviously, be moving on to something else next. But uh, thanks for watching. In this lesson we're going to look at Azure Managed Disks. Azure Managed Disks simplifies disk management for the Azure IAAS virtual machines. It does this by managing storage accounts associated with the VM disks. You only have to specify the type, premium or standard and the size of disk you need and Azure creates and manages the disk for you. Next we'll look at storage availability. Understanding Azure regions and geographies becomes important when you consider the available storage replication options. This depends on the storage type you have different replication options. Locally redundant storage. This uh, replicates your data three times within the region in which you created your storage account. Zone redundant storage. This replicates your data three times across two, so three uh, facilities, either within a single region or across two regions. Geo redundant storage. This replicates your data to a secondary region that is hundreds of miles away from the primary region. Read access geo redundant storage. This replicates your data to a secondary region as with GP as with GRS, but also then provides read only access to the data in the secondary location. Uh, storage costs. Prices depend on the storage type and the availability that you select. Azure Managed Disks. These are premium managed disks that are backed by solid state drives and standard managed disks backed by regular spinning disks. Both premium and standard managed disks are charged based on the provision capacity for the disk. Unmanaged disks. Premium storage is backed by solid state drives and is charged based on the capacity of the disk. Standard storage is backed by regular spinning disk and is charged based on the in use capacity and desired storage availability. For RAGRS, there's an additional geo replication data transfer charge. For the bandwidth, 
of replicating that data to another Azure region. Now we'll see the practical uh, sessions of the Linux managed disks. For that we go to the Azure uh, login portal. In managed disk we will add detach and resize uh, the disks that are connected with the virtual machines. First we have to create a virtual machine, click on create, we'll select Ubuntu server 16.04, after that click on create. It will specify the name as Linux VM1. Then I'll select the VM disk type as HDD. After that I'll give the username as Kalyan P. We have to enter the SSH public key, which we've done a few times. We'll copy it from here and then paste it in done that quickly because you've done this a few times by now. We'll create a new resource group RG Linux VM after that select the location of South India and click OK We have to choose the VM size here. Click on view all to see the available VM sizes. Scroll down until you get to A0 basic and then select that one. After that, I'll keep the default settings, change the monitoring to disabled and then OK to proceed further. So here we can see the summary of that virtual machine. After that click on create to proceed further. The Linux virtual machine has been created now and we can see the status in virtual machines. Here we can see the status of this Linux VM1. Uh, we can see the status is running. Now we'll see how many disks are attached to this Linux virtual machine. For that click on Linux Virtual Machine and select Disks. And here we can see that there's only one disk, i.e. the OS disk that's connected to this Linux Virtual Machine. Size of the OS disk is 30 gig. Storage type is standard LRS. Encryption is not enabled. Host caching is read-write. Now we'll log into this VM and see the disk status. Connect and copy the SSH command. Open the Cloud Shell and run the command here. After that press enter. Type yes to proceed further and we've successfully logged into the Linux virtual machine. After that run the command df-h. Here you can see that the dev sda1 which is mounted on root 
has 30 gig and available free space is 28 gig. This is the managing disk that is created while creating the virtual machine. You can see the same details if you look in the virtual machines tab. Click on disks and uh, here you can see the information. We'll try and add a new data disk for this VM now. For that click on virtual machine and select disks and then click on add data disk. Here we have to select the option create disk. After that we have to give the disk name and I will specify it as data disk 1. After that we have to use the same resource group where the virtual machine exists. I'll select the account type as standard. I'll select the source type as none, empty disk. So we're creating an empty disk here. After that we have to give the size of this virtual machine. Here I'll give the size of the virtual machine as 20 gig. After that click on create to proceed further. Here we're creating 20 gig new data disk with the name data disk 1. This may take some time to create this data disk. Data disk 1 has been successfully created with the size 20 gig. We have to um, specify the LUNID here as 1. After that I'll select the host caching as read write. and we'll save this configuration. Save so this new data disk that is connected to this Linux virtual machine by clicking save. This will update the virtual machine disks. Here we can see that we have successfully added data disk 1 to this Linux virtual machine. After attaching the disk to the Linux virtual machine, we can see the same details in the resource group as well. Just go to the resource group and select the resource group of that virtual machine. Click on the overview and you can see data disk 1 has been successfully created and added to that virtual machine. Now we'll mount this data disk 1 in the Linux virtual machine. After that go to the Linux virtual machine and run the command dmesg grep scuzzy. After that press enter and here we can see that the new disk SDC has been added to this virtual machine. Now we have to format this disk and mount the disk on this Linux virtual machine. To format this disk we have to uh, run the command sudo fdisk dev sdc. After that press enter. Press n for new partition. As we are creating the primary partition, press P to proceed further. 
After that we have to specify the partition number Uh, we'll give it number one, press enter. We're formatting the entire disk, so I'll keep all the default settings. Here also keep everything as default and press enter. We can see the new partition one, type Linux, size 20 gigab uh, gigabyte has been created. After that we have to create a partition. For that type P to proceed further and then enter. After that type W to write these settings to the partition table. Type W to proceed further. And here we can see the partition table has been altered. After creating the partition table, we have to format this file system. For that, we have to run the command sudo mkfs minus t type of file system and the newly attached data disk. After that, press enter. And you can see the new uh, file system has been successfully formatted. Now we can make use of this file system and we can mount this um, mount the file system. For that we have to create a directory and for that we have to run the command sudo mkdir forward slash data drive one and then press enter. After that we have to mount this file system. For that we have to run the command sudo mount dev sdc1 and then the data drive which has been created earlier. After that press enter and we've successfully mounted the file system. After that run the command df-h to check the newly created disk and we can see the Disk has been mounted on to data drive one. So we've successfully mounted the newly created file system. To make this file system persistent across reboots, we have to add this file system to etc fs tab. And we're going to get a universally unique identifier for this file system. So I'll run the command sudo minus i blkid. After that, press enter. And here we can see the UUID number for the device SDC1. We have to use this UUID number in etc fs tab. After that we have to open etc fs tab file. For that we have to run the command sudo vi etc fs tab. And after that press enter. After that we have to give the UUID number of the newly created file system and the mount point. Type of uh, file system defaults no fail 1, 2. After that save this file and quit. Now we'll check whether this file has been successfully created or not. You can run the command cat etc fs tab and we can see that the required information has been successfully updated. From now onwards the disk drive details will be persistent across the reboot of this virtual machine.
Now we'll see how to detach a newly created disk drive from Linux Virtual Machine 11. For that we have to go to Virtual Machines We have to stop the virtual machine. Select stop. After that, press yes to uh, proceed further, and this will stop the virtual machine. After deallocating, we can detach the disk from this virtual machine. You can see the status of this machine is um, stopped and deallocated. We'll now detach disk from this virtual machine. Click on virtual machine and go to disks. Disks that are managed here are managed uh, the managed disks. No need to create any storage account for the managed disks. We can simply create a disk and add it to the VM. Disks that are created are the managed disks when you create them here. So we'll detach this disk. For that we click on edit. After that, select Detach here. And this way we can detach a data disk from the Linux Virtual Machine. Click on Save. This will update the Virtual Machine disks. May take some time for the settings to take. and you can see it's successfully saved. Power on the virtual machine and check whether the disk has been detached or not. Select the virtual machine. Start to power it on. You see the status of the status of the virtual machine is starting and the virtual machine is running. Let's now connect to that machine. Open up the cloud shell and enter the SSH command. Press enter yes. df minus h you see dev sdc1 has been successfully removed I think I said number 11 earlier I think I meant to say number 1 sorry when I said uh, 11 a couple of minutes ago so this is how you detach the data disk from the virtual machine alright so we've discussed manage disk we'll be on to a new subject next thanks for watching In this lesson we're going to see how to add and detach a disk using the command prompt. Pretty short lesson this one. We'll quit from this virtual machine we have fired up here. And we're in the cloud shell now. We'll create a new disk and attach that disk to the virtual machine 
and then we'll also try to detach the same disk from the virtual machine. We'll run the command to create a data disk and attach that disk to the Linux virtual machine 1. You can uh, pause the video here. AZVM disk attach uh, dash G resource group VM name disk um, disk name and size. Bit of a mouthful here. Here I'm creating a new disk with a size 10 gig. After that, press enter. This will create a new disk of 10 gig that will be attached to the Linux virtual machine. Here we can see that the new disk has been created and attached to that Linux virtual machine. And we can also validate the same thing from the GUI. Go to virtual machines and you see the data uh, 10 gig has been created to this virtual machine here, VM1. We'll come back and validate it, whether it's been connected to this um, Linux virtual machine. So we need the SSH command. We've logged into the machine and we've run the command dmseg grep scuzzy. Now we can see the newly created disk has been attached to the virtual machine. After that we'll make a partition of this newly attached disk. Uh, for that run the command uh, sudo fdisk dev sdc and we have to press N for the new partition. Type P for the primary partition and then select the partition number. I'll select the partition number as one and then we're partitioning the entire disk. We'll keep all the default settings. Press P to make a partition of this file system. Here we can see that the newly attached disk has been successfully partitioned. Uh, after that type W to update these details to the partition table. Here we can see that the partition table has been successfully updated. And now we have to format this file system. Paste the command in here, sudo mkfs file system type, file system name. Then press enter. The file system has been successfully formatted and we have to create a new directory here. Uh, run the command sudo mkdir data drive 2. After that we'll mount this file system under this directory. For that we have to run the command sudo mount dev sdc1 data drive. So the file system has been successfully mounted. Now run the command df-h. And here we can see the newly created disk with the 10 gig has been formatted and mounted on this directory. This way we can uh, create and attach data disk using the command line. We'll now undo what we did by de 
detaching this disk using the command line. Uh, quit this virtual machine and now we're in the cloud shell we'll run the command to detach the newly created disk. Uh, command is AZ VM disk detach the resource group name virtual machine name and database name the data disk name We're detaching data disk 2 from VM1. After that, press enter. Here we can see the data disk 2 has been successfully removed from the virtual machine. We'll validate this in the GUI. Disks. You can see the data disk 2 has been removed. We'll connect to the virtual machine and run another validation check. A command is sudo unmount data drive 2. Uh, run the command df h. And you see the file system has been removed from this uh, virtual machine. Alright, so we've detached the disk using the command prompt. That's all for this lesson. I'll see you in the next one. In this lesson we'll discuss how to attach the existing data disk to a virtual machine. First we'll log into the Azure portal. The detached data disk from the virtual machine will not be de um, deleted. We've discussed uh, this in a previous lesson, in fact, a previous lesson. These disks will be there in the resource group. Uh, we can see the disk we've created uh, not being used by the virtual machine here. You can go back to the earlier lessons if you want to see how this is all done. Now we'll see to how to attach the existing data disk to a virtual machine. For that we need to create a um, new virtual machine. Click on uh, add here to create the new virtual machine Ubuntu server 16.04 click on create to proceed further we'll give it a name a Linux VM2 for this one Uh, HDD username Callion P the SSH public key which we've done a few times which I'll copy and paste I'll use the existing resource group that we've created i.e. RG Linux virtual machine Uh, South India and then click OK to proceed further uh, 
A0 basic. If we scroll down, we'll just use the usual selection for this course. Click select to proceed further. And default settings, change the monitoring. And OK. If you're happy with the summary that you see, you can click on create. New virtual machine Linux VM2 is being created. And we can see the status of the virtual machine in the virtual machines tab here. It's creating at the moment. And now we can see it's running. Now we'll attach the existing data disk to this virtual machine here. We'll log into the virtual machine and run the command df-h to see the disk details. Click on connect. Uh, we'll add the details here. Yes, and then press enter. Run the command df minus h. Here we can see that SDA1 with 30 gig has been created. Now we can attach the existing data disk to this virtual machine too. Go to the virtual machine, select the disk and then click on add data disk. We can choose the existing data disk from here. Here I'll add data disk 1 with a size of 20 gigabytes. After that I will give LUN ID as 0 and I'll uh, select host caching as read write. After that we have to click save to attach the existing data disk to the Linux virtual machine number 2. Click save to proceed further. Here we can see that the existing data disk 1 has been successfully attached to the Linux virtual machine. Now I mount this data disk 1 on uh, my Linux virtual machine number 2. Connect to the machine. Uh, there's no need to format this file system. We'll just mount the file system onto this Linux virtual machine. For that we have to check whether it's been successfully attached to this Linux virtual machine or not. Run the command dmesg grep scuzzy and you can see the new disk has been attached. Just going to create a mount point now. For that, we have to run the command sudo mkdir forward slash data drive one and then press enter. Now we have to mount this file system. For that, we have to run the command sudo mount dev sdc one data drive one and then press enter. Here we can see that the existing data disk has been successfully mounted and we can run the command df-h. 
you can see the existing data disk with 20 gig has been successfully mounted and is ready for use. Now we'll see how to attach the existing data disk through the CLI. We have to quit this virtual machine. Now we attach the existing data disk 2 to the Linux VM2 using CLI. First we have to get the disk ID name. For that we have to run this command which will uh, query the data disk 2 ID. AZVM disk attach resource group name, virtual machine name and uh, disk name. We get the disk ID from the above command. After that um, press enter to att attach the existing data disk to the Linux VM2. You can see the maximum number of data disks allowed to be attached to the virtual machine is 1. Before attaching data disk 2 we have to detach data disk 1 from this virtual machine. Uh, run the command az vm disk detach resource group name vm name data disk name then press enter so uh, this will detach the existing data disk one from linux vm2 here we can see the existing data disk one has been successfully removed from the Linux VM2. Now we will attach the existing data disk 2 to the Linux VM2 from the CLI command. For that we have to run the command AZ VM disk attach resource group name, the VM name and the disk name. After that press enter This may take some time to attach the existing data disk 2 to the virtual machine. Alright and here we can see the attached disk has been successfully, uh, the command has been executed. You can log into the VM and validate whether data disk 2 has been attached or not. I go to virtual machines, this get the SSH command. Uh, execute the command here. We've detached data disk one. So now we have to run the command sudo unmount data drive 1. Press enter. After that we have to run the command dmesg grep scuzzy and press enter. And here we can see the std disk has been attached. We can mount this file system here and there's no need to format it. We'll now create a new mount directory. We have to run the command uh, sudo mkdir data drive 2 and press enter. Um, uh, sudo mount dev ss SDD1 data drive 2 then run the command df minus h and here we can see the existing data disk 2 the size of the 10 gig has been mounted onto this Linux VM number 2 alright so that's how we attach data disk to virtual machines existing data disks
That's all for this lesson. I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching. In this lesson, we'll discuss how to expand data disks. First, we have to log into the Azure portal. And then we'll see how to expand our data disks. We can see that we've got a data disk mounted is 10 gigabytes. And after some time, the file system will run out of space. When this happens, we have to expand the file system. We covered how to set all of these um, virtual machines up earlier and data disks. So we'll stop the virtual machine that the file system is on that needs to be expanded. We're expanding data disk 2 on VM2, which I think we did in the last uh, presentation, if I recall correctly. Yes, to uh, proceed. Might take some time to stop this virtual machine. And you can see the status is deallocating. And we can see that VM2 has been stopped and deallocated here. Now we'll expand data disk 2 that's been attached to this Linux virtual machine. Click on Linux VM2. For that, go to the disk and select the data disk 2, which we have to expand. Here you can see the size of that data disk 2 is 10 gig. We'll increase it to 15. and click on save to proceed further. Here we can see the data disk 2 with 15 gig has been successfully saved. Power on the virtual machine that's connected to data disk 2. For that go to the virtual machine, click here and select start to power on this virtual machine. This virtual machine will be switched on now. And you can see the uh, virtual machine is running. Now we'll connect to this virtual machine. After that, press enter. Type yes to proceed further. After that, run the command df-h. Here you can see the previously added file system has been unmounted. So run the command D M S E G grep SCSI to see the attached disks. You see the expanded disk has been attached with the name SDC. We have to format this file system for the expansion that we did. Run the command sudo piloted dev sdc and press enter.
Now type print and then press enter. We can see the size of the disk is 10 gig on this Linux machine. We've expanded the file system in the Azure portal in Virtual Machine 2. Now we have to run the command resize part. And then press enter. Partition number is number 1. We have to enter the size we want to expand, i.e. 15 gig. And then press enter and then quit from this prompt. Now run the command sudo e2 fsck dash f dev sdc1 and press enter. This will resize the partition. So resize the partition has successfully taken place. After that we have to resize the file system. sudo resize 2fs dev sdc and after that press enter. File system has been successfully resized and after that we have to mount this file system. For that we have to run the command sudo mount dev sdc1 data drive 2 and then press enter. Run the command df minus h and here we can see the size of this data drive has been expended. So this is the way to expand the data disk on the Azure portal. And the same way we can expand the file system in the Linux virtual machine. We'll amount this file system and detach this data disk from the virtual machine now. I run the command sudo unmount data drive 2. And then press enter. Go to the Azure portal and select the virtual machine and click disks. Click on edit and detach this data disk 2. Then click on save. I'll now attach the data disk 1 here. Select host caching as read write and then click save. Here we can see that data disk 1 has been successfully attached. Now we'll mount this data disk on this virtual machine. For that we have to run the command sudo mount dev sdc1 data drive 1. And then press enter. Run the command df minus h. Uh, see the size of the data drive is around 20 gig. I'll expand this data disk in the CLI. Uh, first of all, we'll quit from this virtual machine. After that, we uh, have to deal deallocate this virtual machine. Uh, run the command az vm deallocate resource group name and virtual machine name. After that press enter. This will deallocate the virtual machine Linux VM2. 
After that we'll expand data disk 1. Here you can see the virtual machine has been successfully deallocated. We'll now expand the data disk 1. Uh, for that first we have to get the disk details here. Run the command az disk list resource name query output table. Press enter. You see there's four disks here. Here we expand in data disk 1 by 25 gig. The command is az disk update resource group name data disk name and then size. And then press enter. So the data disk has been expanded by um, 25 gig or 225 gig. After that, we have to start the Linux VM2. Uh, run the command AZ VM start, resource group name, virtual uh, machine name, and press enter. This will start the Linux VM. Here we can see that the virtual machine has been successfully started. After that, we have to capture the IP address of this VM. For that we have to run the command azvm show resource group name virtual machine name query. After that we'll press enter. So this is the IP address of this virtual machine and now we'll log in. For that, for that we have to run the command ssh username and IP address. and press enter. Type yes to proceed. We've now got the expanded file system on the Linux virtual machine. We have to run the command sudo parted dev sdc and press enter. Now run the command print. Here we can see the partition table and the file system is 21.5 gig. Now we have to resize uh, the partition table of the file system. For that we run the command resize part. After that press enter and enter the partition number. After that we have to give the file system this partition table for this file system. I'm going to give the end value as 26 gig and press enter. After that see, uh, type quit to come out of this. We have to resize the file system next. Run the command sudo resize 2fs dev sdc and after that press enter. After that we have to uh, resize the partition e2fsck f dev sd1. Resizing the partition has been completed. Now we have to resize the file system. sudo resize 2fs dev sd1. And press enter. Alright, so your file system has been resized. After that, we have to mount this file system. So run the mount command mount dev sdc1 data drive 1. And after that, press enter. Now run the command df minus h. Here we can see the size of the newly expanded file system. 
Previously it was 20 gig and now it, we can see the expanded file system. I'll delete the resource group which we created earlier. Uh, RG Linux VM. Click on delete resource group. This will delete the data disks and the virtual machines that we created. Click on delete. And you can see the resource group name has been successfully removed. All right, so we've looked at adding, detaching and resizing the disks for Linux virtual machines in this lesson. I'll see you in the next lesson. Thanks for watching. In this lesson we'll discuss how to add, detach and resize a disk for Windows servers. Obviously we need to have a Windows server in existence, so we'll go back over how to do this. Maybe a bit quicker than the original time we did it because we've covered it once. We'll create a virtual machine under virtual machines. select Windows Server uh, Data Center 2016 will do us and then click on create we'll have to give the Windows Server a name we'll name it WinVM1 HDD Username as usual, Calium P. Enter the password and then retype it. We'll create a new resource group for this virtual machine and I'll specify the name as RGWinVM. We've set the location and then click OK to proceed further. We have to select the VM size. You can click View All if you want to see all of the available sizes. We'll select uh, A2 Basic there and then uh, select, click select to proceed. Keep the default settings, we'll disable monitoring and then click OK. There's a summary of our virtual machine and then we can click on create Virtual machine deployment has been initiated and now we wait. Alright, so our machine is now running. We'll log into this virtual machine and check how many disks are connected to it. So we'll go to the virtual machine, click on connect, 
open that file and click connect to proceed further click on yes to connect here we'll see that Windows is loading we'll click on yes we can close the wizard now and we'll see how many disks are attached to this virtual machine go to Windows and select File Explorer select this PC you see the C drive has been created there's a temporary storage there of the D drive and we'll see how much uh, how to attach a new disk to this virtual machine and make use of that disk for that go to the Azure portal we have to go to virtual machines and select the virtual machine to which the disk should be added overview disks click on add data disk here and we'll click on create disk in the box specify the name of the disk we'll name it data disk 1 resource group and we'll select account type as standard source type as none, empty disk we'll have the size as 20 gig we can see the estimated performance, the IOPS limit and the throughput limit click create to proceed further this will create a new data disk with the name data disk 1 here we can see the data disk 1 has been successfully created after that we have to edit the information here here I'll give you the LUNID as 1 now we're attaching the data disk here size is 20 gig account uh, storage account encryption and host caching host caching is read write after that click on save to uh, carry on this will attach the newly created data to this one to the Windows virtual machine and here we can see the data disk one has been successfully attached to this virtual machine after that go to the virtual machines and then connect to this virtual machine click on connect here we can see that we have successfully connected to this Windows virtual machine after that we have to make use of the newly attached data disk for that click on the start menu and the Windows Administrative Tools we have to choose the Computer Management up near the top there and we have to choose Disk Management you have to initialize this disk and then click OK to proceed further select MBR master boot record and then OK initialize the new disk that's been attached to this virtual machine
the newly attached disk is unallocated at the moment. We have to format this disk, give a right click and select new simple volume. After that click on next to proceed further. Choose the size to be formatted. We'll just give the total size of the disk and click on next to proceed further. After that we have to assign the drive letter. Here we'll assign the drive letter as F for this data disk. And then click on next to proceed further. After that we have to get the volume label. Here we'll give the volume label as data disk 1. And then I'll choose to perform a quick format. Click on next to proceed further and click on finish and this will format the newly attached data disk. You can see it's formatting here on the output and it's been successfully formatted and we can actually make use of this uh, data disk one now on the Windows Virtual Machine. After that go to File Explorer and you can see the newly attached data disk with 20 gig successfully added uh, to this virtual machine. We'll uh, write some new data, go to folder called test and write a few files under test. We'll just keep it as test one. I'll edit the test file. I'll just put uh, welcome to test one and save it. So this is just writing some data now to the newly added and formatted disk. We'll see how to create a new data disk using PowerShell now, the PowerShell prompt through the Azure portal. For that go to the Azure portal and now we go to the PowerShell command prompt. We'll go there via Cloud Shell as usual. After that we have to uh, choose PowerShell. And we'll restart just to continue. So we can see that PowerShell has been successfully loaded. After that we'll run the PowerShell commands to create a new data disk to attach that disk to the virtual machine WinVM. So we're going to run the command as you can see on the screen here if you want to pause it. Variable names, resource group name, Windows virtual machine name, location, storage type and data disk. When all that's present you can press enter. And after that we have to give the disk configuration. This is a disk this is a disk configuration we are creating for this virtual machine. And here we're creating a new empty disk with a size of 10 gig. After that press enter and it's created a new empty disk with 10 gig. You have to update the data disk variables, the disk name, configuration and resource group name. And after that press enter. Uh, we've added the um, information to data disk 2 here. 
You have to edit the VM variables, Azure VM details and resource group name. And press enter. And we've uh, successfully updated the VM details. After that we have to attach the disk to the virtual machine. For that we run the command add Azure RM RM VM data disk VM name data disk name create option attach manage disk ID uh, data disk two LUN two we're attaching this data disk with LUN ID two after that press enter and we've successfully attached this data disk to the Linux virtual machine. So we've run the command update Azure RM VM resource group name and RG name and press enter. This updates the Azure and we can see that it has been successfully updated. Go to the Windows VM machine, check whether this data disk is uh, created. Uh, we'll go to the disk management tool. You have to initialize disk 3. Click OK to proceed further. We see the newly created data disk 2 has been successfully attached to the machine. We have to format it as before. Same as before, give it a right click. New simple volume. Next. Next. Our drive letter G is fine. Click on next. We'll call it data disk two. Select quick format and then next to proceed further. After that click finish. I can see the disk has been successfully formatted. Now we'll see this newly created disk in the file explorer. Go to file explorer and we can see data disk 2 has been successfully created. We'll go to disk 2 now and create a new file test 2. Alright, so this is how we create an attaching new disk using PowerShell. So I hope you've enjoyed uh, watching and I'll see you on the next presentation. In this lesson we'll look at how to detach data disk 2 from the virtual machine in PowerShell. For this you have to run some commands. First is a virtual machine get Azure RM VM. We need the resource group name and the VM name. Click on enter. This is obviously from the last lesson we did. Run the command remove Azure RM data disk VM virtual machine name data disk 2 and hit enter. This will detach data disk 2 from the Windows virtual machine. Go 
press enter. You can see the command has been successfully updated. After that we have to update the virtual machine. Run the command Azure RMVM resource group name RGWinVM VM virtual machine and then press enter and here we can see that the data disk 2 has been successfully detached from the virtual machine. Now we'll validate the same in the GUI as well. For that go to virtual machines and select disks and here we can see that data disk 2 has been successfully detached. Now we'll log into the VM and check whether it's been successfully detached or not. For that connect to the Windows virtual machine and check whether data disk 2 is existing or exists. So we go to this PC, data disk 2 which uh, was connected to the G drive isn't there. We can also validate the same in the disk management tool if we need to. Data disk 2 is gone We'll look at how to detach the data disk now using the GUI. For that go to the Azure portal. If you want to detach a data disk from the GUI, first you have to stop this virtual machine click here and then stop yes to proceed further and this will stop the virtual machine after that you have to detach the data disk 1 from this virtual machine here we can see the status of this virtual machine is currently deallocating and here we can see if the status of this virtual machine is stopped. Now we're going to detach the data disk from this VM. For that go to disks, edit here and click on detach and after that click save to detach data disk 1 from the Windows VM. Here we can see that it's been updated and there's no data disk 2 for that virtual machine. Now we'll switch on this virtual machine. Click on start. This may take some time. and you can see the status of the Windows virtual machine is running. Click on connect and connect to proceed further. Yes to proceed further. You successfully logged into the virtual machine, the Windows machine. And we'll go to File Explorer, uh, the F drive was assigned previously, and we can see that Data Disk 1 has been removed. We can validate the same in the Disk Management tool if we need to. Click on Disk Management.
and we can see it's been removed. All right, so we've seen how to detach our disk in two different ways. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next presentation. In this lesson we'll look at how to attach the existing data disk to the Windows VM. First we'll have to stop this Windows virtual machine. Stop it as it's no longer needed. We'll create a new Windows VM and make use of that to attach the existing data disk. For that go to the VM, click on add, you should be familiar with these steps to be honest. Click on Windows Server. Here we'll specify the name as WinVM2. After that I'll select the name, username, HDD, enter a password, then retype the password. After that, we'll use the existing resource group that we created earlier, uh, RG Linux VM. Uh, location, I've selected, usual, um, and I'll create. We'll have to choose the VM size. We'll go for A2 basic and click select to proceed further. Everything standard will disable monitoring and click OK. If we're happy with all of the summary information, we'll click on Create. We'll see the status from the Virtual Machines tab. We see that the new Windows VM is creating. Uh, VM, well, WinVM2 is in running state. Now we'll attach the existing data disk to this virtual machine. Log into this VM and check for the existing disks. Connect. and then we'll connect to proceed further. After that click yes to proceed. Machine is loading. Now we can see that Windows has been successfully loaded. Close the wizard and go to File Explorer. And this PC has uh, the local disk C attached to it. Go to the Azure portal. I'll click on Windows VM 2 here. And disks.
add the data disk. You have to choo choose the existing data disk here. We'll choose data disk one to attach to this virtual machine. I'll select host caching as read write and click on save. This will update the disk configuration for this VM. We can see that the existing data disk one has been successfully attached to this machine. And now we'll log into the Windows VM two. Check to see if this data disk has been added and shows. So here we are on the VM two. Disk management. Computer management and disk management. And you can see the data disk one has been added. There's no need to partition the format because this has already been done on another machine. If you go and see the file explorer we can see the existing data disk one details. We click on Fire File Explorer. Data disk one. We've created a few files uh, previously uh, via Windows VM one. So we'll see if these files exist here or not. For that, click on data disk one over to test and we can see the files which we have created earlier currently exist here click on test one and we can see that file is intact now we'll see how to attach an existing data disk using the PowerShell prompt. For that go to the Azure portal, go to the Cloud Shell and then select PowerShell. Just give it a moment to load. And we can update the variables here. few commands to run. You have to update the group name, virtual machine name that we're using for attaching an existing disk, location and data disk name. After that we have to update the disk information. Long command there to run the disk getters or RM disk, resource group name, RG name, disk name, data disk name and press enter. After that we have to update the VM machine details. You can see the command here that we have to run get Azure RM VM virtual machine machine name and resource group name. After that you press enter. We'll attach the existing data disk 2 to the VM uh, win VM 2. We have to run the command add Azure RM VM data disk create option attach run one virtual machine name manage disk ID after that press enter this will attach data disk 2 to VM2 as I said After that we have to update the virtual machine, run the command update as all RMVM, the VM name, resource group name and resource group details and press enter. You uh, may take a little bit of time to update the VM information. 
and you can see it's successfully updated. Now we'll log into the Windows VM2 and we'll check whether the data disk 2 has been successfully added. I've logged into the uh, Windows VM2. We'll need to check in disk management. We'll see that the existing data disk 2 has been successfully attached to this virtual machine. If we need to, we can do the same uh, in File Explorer to check the specific files that were added in the uh, disk. See the test2 folder. Alright, and the file is persistent even though it's been attached to a new virtual machine. Alright, so we've seen how to um, attach the different data disks and um, we'll cover something else in the next presentation. Thanks for watching. In this lesson we're going to discuss how to resize the Windows data disk. Now we're in the Azure portal and we're going to resize data disk 1 in the GUI. Select the uh, um, VM2 and then to over uh, to the disks. We've been here a few times now. Click on data disk 1 and we'll see the size of this disk has been blurred out. In order to expand this data disk, we have to power off this virtual machine. For that, just click here and then stop. And then just to proceed further. And after that, we will expand the data disk one. Here we can see the Windows machine has stopped and now we'll expand the existing data disk. Select VM2 and disks and select the disk that we want to expand. We'll expand it from 20 to 25 gig. and we'll save the changes. The updates have taken. Now power on the virtual machine. Go over to the machine and start it. Might take some time. And we can see the Windows VM is running. We'll connect to this machine. Enter the username and password. Yes to proceed further.
it will see that the Windows VM is loading. Go to File Explorer and see whether or not it's been expanded. File, uh, File Explorer this PC. We see the size of this data disk is still 20 gig. This has been uh, expanded in, in the Bezor portal, expanded. We have to format the expanded data disk using disk management. So we'll go to disk management and then computer management. Select disk management. And you can see that 5 gig has been added to this data disk. We have to format this file system before we can make use of it. Uh, click on extended volume. Extend volume, sorry. Next to proceed further. Uh, we use the entire 5 gig for the expansion and then next to proceed click on finish now we can see the entire 25 gig is available and we can make use of the expanded size we'll go to the file explorer and check whether or not it's expanded showing in there We'll just refresh this page and you can see the data disk one has successfully been expanded. Check whether the files in this drive exist or not. And we can see that the file uh, does exist in this data disk. Alright, so in this lesson we've discussed how to add, detach and resize the data disk for um, the virtual machine. Now we'll go to the Azure, uh, Azure portal, remove the um, resource group that's been assigned to these virtual machines. I've actually done this a few times. Go to resource groups. Select the resource group and then we can delete it. After that enter the resource group name here. Click on delete. We can see that the resource group has been successfully removed. Alright, so that's the end of the lesson. Thanks for watching. In this lesson we're going to discuss Snapshot, probably the longest lesson in the entire course, so grab a coffee or uh, you can break this down into a couple of shorter sessions. Some familiar territory first, we're going to create a virtual machine, which you probably know how to do now quite quickly, but for the purposes of the lesson, in case some people have skipped forward, we'll go through it. We're going to create, uh, choose an unboot, unboot Ubuntu server. Give it the name of virtual 
for the virtual machine of Linux VM1, HDD, username Calium P, password. We'll confirm the same password. We'll create a, a new resource group also and give it the name RG Linux VM. After that, select the location and click OK to proceed further. Here we'll select the VM size that is A0 basic, which is the standard choice we have throughout the course and we'll select to proceed further we'll leave all the default settings and uh, disable the monitoring and then click OK and then we should see our summary of what we've created or about to create and then we'll click on uh, create to proceed further So we go to the virtual machines tab here and we'll see that our VM1 is creating. The status is now running. We're going to connect using the SSH command and then open the cloud shell. Paste in the SSH command and press enter and then type yes to proceed further. Enter the password. And we can see we've successfully logged into the Linux virtual machine. Run the command df minus h and everything is working fine and now we'll create a snapshot for this OS disk the uh, Linux uh, virtual machine we have to get the OS data disk details for this Linux virtual machine beforehand so we'll click on the machine and then disks Here we can see that this is the OS disk for which we'll create the snapshot. And just make a note of the disk name. And go to more services and search for snapshot. Select a snapshot. Now we'll create a snapshot for the operating system disk that we captured. Create snapshots. I'll specify the name as Linux VM1 OS disk. Use the existing resource group RG Linux VM. Uh, location will leave. We have to select the source disk next. Here I'll choose the Linux VM1 OS disk. Choose the account type. Uh, we'll use standard HDD. Uh, if, they want to, if we want any automation options we can go here. We won't uh, do that at the moment for the purposes of this lesson. Uh, we can see the validation is successful. And click on create. So this is to create the snapshot. The 
the snapshot will be created in a few minutes click on that snapshot to see more details and in order to export this snapshot click on export then click on generate URL this will create a new URL alright so with the, with the URL we can download the snapshot from this URL If you want to move this snapshot, click move here. Move to another resource group or move to another subscription if you wish. You can choose either. If you don't want to export the snapshot, just click cancel. Cancel export. Click yes to proceed further. Uh, that would cancel the snapshot. Uh, you can see the export has been cancelled. Click on delete and it would delete the snapshot. Click on yes. Alright, you see the snapshot has been successfully deleted. Now we'll see to, uh, how to create a snapshot for the data disk. First you have to go to Virtual Machines, click on VM1. Select Data Disks. We'll create a new uh, data disk and then attach that disk to the Linux VM1. For that click on uh, add data disk and it will create a new disk here. I'll specify the name as snap disk for want of a better term and then I'll use the existing resource group. Account type will have standard LRS and source type as empty. We'll have the size as 10 gig. Click on create and attach it to Linux VM1. Might take a few minutes for this to all occur. After that click save here and this will attach the snap disk to the virtual machine. Here we can see the disk has been successfully attached. Now we'll log into this virtual machine and copy this SSH command. Open the cloud shell, enter the SSH command and press enter. Type the password. And we'll now mount the attach snap disk here. We have to run the command DMESG pipe grep SCSI and you'll see that the STC disk has been attached here. Now we'll make a partition of this newly attached data disk. For that run the command sudo fdisk dev STC. and then run the command n to create a new partition. 
press P to create a primary partition. And then press 1 as this is the first partition. Uh, here we have to specify the first sector. I'll keep it as default. We format the entire disk. Keep everything as default. Press P to bring up the partition table. And we can see the partition has been successfully created. Now we'll write this partition update to the partition table. Press W to proceed further and we can see the partition table has been successfully updated. After that we have to format this file system. For that we're in the command sudo mkfs the file system type file system name. After that press enter. So the file system has been successfully formatted. After that we'll create a new device. First we create a new folder here and for that command is uh, sudo mkdir forward slash snap drive and after that press enter. After that we have to mount the file system run the command sudo mount drive dev sdc1 and then the folder name. And then press enter. We have successfully mounted the file system here. Now we're in the command df minus h. And we can see the newly created snap disk has been successfully added here at the bottom. Now we'll go to that directory. For that, run the command cd forward slash snap drive and we'll create a new folder here. A sudo mkdir and then the folder name, which will be test. We'll go to the test directory and create a few files. For that we'll run the command sudo touch one two three four five and we've created five files. Now run the command ls minus lia and we can see we've got five files that we have created. Now we create a snapshot for this uh, data disk. For that go to more services and search for snapshot and then snapshots. We'll click on create snapshots. I will specify the snapshot name as Linux snap. After that we'll use the existing resource group, i.e. RG Linux VM. Source disk will select snap disk of 10 gig, which we've created earlier and attached to the Linux VM. After that, I'll select the account type as HDD and create to proceed further. This will create a new snapshot for the snap data disk which we have created. Uh, we can see it's been successfully created here. Uh, virtual machines create a new data disk for this snapshot actually from a, a new machine. So we'll add Uh, Ubuntu server, uh, Ubuntu version, and then create. We've done this a few times, so 
should be pretty apparent. Um, Linux VM2, we're going to create HDD standard username, the uh, password, and repeat it. Confirm the password, and then we'll use the existing resource group, i.e., RG Linux VM. Click OK to proceed further. A0 basic and select. Keep all the default settings and change monitoring as usual and then OK. See the brief summary of the virtual machine. Click on create to proceed further. And we'll see a brief summary of the virtual machine. After this, we'll create a data disk from the snapshot. We'll attach that data disk to the Linux VM2. So we're going to have a look at the status of our VMs. Still in creating state here. OK. It's deployed and is running now. Now we'll create, uh, connect to this VM and have a look at the disk information. For that, click uh, click on connect, copy the SSH command, and open up the Cloud Shell. Log out from the Linux VM and paste the copied SSH command for Linux VM two, and press Enter. Type yes to proceed further and then enter the password uh, run the command df minus h and we can see the disk information. Now we'll create a new data disk from the snapshot which we created from the Linux VM1. For that click on Linux VM2 Go to Disks and add Data Disk here. Create Disk. I'll specify the name as Snap Disk 2. We we'll use the existing resource group RGV uh, Linux VM. We we'll select the standard account type as standard LRS. Snapshot in the source type options. Uh, choose the source snapshot. Linux snap we created previously. Specify more gigabytes if you so wish. After that, click Create to proceed further. Snap2 disk will be created from the snapshot Linux snap that we created earlier. Just click Create and it may take a little bit of time. After that, click Save to attach Snapdisk 2 to Linux VM2. It will update the virtual machine disks. Yeah.
here we can see the snap disk 2 has been successfully attached to Linux VM2. Now we'll log into the Linux VM2 and mount that newly attached disk. For that click on Cloud Shell. Currently we're in Linux VM2. There's no need to partition or format the data disk because it's been created from a snapshot. Now we can directly mount the attached disk, snap disk to here. And for that we will create a directory here. Uh, for that, run the command sudo mkdir forward slash snap drive 2. After that, we'll check whether the disk has been added or not. I run the command ds dmesg sorry pipe grep scuzzy and we can see the newly created snap disk 2 has been successfully attached. And now we'll mount that disk here. And for that run the command sudo mount dev sdc1 and then the mount directory. And press enter and we can see it's been successfully mounted after that run the command df minus h and we can see it's been successfully mounted here on the bottom we can add those discs to the virtual machine We've previously created a few folders and files in the snap drive that have been attached to the Linux VM2. As we've created snap drive 2 from the same snapshot, the data should also be the same in this drive. For that we'll check whether the data exists or not. Run the command cd forward slash snap drive 2. Press enter. And then run the command ls minus lia. And we can see the folder in which we created the Linux VM. The snap drive exists in this snap drive 2 as well. Now we'll check whether the files we created under the test folder exist. Run the command cd test ls lia and there's the files that we created earlier 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. So this is how we create data disks from snapshots. Run the command df minus h. You see the snap drive 2 has been created with 10 gigabytes. Uh, we specified it as 15. We have to expand this file system in Linux VM2. We have to unmount this file system and run the command sudo unmount dev sdc1 and then run the command sudo parted dev sdc. Type print here. Run the command resize part and press enter. Any partition number is 1. 
I'll specify the disk size as 16 gig. Press enter and then type quit. This will quit from the parted. And then we have to run the command sudo e2fsck and then the file system name. Press enter. We've successfully, uh, successfully updated the partition table. After that we'll resize the file system. Uh, sudo resize 2fs dev sdc1 and then press enter. After that mount this file system. Run the command sudo mount dev sdc1 and then the mount point. Uh, snap drive 2 in this particular case is the mount point. After that run the command df minus h. And we can see the expanded file system. Now we'll go to this directory and check the file details over here. Run the command ls minus lia. And here we can see those existing files. After that, go to the text directory and check whether the files are there or not in this directory. And run the command ls lia, and we can see that all the files exist in this man point. Now we'll see how to convert the disk from the standard to premium or from premium to standard. I'll delete the Linux VM1 which is no longer required. So that's being deleted. Um, we'll now, to see, now see how to convert the disk from standard to premium and premium to standard as I said. I'll check the disk type first. For that go to the virtual machine and click on disks. Here we can see the disk type is standard LRS. If we want to convert this disk to premium we have to create a snapshot. So over to the search bar to find snapshots. After that create a new snapshot here. We'll specify the name as snap premium. And then we use the existing resource group, which is RG Linux VM. Then for source disk, I'll select snap disk 2. I'll select the account type as premium SSD. It'll create, if we choose this, it will create a snapshot for this drive, drive with the account type as premium selected at the bottom here. After the creation of the snapshot, we have to create a data disk from that snapshot. So and in this way, we can convert the disk from standard to premium. Now if you want to do the reverse it means we need to convert the disk um, to standard and we choose standard here. Then we have to create a data disk from this snapshot.
Now we'll see how to create the OS snapshot from a Linux virtual machine in another way. For that we have to stop the Linux virtual machine. After that click on the virtual machine uh, and go to the disks. Here we can see that the OS disk type, just click on this OS disk for which we want to create the snapshot. After that we can create a snapshot for this disk, just click on create snapshot. Here I'll specify the snapshot name as Linux VM2 OS disk. Then I'll select the existing resource group. After that, select the account type as HDD and click create. And we can see the snapshot has been successfully created. Now we go to snapshots. Here we can see that the snapshot has been successfully created. Now we'll see how to create a new virtual machine from this snapshot. Uh, first go to disks. Click on that. Uh, add here. This will create a new manage disk. We'll specify the NIST, uh, disk name as Linux VM3. After that I'll use the existing resource group uh, RG Linux VM. Account type standard HDD. I'll choose the source type as snapshot. I'll select or the created uh, snores, snores snapshot <laughs> already created Linux VM2 OS disk and then I'll specify the size as 30 gigabyte. Click on create to create a new managed disk that helps us to create a new virtual machine. So this will create a new managed disk. May take some time to create this disk. Here we'll see that the Linux VM3 disk has been successfully created. What we'll do now is create a virtual machine from this disk. Select the Linux VM3. Click on create VM. And now we can see all the information of that disk. Click create VM to create a new virtual machine from this disk. Specify the name as Linux VM3. Now go to the existing resource group and click OK to proceed further. Uh, VM sized as A0 basic. After that click select. Keep all the default settings. We'll change the monitoring speed as disabled and click OK to proceed further. And we'll see the summary of the virtual machine here. And as the virtual machine is created from the private disk. This is what we created from the snapshot. Click OK to proceed further. Uh, the new virtual machine deployment is in progress. Click on virtual machine tab. It's been successfully created and is running. So that's how to create the uh, new virtual machines from the snap.
Now I'll delete the resource group. So come to a finish now, so we'll just tidying up. Go to the resource group and click on delete resource group. Give the resource group name here. Click on delete. And this will delete all your data disks, the snapshots and the virtual machines that you created. Obviously you'll go through this process several times to get prepared for the exam. So we covered a lot of ground here. I hope you found it interesting and uh, go through it, stop the video, follow the steps and just keep going round and round until you get used to doing it. I'll see you on the next video. Thanks for watching. Welcome to the lesson on storage. Microsoft Azure Storage is a Microsoft managed cloud service. It provides storage that's highly available, secure, durable, scalable and redundant. Microsoft takes care of all the maintenance and handles all of the critical problems uh, should they arise. Azure Storage consists of three data services. These are Blob Storage, File Storage and Q Storage. Blob Storage supports both standard and premium storage, with premium storage using only SSDs for the fastest performance. Another feature is Cool Storage, allowing you to store large amounts of access data, uh, so allowing you to store large amounts of rarely accessed data for a lower cost. Just I'm um, going to discuss blob storage. So blob storage for Azure is a service for storing large amounts of unstructured object data such as text or binary. It can be accessed from anywhere in the world via HTTP or HTTPS. You can use blob storage to expose data publicly to the world or to store application data privately. Some of the common uses for blob storage serving images or documents directly to a browser, storing files for distributed access, streaming video and audio, storing data for backup and restore, disaster recovery and archiving, storing data for analysis by an on-premises or Azure hosted service, storage account. Now we'll look at storage account. All access to Azure storage is done through a storage account. This can be a general purpose storage account or blob storage account that's specialized for storing objects or um, blobs. Now we'll look at container. A container provides a grouping of all sets of blobs. All blobs must be in a container. An account can contain an unlimited uh, number of containers and a container can, can store an unlimited number of blobs. Note that the container name must be in lowercase. I think this is the same with Amazon actually. 
if I remember correctly. Now uh, we'll look at blobs, uh, any file of any type and size. Azure offers three types of blobs, block blobs, page blobs and append blobs. Uh, in the image you can see the Azure storage account has uh, Bob's Burgers. The container has container1 and container n. And these containers have the blobs. Container1 has default HTML, contact HTML and menu HTML. In this way the storage account container and blobs are related to one another. Block blobs are ideal for storing text or binary files such as documents and media files. Append uh, blobs are similar to block blobs in that they are made up of blocks but they are optimised for append operations so they are useful for logging scenarios. A single block blob can contain up to 50,000 blocks of up to 100 meg each for a total size of slightly more than 4.75 terabits terabytes a single um, a pen blob can contain up to 50,000 blocks of up to 4 meg each for a total size of slightly more than 195 gig page blobs can be up to 1 terabyte in size they're more efficient for frequent read-write operations. Azure Virtual Machines use page blobs as OS and data disks. Now we'll look at a practical session of blob storage. First we'll go to storage accounts in Azure. We'll have to create a new storage account here. For that we just click on add. We have to create the storage account here. And we have to specify the name of the storage account. Should be a unique name and all in lowercase. I'll give the uh, account name as PKA Storage. After that, we have to select the deployment model. I'll select Resource Manager. And we have to select the kind of account or the account kind. You can see three types to choose from. General Purpose V1, Storage V2, General Purpose V2 and Blob Storage. Now we'll look at the Blob Storage accounts first. Uh, Bob's storage, Blob storage will support only Blob service and it will support the types of uh, blog blobs and append blobs. And we see the two types of access tiers, cool and hot. Default option is hot. This indicates that the files in this account will be frequently accessed. This uh, allows you to store the data at a higher access cost compared to Cool. Cool indicates that the files exist in this account will be less uh, frequently accessed. Uh, this allows you to store the data at a lower cost. After that we can see the replication here. Three types of replication. Default option is read access, geo redundant storage. This will provide the read access and the data will be available uh, globally. 
If you want geo redundant storage, we can select here. If you want to use locally redundant storage, we can select here. But I use the default option as read access geo redundant storage RAGRS. Next, we'll see the option secure transfer required. If we want to securely transfer the data, we must enable this option. But here I'll make it as disabled. After that, select the subscription type and then resource group. Either we can create a new resource group or we can use the existing resource group. After that, virtual networks. If we enable this option, only specified virtual networks and subnets can access this storage account. Uh, this and this is how we generally set up blob storage. As of now, we're not creating this storage type. We're going to go to storage v2, general purpose. And here we can see two options for performance, standard and premium. If you want more performance, we can select premium in replication. We can go to read access, geo redundant storage, um, geo redundant storage and locally redundant storage. Default option is read access, geo redundant storage. And we can see the options for cool and hot access tier. If you want to save files that are not accessed frequently, we'll go to the cool option. If you want to enable secure transfer, we can do so here. You can see virtual networks. If you want to enable, we can enable it here. As of now, I'm not creating this account. Next, we'll look at uh, general purpose V1 storage. See the two performance, standard and premium. We'll choose standard here. Premium will give fire faster access to the storage accounts. After that, I'll disable secure transfer here. After that, select subscription type. And I'll create a, a new resource group here and give the name as RG storage. After that, I'll keep virtual networks as disabled. And I'll validate all the information here. You can see PKA storage is the name. We can access this storage account with a pkastorage.core.windows.net. We've uh, selected general purpose V1 storage type. Storage supports, um, uh, supports blobs, queues and file services. After checking all the details, click create to proceed further. And we can see that the new storage account is being created. And it's been created successfully. Now we'll go and see the services that exist in this storage account. Just click on storage account. Here we can see the services like blobs, files, tables and queues. We'll look at blobs first. Here we'll select blobs to work on. And we can see there's no existing data here at the moment. 
we'll create a static website and check whether it's working or not. For that we have to create a container Here we'll give the name as website and after that we have to specify the public access level. Here we are creating a static website that needs public access. There are options in the public access level. The first option is private, no anonymous access needed. This means that only storage account, only the storage account owner can access the data. Next option is blob, synonymous read access for blobs only. If we choose this option, files that exist in the container can be read accessed. The last option is container. This is anonymous read access for containers and blobs. If we choose this option, both folders and files under this container can be accessed publicly by others. As we're creating a static website, we need access for both containers and blobs. So I'll choose container, anonymous read access for containers and blobs. After that, click OK to proceed further. And we can see that website container has successfully been created. If you want to see options for this container, click here. Go to the, the uh, container properties if you select the properties tag. We can see the container URL which is used for this one. Last modified, a lease. Uh, status and all the details below here. If you want to give any access policies we can do so here. Yeah, if you want to add any policy you do so here. For now we're not doing that for the moment we just wanted to show you where it is. After that if you want to uh, lease this container uh, click here. This way you can create a lease. Le well, while the lease is active, we must include the lease ID with any request. To delete the container or renew, uh, change or release uh, the lease. In this way we can create a lease for the container. All right, now we'll release this lease. Click on break lease. Click yes to proceed further. And we can see the status of the lease as broken. If you want to edit any uh, metadata, you can do so here. Uh, we're not going to add any metadata at the moment, so we'll just leave that. Uh, if you want to delete this container, do so here. Or well, we won't do that at the moment. Now we'll go to the inside of this container. Uh, we can upload files here. I'll upload an index HTML file to this container. For that, click and upload and click here. Here's one we prepared earlier. I'll select index HTML and then open. You could use any uh, file you have access to. If you want to click any advanced option, click on advanced. We'll keep all the default settings. See a few more options uh, as you go down the list. We, uh, we won't worry about these at the moment though. Blob type, blob size, etc. Click on upload to upload this file to the container. You 
here we can see that the file has successfully been uploaded. Now we'll test whether the static website is working correctly or not. Go to the storage account, select the storage account on which we're working. Select that blob. The website address here. And we've copied the URL. You can see the container under this storage account is website. And this is where you can see the files. Paste that URL into a new tab. Add the container and file name in the address bar. Where the container name is website. And the file name is index.html. Press enter. Here we can see that the website has been successfully loaded. Nothing exciting but it just proves our, our point. Now we'll go to the Azure portal and test the secondary blob service endpoint. For that Copy the URL here and paste it in a new tab. Add the container name, i.e. website, and the file name index.html in the address bar. After that, press enter. We can see that the secondary URL is working correctly. In this way, we can use the blob service to work on static websites. Now we'll go to the Azure portal and just look at a few more details. We'll see where uh, what the options are that exist in the uh, blobs. If you want to delete the container you can click there. If you want to get container properties, it's just next to that option, container properties. Uh, if you want to edit, edit the access policies, this is where you do it. And now we'll see what are the options that exist for blobs. Click here and we'll see the options. Click edit if you want to edit this file. This is the data that exists in this file. Here I'll edit this file as welcome to test static website. After that, click on save. Here we can see that the file has been successfully saved. After that, close this one. Now we'll test whether or not it's been successfully saved or not. For that, go to the static website URL and test whether or not it's been updated or not. Go to this website and just refresh here. And you can see the file has been successfully edited and we can see the changes. We'll also check for the secondary URL, which I'll refresh. And you can see that's been successfully edited. So we'll go over to the blobs again and we'll see more options for this file. If you want to download we can do so here. Properties you can see here. Scroll through all the different properties there. If you want to edit any metadata do it here.
Uh, if you want to provide a lease, click on acquire lease here. While the lease is active, we must include the lease ID with any request to write to the blob or to renew, change or release the lease. And then close the lease window. So you can see the lease status at the moment is leased. Now we'll release the lease. Click on break lease. Yes to proceed further. And now we can see the lease has been broken. So this is how we work on containers and blobs as an overview. Hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you in the next lesson. In this lesson I'm going to discuss the Azure Storage Explorer. Now apart from the Azure portal, we can also use software to work with the storage. Now we have to download this software, so we'll go to the following URL. You can Google it as well actually. Uh, Azure Storage Explorer and um, by using this Storage Explorer we can actually work on storage accounts it's a free download you can work on blob storage and queue storage you can um, read through the technical documentation and whatever else they um, provide Azure Cosmos database storage also and there's probably some technical documentation in there and marketing stuff. So download the Storage Explorer link. This will obviously download it to your local machine. Agree to the license terms if you do agree. And then you'll click on the install button. Choose whichever path that you uh, normally download your software. And then click next to proceed further. So this will install the Storage Explorer on your local device. has been installed. Choose launch Microsoft Azure Storage Explorer. Click on next. Now you'll have to sign into the um, Azure account that you've created to add whichever credentials you have. After connecting to the Microsoft uh, Azure Storage Explorer, you can see the storage accounts that are attached to your Azure account. You can see the PKA storage, which we created earlier. You see the blob containers, file shares, queues and tables. Uh, we've created blob containers here. Uh, this was the website we did on the previous video. In the blob container we can uh, to take the following actions as you can see. 
If you want to create a new blob container, we can create it just by clicking here. Then we have to specify the new container name. Here we can see the container name should be lowercase. I'll specify the container name as website2. And here we can see the container2 has been successfully created. If we want to delete this container we can delete it here. You can rename it here. If you want to copy this blob container, do so here. If you want to copy the direct link, that is. Uh, so this is how we can perform all of the actions on the container. Now we'll see whether or not we can see the files under the container website or not. So go to that website and you can see the details under the website container. You can see the file which we created earlier in another video, the index.html. If you wish you can open it. Click on yes to proceed further. It'll be opened in the local computer. We can create a new folder by clicking new folder here. And here we'll get a new window, create new virtual directory where we have to specify the name. Here I will give the name as new page and then click on OK. We can upload or download the files here. If you want to upload any new files to this container, just click on Upload. Here we have two options, Upload Folder and Upload Files. Here I'll select Upload Files. After that, select the blob type and here I'll select it as Block uh, Blob. After that, select the files from here, I created earlier. I'll choose um, page 2 HTML. After that, click on Upload. And we can see that page 2 has been successfully uploaded. So in this way, we can upload files using the Azure Storage Explorer. If you want to download any file, just click here. Here I'll select index.html. I'll ask the path to where the file should be downloaded, or it will. Here I'll rename the file as index2.html and then click on save. So in this way we can download files using the Azure Storage Explorer. We, we can see that the index to STM has been successfully downloaded and after that we can make uh, snapshots for these files under this container. Select the file, click on more to see more options and here are the actions that we can uh, select from. A rename, delete make snapshots, manage snapshots, etc. here. You can also see the properties folder statistics and refresh. So we'll create a new snapshot for this file. For that to click on make snapshot. So a new snapshot has been created. If you want to see, see see the snapshots, just go to more options and select manage snapshots. And here you can see the snapshot of index.html. So that's how we 
uh, can create a snapshot in this, in, in this instance for the index file. So this is how we make use of the uh, Azure storage containers. Now we'll see whether the newly created containers and files uh, actually exist in the storage account in the Azure portal. This is just a sanity check. We know they, we know they're going to be there, but I just want to show you how. So go to storage accounts and select the storage account here. Click on blobs to proceed further. Here we can see that website two has been successfully created. We'll also check for the new file under the website. Go to the website and refresh the page. We can see that page two has been uploaded successfully. So fairly simple to use, just a, a whistle stop tour of the Azure Storage Explorer. Thanks for watching this lesson and I'll see you on the next one. In this lesson we'll see how to connect this blob storage to the virtual machines. For that we have to create a new virtual machine, which we've done a few times. We'll go into virtual machines, create a virtual machine, Ubuntu server here, 1604, and then click on create. I'll give the name of the virtual machine as Linux VM and after that select the VM disk type as HDD all the usual details actually that we've done many times Calium P uh, you'll choose a password obviously here you just choose one you can remember easily then we'll just confirm it We'll use the existing resource group RG Storage, which we created earlier. Select on, select on location as South India. You could obviously change some of these settings depending on where you are. And we'll choose View All and we'll go for the normal setting from all our videos A0 Basic. We'll keep all the settings as default. And for manage storage. This is obviously for the managed disks, if we want to use them or not. Selected now here, we'll select a storage account here. This uh, one we created previously in an earlier lesson. This means we're creating an unmanaged disk for this Linux virtual machine. Select the storage account. I use PKA storage for this virtual machine. Keep all the default settings, but we'll have monitoring disabled. After that, click OK. This virtual machine will create an unmanaged disk in the storage account PKA storage. After that, click OK to proceed further. And here we can see the summary of the virtual machine. Click Create to proceed further. and the new machine is creating. We can see the status of that virtual machine 
uh, creating you can refresh to see updates and now it's successfully uh, deployed and this status is running click on this uh, virtual machine and then go down to disks and here we can see the OS disk Linux VM see the storage account type as standard RAGRS now we'll go to the storage account and see whether the OS disk which has been created with this Linux VM is there or not go to storage accounts PKA storage click on blobs and we can see VHDS this is a folder where the unmanaged disks exist just click on VHDS and we can see the Linux VM OS disk here here's the size which is 30 gig so this is how we save OS disk files in the blob storage after that we'll create a new disk for this Linux VM from the blob storage click on Linux VM I'll check what the existing file systems are here for that I will connect to this Linux VM copy the SSH command and open it in Cloud Shell I give the SSH command here and press enter type yes to proceed further and then enter the password after that run the command df minus h these are all the file systems that exist on the Linux VM now I'll create a new disk on the blob storage and I'll attach that disk to this Linux VM for that go to the Azure portal and select the virtual machine select the disks attach a data disk here and here we have to uh, give a name for the unmanaged disk we'll use Linux VM unmanaged disk uh, we have to specify the uh, source type we can add an existing blob storage or we can create a new empty disk here I'll choose new empty disk and after that I'll select the account type as standard select the size of that and manage disk I'll select the size as 10 gig after that we have to select the storage container click browse and select the storage container here I'll select the storage container as PKA storage we're save, as we're saving the files of uh, the VM under VHDS container I'll select VHDS and then click on select after that we have to name the storage blob name here I'll name it as Linux VM and manage disk VHD after that click OK to proceed further so this is how we create an unmanaged disk and attach that disk to the virtual machine after that click OK after that click on save it will update the virtual machine information And here we can see the new and managed disk has been successfully attached to the Linux VM.
we can also validate the same information from the storage accounts. Go to the storage accounts and go to the PKA storage. After that, select the blobs and select VHDS. Here we can see the new VHD file has been created with 10 gig. Here uh, the blob type is a page blob. After that, I'll log into that virtual machine and check whether it's been successfully added. I mean, this is just a sanity check, but it's also another way you could be quizzed in the exam, or you may have to do it this way if you're working on an Azure uh, installation. So you can see the new disk has been successfully created. You can see the command at the top here. After this, run the command sudo fdisk dev sdc. This will partition uh, the newly attached disk. After that, press enter. As we're creating a new partition, press N to proceed further. Press P to proceed further. I'll select one and so press one to proceed further along. We'll use the entire disk, so just leave the settings as default. Keep the default settings for the last sector also. After that we have to print the information. For that, press P to proceed further. And here we can see that that disk has been successfully partitioned. After that, I'll update the partition table. In order to, we have to type W. And the partition table has successfully updated. Clear the screen. After that, we have to format the newly created file system. Run the command sudo mkfs uh, file system type file system name. And then press enter. So the file system has been successfully formatted. After that, I'll create a new directory here to mount the file system. Uh, command is sudo mkdir and then the directory name. I'll give the directory name as udisk1. After that, press enter and I'll mount the file system here. Run the command sudo mount dev sdc1 udisk1 and then press enter. Run the command df minus h and here we can see that the unmanaged data disk has been successfully attached to the Linux machine and the file system has been successfully mounted. Now we'll see how to resize this and manage disk. For that, we have to power down this this virtual machine. For that, go to stop. Yes, to proceed further. And here we can see the state of this, of this virtual machine is deallocating. It may take some time to stop this virtual machine. And here we can see that the virtual machine has been stopped. Now we'll expand the unmanaged disk of this virtual machine. For that, click on the Linux VM, go down to Disks, click on the Linux VM, Unmanaged Disk, specify the size here. And I'll specify the size as 15 gig. I'll change the host caching uh, to read write. After that, click on save to proceed further. 
This will update the virtual machine disk information. So the disk information has successfully been uploaded and we can see the details from the storage accounts also. Go to the storage account, click on blobs, VHDS. We can see the size has been successfully resized to 15 gig. Now we will power on the virtual machine. Here we go to the virtual machine, click on start. And we can see the virtual machine is running. Now go to the virtual machine, click on connect, grab the SSH, over to the cloud shell, which will clear, and then just paste in and press enter. Yes to proceed further, and after that just enter the password. We have to re uh, resize the file system here. Uh, for that we just run the command df-h. Check whether the file system SDC has been unmounted or not. And here we can see the file system has been unmounted. And we have to run the command sudo parted file system name. After that, press enter. Type print here and press enter. And here we can see the disk size is 16 gig. After that, type resize part and then press enter. Enter the partition number number one and next I will give the end size of 16 gig after that press enter press quit to quit from this tool and after that uh, we update the partition size for that we run the command sudo e2 fsck and then the file system name after that, press enter and you can see the file system has been successfully resized. And now we run the command sudo resize 2fs dev sdc1 and press enter. This file system has been successfully expanded. Now we're going to mount the file system. Just paste in the command mount dev sdc1 udisk1 and press enter and then run the command df minus h and we can see the unmanaged disk with uh, 15 gig has been successfully expanded and attached to this linux vm now we'll see how to detach uh, unmanaged disks from the vm First, unmount this file system, and for that run the command sudo unmount, and then the mount point. Press enter to unmount this file system. After that, run the command df-h, and we can see the file system has been successfully unmounted. After that, shut down the VM. Uh, run the command sudo shut down and press enter. And the uh, VM will shut down after a, a few moments. All right, shut down command has been processed now. And we'll go and have a look in the Azure portal. And we'll have to 
stop this virtual machine just click on stop to do that click on yes to proceed further and here we can see the status of this virtual machine is deallocating now it could take some time to deallocate the um, machine and we can see it's actually stopped now we go to the virtual disk machine and select disks here we have to click edit click on detach here click on save this will update the virtual machine disks configuration here we can see that the unmanaged disk has been successfully removed after that I'll go to storage accounts and select the storage account select the blobs and select VHDS select the file and select delete to delete this unmanaged disk which is uh, no longer required after that click on delete and then yes to proceed further so this uh, is how we've det um, detached the unmanaged disk and remove it from the storage account we'll remove the VM which is no longer required go to the VM and click on uh, delete why to proceed further and this will delete the VM here we can see the status is deleting and the VM has been successfully deleted after that I'll go to the storage account and remove the OS disk for that Linux VM click on blobs select VHDS after that this is the Linux OS disk that's connected to the Linux virtual machine now I'll delete this unmanaged disk file click here delete to proceed further so the Linux OS disk file has been successfully deleted alright so this lesson we discussed the blob VM next lesson we'll move on to another topic thanks for watching In this lesson we're going to discuss uh, file storage. Azure Files, uh, the Azure File Service enables you to set up highly available network file shares. These can be accessed by using the standard SMB protocol uh, that means that multiple VMs can share the same files with both read and write access. You can also read the uh, files using the REST interface or the storage client libraries. One thing that distinguishes Azure File Storage from files on a corporate file share is that you can access the files from anywhere in the world using a URL that points to the file. It also includes a shared access signature token. You can generate SES tokens which allow specific access to a private asset for a specific amount of time.
File shares can be used for many common scenarios. Many on-premises applications use file shares. This feature makes it easier to migrate those applications that share uh, data to Azure. If you mount the file share to the same uh, drive letter that the on-premises application uses, the part of your application that accesses the file shares uh, should work with minimal, if any, changes at all. The uh, configuration files can be stored on a file share and accessed from multiple VMs. Tools and utilities used by multiple developers in a group can be stored on a file share, ensuring that everybody can find them and that they use the same version. Diagnostic logs, metrics and crash dumps are just three examples of data that can be written to a file share and processed or analysed later on. Now we'll look at the practical sessions for file storage. First we have to create a storage account, so we'll click on storage account. Uh, we'll use the same storage account uh, for these files as well. We've been in this section quite um, a few times earlier. Click on storage account and then files. And we'll create a new file share here. Click on file share. After that we have to specify the name of the file share. I will give it the name Azure Share. After that we have to uh, give the quota. Maximum quota size we can specify is 5 terabytes. I'll give the quota size as 2 gigabytes. After that click on OK. This will create a new share here. Here we can see the new share has been successfully created. Now we'll see more options for this share. Just click here and we can see more options. Click properties to see the properties. And here we can see the properties of the share. If you want to connect to the share, just click on connect. These are all uh, the commands that can be executed to connect to Windows. You can scroll down here on the side. I'm not, I'm not connecting um, the share to any Windows or Linux server, but look at those later on if you want. If you want to add or edit the quota, do so here. Quota is 2 gig and I will edit it uh, to be 3 gig now. Here we can see the quota has been changed to 3 gig. If we want to edit any metadata we can edit here. As of now we're not going to edit it. After that if we want to create any access policy we can click here. Click Add Policy to add any policy here, but uh, we're not going to add any policy at the moment. Uh, come to the last option, if we just want to delete this share, click here. Now click on Azure Share. We can see uh, quite a few options. If you want to upload files under this share, we can upload here. If you want to create a directory, we can add it by clicking uh, on Add Directory. I'll specify the name as Linux Files and then click on OK. Here you can see the new, new directory has been created. 
If you want to refresh, just click on refresh. If you want to delete, click on delete share. And if you want to see the properties, just click on properties. If you want to edit the quota, we can do so here. And if you want to create any snapshot, you can click on snapshot and then create snapshot just here. Uh, here we can see the snapshot has been successfully created. If you want to see the snapshot of this share, then go to the uh, snapshot and click view snapshots. You can see the snapshot details here. If you want to see the files under the snapshot, just click on snapshot. If you want to create this snapshot to the Windows or Linux directory, we can connect to it here by running these commands. In this way we can make use of uh, snapshots. The snapshots can also be used uh, in the case if we delete any files by accident or unintentionally we can just restore those files from this snapshot. If you want to see the properties of the snapshot then click on properties see properties here and uh, so this is the way we make use of snapshots now we'll see how to upload files to this file server for that click and upload and then select the files from here I'll upload index HTML and index to HTML files after that click on open and upload so upload has been successfully completed and we can see the files have been successfully uploaded if you want to upload any files under Linux files uh, open that folder and then click on upload to upload files to this folder Here I'll upload page 2 HTML to this folder. After that click on open and click on upload to proceed further. Here we can see that page 2 HTML has been successfully uploaded under the Azure Share Linux files. Here we also uh, can add a new directory as well. I'm not creating any directory here. If you want to delete any directory we can delete it here and then close this window. If you want to see more options for this Linux folders uh, and files just click on here. If uh, we want to see the properties we can get the properties from here. And if you want to delete the directory this is the place to do it. Edit metadata just under there to edit the metadata. Uh, in the same way we can see the options for files. The edit file uh, tag which uh, I think we, we did earlier actually. We'll edit this as welcome to share website and click save. So we easily edited. If you want to download, is the next tag down. Uh, properties. Download from here also if you wanted to. Edit metadata again and then finally delete. Now we'll see how to attach this Azure Share to Linux and Windows machines. For that first we have to create a Linux virtual machine which we should be very familiar with the process by now. Virtual machines, Ubuntu server, 
After that, click Create. I'll give the virtual machine the name Linux VM. And then select VM disk type as HDD. I'll give the username as Calim P and then enter the password. Retype it. I'll create a new resource group here. I'll give the resource group name as RG Linwin VM. After that, click on OK. After that, we have to select VM size. I'll select a VM as A0 Basic. After that, click Select to proceed further. I'll keep all the default settings here. I'll change the monitoring as disabled and then click on OK to proceed further. Here we can see the summary of the virtual machine and then click on Create. Uh, so the new virtual machine is creating. We can see from the status of the VM on the VM tab. And we can see VM is deployed, status running. When I connect to this VM, click on connect, copy the SSH command and open the cloud shell. Click on reconnect. Cloud shell has been successfully loaded. After that, run the command SSH and click yes to proceed further and then enter the password. Type yes. All right, we've successfully logged into the virtual machine. We can run the command DF minus H. These are all the file systems that exist on this VM. Now we'll connect the file share which we created in the file storage to this VM. Uh, for that first we have to update the packages. Now we have to run the command sudo apt get update. This will update all of the packages. We have to install CIFSUtils package on the Ubuntu server. sudo apt-get install CIFSUtils. Then press enter. Here we can see CIFSUtils is installed and it's the newest version. Now we'll see how to mount the file share on this Linux VM. After that create a mount directory here. Here I'll create the mount directory as file share. After that press enter. So we've successfully created a mount point. Here we go to the storage accounts and select the particular storage account. And then go to files. This is the file share which we have to connect on this Linux VM. For that click here and click on connect. Copy this command and rename the amount point which we have created. After copying this command, go to the cloud shell and run the command after replacing the mount point.
uh, paste the command in here and here we have to run the command um, sudo mount uh, t cifs the storage account and the share name map point username and password and here we can see the directory and file permissions after that press enter to execute the command command has been successfully executed now run the command uh, df minus h you can see the file share has been successfully mounted and we'll go to the directory file share now and check whether the files exist or not run the command ls lia and we can see the files that we created and uploaded in the file share exist here Uh, Linux directory, Linux files, two files, i.e. index and index2. After that I'll go to the directory uh, Linux files and press enter. Run the command ls lia and here we can see that the page2 file which we have uploaded in this way we can access the file storage from the Linux virtual machine If you want to make this system uh, file system persistent across all uh, reboots, we have to edit the etc fs tab. For that, we run the command sudo bash c echo the file share name, the mic point o and version. Username password etc fs tab. Press enter. This will be updated to EDC FS tab. Check whether it's been updated or not. Run the command cat EDC FS tab. And press enter. And here we can see the new line has been successfully added. So this way we can make the file uh, storage persistent on Linux virtual machines. Alright, so we've discussed file storage. That's the end of the lesson. Thanks for watching. In this lesson, we'll see how to connect the file storage on Windows Server. For this purposes, we'll need to create a new Windows Virtual Server. Go to Virtual Machines and Windows Server. Windows Server 2016 Data Center will do, and then click on Create. Call this WinVM. HTD for the disk, enter the username and password, then retop the password. After that we'll use the existing resource group which we created earlier. If we have any license we can select here. As of now, I'll select No. Click on View All to see the available VM sizes. We'll choose A2 Basic.
Here we'll keep all the default settings. After that, click OK to proceed further. Here we can see the summary of the virtual machine. Click on Create. We can see the status of the virtual machine in the virtual machines tab. Now we can see that Windows Virtual Machine has been successfully deployed and the status is running. Now we'll connect to this virtual machine by clicking connect. It will download an RDP file, just click on that and then click on connect. After that you'll need to enter the username and password and then click OK. Click Yes to proceed further. Click Yes here when the server has loaded and then close this wizard go to file server and we'll check which file systems already exist on this window server this PC we can see these drives here now we'll attach the file storage to this Windows Virtual Machine. So we'll go to the Azure portal now. Go to Storage Accounts and click on the specific storage account. Click on Files here. You click on the menu and then connect. We have to run these commands to connect to uh, this file st storage to on the uh, Windows server. This file share will connect to the drive letter as Z. So we'll copy this command here. and we'll go to Windows Server go to the File Explorer click on this PC click on Computer and here we can see the map network drive click on the map network drive We can get the file storage path from the command, as you can see here. So here we're sharing the Azure share on this Windows server. Just click finish. We have to give the network credentials here. Get the credentials from the command that we copied. Username will start with Azure and the storage container name. After that, enter the password and checkbox option. Remember my credentials. Click on OK to proceed further. We see that the file sharing has been successfully connected. see the files and folders under that share now we'll go to the Linux files and check whether the file exists or not here we can see that page 2 exists here check this PC and here we can see the network locations 
We can access the file storage on this Windows server from here. Now we'll add a few files to this uh, file storage. I'll create a new folder here and I'll give the name as Win Files. Now we'll create some files under this folder. Here I'll create a new text document and I will give the name Test. We'll add some data to this file. Uh, hi, welcome to the test document. After that, save this file. And we'll check whether this newly created folder and file exists or not. On the Linux share, which we have created for this file storage, go log into the Linux virtual machine. Now run the command df minus h. After that, I'll go to the file storage and mount point. I'll run the command ls lia, and we can see the newly created folder win file. Now cd to this newly created folder win file. lslia and we can see that we've created uh, the file uh, test on the Linux virtual machine there. We can check the details of that file here. Press enter and you'll see the data. Hi, welcome to this machine. And this way we can share files across the Linux and uh, Windows. Now we'll uh, see how to work on Azure Storage Explorer for files. For that I'll open up the Azure Storage Explorer we can see the Azure share files and folders. If you want to upload any file we can upload from here. Just click on upload. And then select files. I'll select the file Linux VM backup.sh here. And after that click on open and then click on Upload. We have successfully uploaded the file Linux VM backup.sh here. So this way we can upload and we can access files and folders using the Storage Explorer. Now we'll see whether this new file which you uploaded is in the Azure share or not. For that go to the Azure share, storage accounts and select the particular storage account. Click on files, select the Azure share and here we can see the file Linux VM backup.sh which we uploaded using the Azure Storage Explorer. So this is how we upload files using the Ex uh, Storage Explorer. We can also connect to this uh, file storage, uh, storage in the local computer as well. Now we'll delete this resource group which is no longer required. We'll also delete the virtual machines which uh, we created for this lesson. Go to the resource group and select the resource group which uh, we want to delete. RG Linux VM is the resource group where the Linux and the virtual machines exist. So we'll delete this resource group. That will also delete the virtual machines. 
uh, click on delete resource group after that enter the resource group name and click delete to proceed further it may take some time to delete this resource group and then we can see that the resource group has been successfully removed now we'll go to the storage container and delete the file storage uh, which we created storage accounts click on the relevant storage account after that go to files now we have to delete this share click here and select uh, delete share If we delete it, the snapshots which we created will also be deleted automatically. Type the share name here. And then OK to proceed. Here we can see the file share has been successfully removed. Alright, so we've come to the end of the lesson. Thanks for listening and I'll see you on the next lesson. In this lesson we'll discuss backup and restore for Linux and virtual machines. First we'll create a Linux virtual machine and install Nginx on the Linux VM. For that go to virtual machines and click on create virtual machines. Go to Ubuntu server 16.04 and click on create. We'll go through this pretty quickly because you've done it before many times, hopefully by now. We'll specify a Linux VM as the name, HDD, usual username, password. it in twice or we'll create a new uh, resource group we'll give it the name RG Linwin VM L location we'll choose India click uh, OK we have to select the VM size next. And we'll go for yeah, A0 basic. Click select to proceed. Keep all the default settings, change monitoring to disabled, and then click OK to proceed further. Now and here we can see the summary of that virtual machine. After that click create to proceed further. This will create a new Linux virtual machine. And we can see the status of that VM in the virtual machines tab. So it's creating at the moment. Now we'll test the backup 
and the restore for this virtual machine. We'll take a backup and delete some files and then we'll try to restore files from the backup. Here we can see that the Linux virtual machine has been successfully created and the status is running. Now we'll connect to this VM, install Nginx on the, uh, on the virtual machine. Um, connect and copy the SSH command. After that, over to the cloud shell. Go to the bash shell here. They'll have to restart. Bash shell has been successfully loaded. So we'll paste in our SSH and press enter. Yes to proceed and then enter the password. We've successfully logged into the Linux virtual machine. Engine X will be installed here, but we'll just update the package. Command is sudo apt get minus y update. Here we can see all the packages are updated and we'll install Nginx on the Linux server here. Run the command sudo apt get minus y install nginx and press enter. If we can see now, Nginx package has been successfully installed. Now we have to open up port 80 for this virtual machine. Go to the virtual machine and select networking. We have to add the inbound rule here. HTTP. After that, click on Advanced. Select the protocol as any. After that, click OK to open up port 80 for web traffic. Here we can see that the secured rule for port 80 has been successfully created. Now we'll test whether this web server is working for uh, this Linux virtual machine. Copy the public IP address of the VM into a, a browser tab and you can see the Nginx web server page is loaded. You can see your web server is successfully installed and working fine on the Linux VM. Now we'll take a backup of this Linux VM, delete a few files and then look at restoring uh, these files. Now uh, before we do anything we'll back up the machine. So we'll click on the virtual machine select backup here we have to create a new backup for the Linux VM we can take a backup of the virtual machine from here here 
in the recovery services vault we have to create a new vault for the backup files for this Linux virtual machine here I'll give the vault name as backup vault after that we have to select the resource group name I'll select the existing resource group RG Linwin VM which we created earlier and then we'll select the backup policy if you want to take the backup of this VM daily select the daily policy if we want to see more backup policies just click here here we can create a new backup policy to determine when the backup should take place Here we see that the backup policy is a daily policy. So the backup frequency will be daily at 11.30 p.m. UTC. After that, uh, we can specify the retention of a daily backup. So 180 days set presently. If you want to choose uh, the retention of weekly, for a backup point we can click here we can select the retention of the weekly backup point just here we're not going to choose it at the moment if you want monthly uh, choose here and you can change the options just down here we're not going to do this either and then for yearly we choose uh, further down just here so we can change all these options here uh, we're not going to choose this one either so we're going to keep everything as default you'll click on enable backup to create the default backup schedule so the backup vault has been successfully created and I will create an initial recovery point for that go to the virtual machines and select the backup here we can see the backup vault details if anything uh, any backups are done previously we can see, uh, see the restore points here we haven't done any so we'll create a new backup for this Linux VM click on backup now and we have to choose the return backup till and then click on backup this will trigger the backup for the Linux virtual machine first backup will take approximately 20 minutes so we'll wait until the process is done and uh, here we can see the backup has been successfully completed and we can see the restore points are showing now now we'll delete a few files from this Linux virtual machine and try to restore these files from this backup For that, log into this VM. Choose connect and copy the SSH command. Open it in Cloud Shell. Uh, enter the password. Now we'll delete the web server uh, starting page here. run the command cd var www html cd sorry ls lia I'm going to delete the following file here file will be loaded as a starting web page for nginx web server sudo rm and then the file name and press enter ok 
Okay, so that's successfully removed the web starting page. And now we'll test this web server. Copy the IP address of this virtual machine into a new tab. All right, so we can see there's a problem on the page there, 403 forbidden page. So um, this is because we removed the start and index file and so we can't see the starting page. Now we'll restore this file from the backup. Go to virtual machine and select the backups. I then select file recovery here. Here we have to choose the recent backup for this virtual machine. I've selected the recent backup here. After that we have to uh, download the script. We can search for the files which have been removed uh, from this script here. So I click on download script. We'll, uh, this file will download to the local computer. Here we can see the download is um, successfully completed. And to open up this script we just have to use this password here. Now which we can copy. After uh, this, you copy the downloaded script to the virtual machine. Uh, for that, we just need the IP address. After that, open up the WinSCP software and select the host name here. I'll give the username as Callium P. and then click um, login. Click yes to proceed further. Okay, the Linux backup session has been copied here. Drag the file over there. Okay, to proceed further. This will copy the downloaded script to the virtual machine. After that, close this uh, Win SCP software. Log into the virtual machine and copy the SSH command here. Now click Cloud Shell and run that SSH command. After that, press Enter and type the password. and run the command ls l a i and we can see the linux vm back um, backup has downloaded the script and successfully been copied now we have to give permission to that uh, downloaded script and run the command gmod plus x and then the file name After that, press enter. So we've successfully changed the uh, permission for this downloaded script. After that, run the command Linux VM underscore backup dot sh. By running this command, this script will be executed and uh, mount a backup directory on this virtual machine. After that, press enter.
here we have to enter the password which we copied earlier and press enter we can see the connection has been succeed uh, has succeeded and it will attach the backup directory here press Q to exit and then run the command ls lai and you can see the directory um, Linux VM here this is the backup folder where Linux VM backup.sh script has been created after that we have to change the permission for this directory you run the command sudo chmod triple seven and then the uh, directory name after that press enter and we've successfully changed the permission uh, run the command ls lai and we can see that the permissions have changed after that cd to that directory and then run the command ls lai volume 1 we can see the backup files for that cd to volume 1 LSLAI again. These are all the files that are backed up. Uh, we need to uh, restore the Nginx file. For that, run the command cd var www html. So we successfully went to the directory HTML. Now run the command PWD and currently we're in the directory shown. Run the ls lai and we can see the nginx file which has been backed up earlier. Now we'll restore this file to the original location on this uh, Linux VM. For that run the command sudo cp file name and then target location where this file is to be restored. Target path is var www.html. After that press enter so this file has been successfully restored now we we'll go to the target directory var www html and after that run the command ls lai here we can see the file has been successfully restored now we'll test whether this web server is working fine or not or correctly or not for that, copy the IP address of this virtual machine and open it in a new tab. Refresh the page. Okay, Nginx is uh, showing and um, the web server is loaded correctly. So this is how we do a backup and restore for Linux VMs. Now I'll delete this VM which is no longer required uh, click on delete and then yes to proceed further you see the VM has been successfully removed now I'll delete the backup which was created for this Linux VM 
for that uh, go to more services and search for a backup we have to choose the recovery services uh, vaults here we can get more information about the backup vault here here we can see the overview of the backup vault the resource group status backup items location and replicated items we can also see the monitoring of this backup vault backup pre-check status backup alerts site recovery health Uh, also backup items, backup storage, backup jobs and site recovery related information. Um, here we can see the Azure virtual machine and the backup item count. Uh, the backup count is 1. Just select this Azure Virtual Machine and here we can see the backup which has been created for this Linux Virtual Machine. Click here to see all the options regarding this backup. If you want to take a backup, a new backup, click up um, Backup Now. Uh, you can restore a VM from this backup here. File recovery, click here. Stop the backup for any particular reason you want. Click here. Now we'll see how to recover files from this backup. Alright, just click on file recovery. Uh, here we have to download the script that's used to recover the files for the backup session. Uh, we already did this earlier, so I'm not going to take uh, go through this step again. So I'll close this out. Uh, if we want to restore the Linux virtual machine from this backup, just click on Restore VM. After that, select the backup time, which we want to restore the VM. Select here, and then select OK. And here we can see two options for restore type. They are create virtual machine and restore disks. Now I'll select create um, new virtual machine. I'll specify the Linux VM uh, machine name as Linux VM2. Specify the resource group name and the virtual network. After that, we'll keep the subnet as default. And I will select the staging location here. After that, click OK to create a new virtual machine from the backup with the same configuration. Uh, if we want to create a new virtual machine with a different configuration, we have to use the PowerShell commandlets. Uh, we're not going to use that one. So I'll create a new virtual machine with the same configuration as the old one from this backup. After that, click OK to proceed further. And click Restore to restore the virtual machine from this backup. So this will create a new virtual machine. Click Restore to proceed further. Now we'll see the progress of the restoration. Click on the backup vault 
go down to jobs click on backup jobs and here we can see the Linux VM restore is currently in progress It may take uh, some time to complete this process. If you want to export this job, we can export from here as well. Click refresh until the completion of the restoration job. This Linux VM restore job will store the data temporarily in a storage account. We can see the data in the storage accounts. Previously we have given the KPSIS storage account for staging and here we can see the data. After that click on blobs to proceed further and this is a file which has been restored from the Linux backup. This file will help us to create a new Linux VM. It will automatically create a Linux VM. Uh, we we'll just have to wait for a little bit of time. Here we can see that the Linux virtual machine has been successfully restored from the backup. Previously we've installed a web server on a Linux machine. Now we'll test whether the web server is working correctly or not. On this new Linux virtual machine, which has been restored uh, on the back, uh, from the backup. So welcome to Nginx. We can see the Nginx server software is there and we've successfully restored the Linux from the backup. If you want to restore at disk level, select the backup file which we want to restore and after that click on OK. Here we have to select the restore type. If you want uh, to restore only the disk we have to select restore disks. After that we have to select the staging location. Uh, click OK. This will create a new disk with the backup information of the Linux VM. After that click restore to create a new disk with the backup information of the Linux VM. You can see Linux VM3 has been successfully created. Now we'll create a Linux uh, a virtual machine from the disk. Click on Linux VM3. Create VM. You can see all the information here listed. Create, uh, click on Create VM to create a new virtual machine from this disk. I'll give the virtual machine name as Linux VM3. Select the existing resource group, RGP Linux, etc. After that, click OK to proceed. VM as A0 Basic. Select. Keep the default settings, change monitoring to uh, disabled. Click OK to proceed. Here we can see the summary of the virtual machine. And we can see the virtual machine has been created from a private disk. After that click on OK to proceed. The new virtual machine deployment is currently in progress. You see the status in the VMs tab.
it's running at the moment okay so we've done backup and restore for Linux virtual machines in this lesson thanks for watching In this lesson we're going to discuss the backup and restore for the Windows virtual machines. So we'll create a new virtual machine here under virtual machines. We'll select Windows Server um, 2016 data center version will do us. And then click on create. Let's do this quickly because we've done it before quite a few times. Call this WinVM. I'll select the VM disk type as HDD and the username and password. I'll use the existing resource group that we've had configured earlier, RG Linux VM. I'll select the location of South India, that's for convenience of where we film the videos and then click OK to proceed. The size, we'll scroll down. I'll do A2 uh, basic and click select keep all the default settings and you can change monitoring down here to disabled and click OK to proceed. So here's the summary of what we've uh, the options we've chosen. If you're happy with that click on create. This will create a new Windows virtual machine. Uh, what we want to do now is create a web server for this machine take a backup and then we'll try and restore a few files that uh, we'll remove so we'd have to use the backup files all right so virtual machines tab virtual machine is creating and now it's created and it's running let's connect to this uh, Windows virtual machine click here and then we'll go over to connect at the top we'll click on uh, connect on the remote desktop connection prompt that will appear enter the username and password click yes to proceed further and here we can see that Windows Server is loading click yes here OK, so we need to install the Windows Web Server. We'll open up a PowerShell prompt here. Uh, run the command install Windows feature. Name Web Server. Include management tools. And then press Enter. This will install the Web Server on this Windows Virtual Machine.
Here we can see that the web server has been successfully installed. Now we'll go back over to the Azure portal. We have to open up port 80. For that click on virtual machine and then select networking. And then select add inbound rule. HTTP, click on advanced and then select the protocol as any. After that click OK to proceed further. This will create a new security rule for port 80. And we can see the new rule has been successfully created. After that we'll check whether the web server for this Windows server is working. Copy the public IP address of this virtual machine. And open it in a tab, a browser tab. You can see the web server software for the virtual machine is working correctly. Now we'll take a backup of this Windows VM. Go to the VM and select the backup here. Just scroll down. Uh, select the existing backup vault. We created this in an earlier lesson. And then we'll have to choose the default policy. If you want to change the policy, you can change it here. If you want to create a new policy, do so up here. If you want to use a daily policy, we can select here. After that, click OK. After that, we can click on Enable Backup. This will create a new schedule for the backup of this virtual machine. Here we can see that the backup schedule has been successfully created. If you want to take a backup now, just click on Backup Now. Here we can choose to retain the backup time and then click Backup. This will create a new backup for this Windows VM. It may take some time to create the new backup. Here we can see the backup process has successfully completed. Now what we need to do is go back to our Windows machine and delete a few files that will uh, enable us to um, check to see the backup worked. We'll click on File Explorer. This PC and go to iNet Pub. Go on the C drive, www root, and we'll delete the IS start file. Alright, so we've successfully, successfully deleted this file and now we'll test the web server. So back over to the Azure portal. Copy the public IP address of this virtual machine and open it in a new tab. And you can see the image is not loading. So what we need to do is run our backup. Back to the Azure portal. And then go to the backup. Click on file recovery here. We have to download this file. Download executable.
After that it will generate a password for the downloaded file. Take a copy of this password to use while restoring the files. After that we have to log into the Windows Server. Click Yes to connect to the Windows Virtual Machine and we're loading the Virtual Machine here at the moment. For this RDP session we've connected the local computer drives to the Windows VM. Now we can see the local computer drives on the RDP session. So go to File Explorer, click on this PC. Here we'll see additional drives which have been shared because of the software we downloaded. Now I'll copy the downloaded file from the local computer to the remote desktop. Just drag it over and it's been successfully copied. After copying the file just double click and it will open the PowerShell script. After that we have to enter the password which we created earlier. After that press enter. It will connect to the backup directory and then mount that backup directory here. It will attach the backup volumes to this window server. Alright, the backup, uh, the backup volume has been successfully mounted here. Now go to File Explorer and check whether the new drive has been created or not. Alright, you can see the new drive. We'll go to the INET pub and select www root. You see the IIS start file is present. Now copy this file and open up the file explorer. This PC, C drive, back to the folder. WWW root and all we need to do is paste it in here and that's successfully restored a file from the uh, backup. Now we'll test whether the web server uh, can load properly. Just refresh the page if you've left it open and you can see the page is loading correctly. Alright, so this is the uh, backup and restore for Windows Virtual Machines. Uh, after that we have to unmount the disk. Press Q to exit from this prompt. After that we have to go to the Azure portal and unmount the backup volume. Uh, here we have to go to Backup and select File Recovery and then select Unmount Disks. This will unmount the disk from the virtual machine. And here we can see the unmount is successful. Now we'll go to the virtual machines and check whether it's been successfully unmounted or not. So go to the File Explorer and click on this PC. Here we can see the F drive has been successfully unmounted. And we'll see how to remove backups. 
click on more services and search for backup after that go to recovery services vaults and select backup vault uh, here we have to go to the backup items and select the Azure virt uh, virtual terminal Here we can see uh, the two backups for both Linux and Windows virtual machines. Some of these are from earlier um, labs we did, obviously. So we we'll click here and select Stop Backup. And we have to specify the reason. Here we can see the backup will be stopped but the data will be available until the retention period. Now if we want to choose a reason we can select here and then click stop backup. I'll do the same for a Windows VM backup. Click on stop backup After that I will delete this backup data. For that click on delete backup data. After that type the name of the backup item. Click on delete. After that I will delete the Windows VM backup as well. For that click here and select delete backup data. Enter the name WinVM. After that, click Delete. It may take some time to delete this backup data. Uh, and here we can see both data backups are uh, deleted. Now we'll delete the resource group which we created earlier. This will also delete the virtual machines and data disks that are associated with this resource group. Now for that click here and select delete resource group. Type the resource group name which is RG Linwin VM and click delete to continue. OK, so you can see the resource group has been successfully removed. So that's all we need to cover in respect of the uh, Windows backups. Thanks for watching. I'll see you on the next presentation. In this lesson we'll discuss how to deploy a virtual machine from a template. Quite a lot of information to go through here so you might want to take a few breaks in, in between. We'll go to our usual place to create virtual machines. We'll select a Windows Server and a 2016 data center and then create. We'll give the virtual machine the name WinVM. Disk type HDD. We'll choose a username and a password. And then retype it. Uh, 
and we'll create a new resource group here. For that we'll give it the name rgwin vm. Select the location and then OK to proceed further. We'll choose a disk size here, uh, A2 basic will do us. Select here to proceed we further. We have to choose the unmanaged disk. And yeah, we'll Further have uh, an unmanaged here no disk. storage account. So click no. Here we have already created a storage account. So Next, come to the storage, storage account, account which we've here. already created. PKA storage. PKA storage. After that, We're I will keep um, all the default settings. Other parts earlier on in earlier videos. So we're building on this. You can see a summary. If you're happy with the information, click on create. If you need to skip back to earlier videos, if for some reason you've got a blank configuration, then please do so. It's just no, not much point in repeating um, some of the stuff. So go to uh, Virtual Machines. We can see the Windows Virtual Machine is creating. And now it's created. We'll now log into this virtual machine. So click on the three dots and then hit connect. It will download a file which you can open when it's downloaded and click on connect and get, um, add the username and the password. Click yes to proceed further. It will download the new virtual machine. We'll click on yes. Close the air uh, wizard, we won't be needing it. And you can see the Windows virtual machine is loading now. We'll install the web server on this virtual machine. So we'll do this via the PowerShell. Uh, run the command install Windows feature name web server. You can see that here. And that will install the web server on this virtual machine. It's been successfully installed. Now we'll test whether this web server is working correctly for the virtual machine. To do that, go over to the Azure portal, copy the public IP address and paste it into a browser tab. And we can see that the web server software is working on our virtual machine. Now we'll create a template for this virtual machine. For that, go to the uh, Windows virtual machine. We have to uh, open port 80, so we'll go to networking. And here we'll click on add inbound rule or add inbound. And we'll click on HTTP and we'll specify the protocol as any and then OK to proceed further. We can see that port 80 has been successfully created and we'll test web, the web server for this virtual machine. For that click on virtual machine and copy the public IP address of this of the virtual machine. To create a template first we have to generalize Close the uh, window, open up a command prompt.
uh, run the command prompt as an administrator. I run the command cd windir system32 and then the directory name. Here the directory name is sysprep. Press enter. It'll open a new tool called the System Preparation Tool. This will uh, help us to make this virtual machine uh, generalize. We've got two options here. If you want the virtual machine in uh, audit mode, we can select this. If you want system out of box experience, we can select this. I'll select the first option and after that I'll select shutdown option as shutdown. Uh, this will generalize the virtual machine and shut the uh, virtual machine down. After that click OK. System prep tool will take some time to create the generalization. All right, we can see the VM generalization has completed and the server's been shut down. After that, we go back over to the Azure portal. Go to the virtual machines and here we can see the virtual machine has been stopped. Now we'll deallocate this virtual machine by selecting stop here. This will also deallocate this virtual machine. Click yes to proceed further. After some time we can see the virtual machine is in stopped uh, deallocated status. Currently deallocating. Uh, here we can see it's both stopped and deallocated. Now we'll go to the PowerShell and create a template for this virtual machine. For that click on the PowerShell, click on restart and we can see the PowerShell has now loaded. After that we have to set the status of this VM as generalized. Run the command set to Azure RMVM, resource group name, virtual machine name, and then generalized. After that, press enter. Here we can see the command has been executed. Now we'll check the status of this virtual machine. Run the command vm get us all rmvm resource group name virtual machine name uh, status. Uh, if we want detailed status of the virtual machine, we have to run the command vm dot statuses. And after that, press enter. Here we can see that the virtual machine status is generalized and the power state of this virtual machine is deallocated. We've successfully generalized the Windows VM. Now we'll create a template for this generalized VM. For that command run get dash help. After that run the command get dash cloud drive. 
This will provide you with information about the cloud drive. And then you can press enter. Here we can see the file share name, file share path from where the cloud shell has been shared. We can see the mount point. Uh, I'll copy this mount point here to use in the command. Now I'll run the command for um, how to save the Azure image for which we've actually created. I'll save Azure RM VM image, resource group name, virtual machine name and destination container name. VHD name prefix path and then mount point path. And then we paste the um, line that we copied. This command will save the Azure RM image and then create the JSON file. This file will be used to create the template further along. Then we press enter. We can see the command has successfully executed. Now we'll check whether the JSON file and the VHD files are created uh, correctly. For that open the storage accounts and select PKA storage which you've used to create the VHD files. All these files will be saved under blobs. Just click blobs and we can just see the system and click on it and here we can see Microsoft Compute. Open up the Microsoft Compute Images, PKA Storage and here we can see the template files that we created. And now we'll check whether the JSON file has been created or not. Go to the storage account of the cloud shell and click on storage accounts. This is the cloud shell account, account. just click on that to see the details of the files and click the files tab. Then select cloud shell and we can see that WinServer JSON file has been successfully created. We'll now download this file and create a new template using the JSON file. Alright, click on download. Uh, this is the downloaded JSON file. Here we can see the details regarding this file. We've used the default value as basic A2 for this Linux virtual machine. And we can see a few more details here. This is the URL from which the image can be grabbed. Alright, so that's just a few details from the JSON file. Now we'll use this uh, file to create a template. For that, go to the Azure portal. Click on more services and search for templates. Here select templates. Click on create templates here. Here I'll specify the name as WinVM template. After that I'll give the description as Windows Web Server. Uh, 
and after that click OK. Then we can uh, we have to add to the template here. Previously we opened the JSON file, just copy this file, open it and copy all the content here. And we have to paste it in the template. First delete all the lines here and paste the copied content from the JSON file. If you want to change any parameters you can do so here. If you want to change the, change the size of the VM we can do so here. After that click on OK to proceed further. This will create a template. After that click OK. It's been validating and successfully created now. Now click on add. The new templates will be created here. Just refresh here and now we can see that the new template has been created. And now we'll see a few options for this Windows template. Here are the here are some options for the uh, Windows. We can deploy, edit, uh, delete, or share here. If we want to edit any changes, we can do so here. After making changes we have to click save. We're not uh, doing any changes at the moment so we can come out of this. And the same way if you want to delete the template you can do so here. If you want to share then click on the bottom um, option. Now we'll see how to deploy a virtual machine from this template. Select the deploy option here. This is the custom deployment tab. If you want to edit this template we can edit here. This is the edit parameters. Uh, option. After that we have to fill these fields. But given all the details only we can create a new virtual machine from the template. We have to select the subscription here and after that we have to specify the resource group. Here I use the existing resource group and we have to specify the VM name. I'll choose WinVM2. And the size is basic A2. Admin username, I'll call it VM Admin. Type the password. Uh, we have to give the network interface ID. For that go to the more services and click on network interfaces. You can type it in the top. Here we have to create a new network interface so click add. We have to give the interface a name. I'll specify the interface name as WinVM2 and I'll keep all the default settings. After that I'll select Use Existing Resource Group, i.e. RGWinVM. 
click on create after that here I'll choose the virtual network as RG win VM dash net I'll keep all the default settings click proceed uh, create to proceed further and we can see the new interface has been successfully created now we'll see more details about this network interface click here we can see options to pin to dashboard or delete obviously you press the bottom one if you want to delete it if you want to see more information just click on the network interface here we can see the information Now we have to attach this Win VM2. For that, we have to get the resource ID for this network interface. Click on Properties and copy the resource ID here. And paste it into the network uh, interface ID from where we're deploying the new virtual machine. There's a checkbox to uh, agree to the terms and conditions. And after that, click on purchase. This will deploy a new virtual machine with the name WinVM2. Click on purchase to proceed further. Here we can see that the deployment has been started and we can see the status of the new virtual machine deployment in the virtual machines tab. We can see that the new virtual machine WinVM2 has been creating, or is creating, and we can see it's successfully deployed and the status is running. So the VM has been deployed from the templates where the web server was installed. Now we'll test whether this web server um, on the virtual machine is working. Get the public IP address. Uh, we can see there's no public IP address created for this virtual machine. So we have to create one. Click on networking. Click on network interface. And here we have to go to the IP configurations. Just click here. We can see the public IP address and now select enabled. After that, click on IP address configuration settings. And now we'll create a new public IP. For that, click on create new. Here I'll specify the name as WinVM2. After that, I'll select assignment as dynamic. Click OK. and click on save settings this will create a new public IP address attached to that interface just refresh the page and you can see the uh, public IP address has been successfully added check whether the address is been created or not here Go down to uh, Overview, Public IP Address, Copy. I will check whether the web server is working for this machine. Copy the Public IP Address, paste it into a new tab. And you can see where the web server has successfully loaded. Uh, this way we can deploy virtual machines from the template. 
Uh, now we'll see how to deploy the virtual machines from the uh, GitHub. Go to the GitHub website. We went to one of the earlier lectures and we can see Azure Quick Start Templates. Select any of the templates and we can deploy uh, that template here. You can see the descriptions as you scroll down this column. Here I'll use the LAMP template. This template will automatically install Linux, uh, Apache, MySQL and PHP. If you want to use this template, just click on this template. Here we can see the brief information of this deployment. This template uses the Azure Linux custom script extension to deploy a LAMP application on Ubuntu. It creates a, an Ubuntu VM. I'll deploy this template. Uh, for that click on deploy to Azure. It will be opened in the Azure portal. and we can deploy the virtual machine using the template here. After specifying all the details, click on purchase and this will create a new LAMP server in the Azure portal. This way we can deploy new virtual machines using the GitHub templates as well. We can use any of the template to deploy virtual machines. So you've got a couple of choices there as they're demonstrated. I'll delete the resources now that we created. Go to the resource group and delete the resource group name. Click on delete resource group. This will clean up all the resources. Click on delete and here we can see that the resource group has been successfully removed. Alright so we've seen a couple of options in this video. Thanks for watching, I'll see you on the next lesson. In this lesson we'll discuss how to create VM image. First we have to create a virtual machine. All we do is hit on create virtual machines under virtual machine tab. We'll select the Ubuntu server. 16.04 After that click on create Here we have to specify the name of the virtual machine I'll call it Linux VM As usual I'll just select HDD You can change all these users and all these settings as you Repeat the labs a few times over. Calium P. Uh, we'll uh, enter the password and then confirm it. We'll create a new resource group. Specify 
a new resource group name RGP Linux VM after that select the location and click on OK to proceed further we have to choose the VM size here here I'll choose the VM size as, size as A0 basic after that click select to proceed further I'll keep all the default settings apart from monitoring which we'll disable and then OK to proceed read through the summary if you're happy click on create and here we can see the virtual machine status is creating the uh, machine has been created now and you can see the status is shown as running so what we need to do next is connect so click on the three dots grab the SSH credentials go to the cloud shell paste in the credentials type yes drop in the password and we've successfully logged into the Linux virtual machine now we'll install Nginx on this virtual machine after that we'll create an image from this virtual machine for that first we have to um, to update the package packages the command sudo apt get dash y and then update this will update the packages for this Linux virtual machine and here we can see the package list has successfully updated after that we'll install nginx here we run the command sudo apt get dash y install nginx alright package has installed you can see the nginx package has successfully installed uh, after that we need to open port 80 for this virtual machine so you can click on the virtual machine and then networking and we'll need to add an inbound rule click on add inbound and we have to specify HTTP click on advanced settings and select the protocol as any then click OK to proceed further this will create a port 80 rule and there you can see the rule has been created now we'll test whether the web server is working correctly or not for this virtual machine copy we need to copy the public IP address which is shown under overview so we've copied that we'll go to a browser window and the web server for the v VMs working fine now we'll create an image for this virtual machine go to the Azure portal and we'll create an image so we'll click on the virtual machine uh, select the overview click on capture this will uh, this will create an image of the VM We'll open a window stating that before creating an image run this command to prepare the Linux virtual machine if we didn't run this command the VM uh, which we created uh, from the image won't actually start now we'll have to run this command on the Linux vir uh, virtual machine to deprovision the VM so we'll go over to the cloud shell now uh, run the command sudo waagent 
deprovision and user. This command will deprovision a virtual machine with users. This means that if we want to share this Linux virtual machine with anyone, the user details and the sensitive information will be deleted on this virtual machine. If we want to share the VM image with the user, um, there's no need to add the plus user in the command. If I want to share this VM with the uh, users which I've created on this uh, virtual, I want, sorry, I want to share. So then there's no need for the plus user here. I'll delete it in the command. It helps in sharing this Linux virtual machine image with the users which uh, have been created on this uh, virtual machine. Press enter to proceed and press Y to proceed further. The command has been executed successfully. After that type exit to come out of this VM. Go to the Azure portal and we've successfully run the command. We have to uh, get the image name. I'll specify the image name as Linux VM Im image. And we have to use the same resource group where the um, VM has been created. So RGP Linux VM. We can see the statement before creating the image the VM will be deallocated automatically. It means while capturing the image the virtual machine will be deallocated. If you want to delete uh, this VM after creating the image we can select uh, the box but we're not going to select that for now. Then click on create to proceed further. Here we can see that the VM is stopped and now the VM image has been successfully created. We'll go to the resource groups and check whether that image is there or not. Click on RGP Linux VM and we can see the Linux VM image has been successfully created. We can create a new um, VM from this Linux VM image. Uh, we'll see a few more options as well for the VM image. If you want to use this VM to any other resource group, we can do so by clicking here or to another subscription. If you want to delete it, we can do so here. Now we'll see how to create a, a virtual machine from this VM image. For that, click on Create VM. Specify the um, name as uh, VM2. Uh, select the VM disk type as HDD. Username, I'll choose VM admin and then enter a password. And then retype the password. Here we will select the existing resource group, i.e. RGP Linux VM. And here we can see the location is blurred out. After that, click OK to proceed further. Here we have to choose the VM size. Here I'll choose the VM size as A0 Basic. After that, click, uh, click Select to proceed further. I keep all the default settings and select monitoring as disabled. After that click OK to proceed further. Here we can see the summary of the VM 
uh, that we've created from the Linux VM image. We can see the private image is the Linux VM image. So click OK to proceed further. Status of the virtual machine in the virtual machine tab is visible. Uh, it's in creating state at the moment. Now we can see the Linux VM2 has been successfully created and is running. This Linux VM2 has been created from the VM image where the, where the uh, web server has been installed. So the web server should work properly on this Linux VM2 also. Now we'll test whether the web server is working correctly or not for this Linux VM2. I will have to open port 80 the same way as before under networking and adding an inbound rule. Select the HTTP service and click on advanced settings. Protocol is any. Click OK. And you'll see the new security rule there. Now we'll go to Overview for the VM. Copy the public IP address of this virtual machine and open it in a new tab. We see that the web server is working. Uh, there's no need to install it again on this virtual machine because it's already uh, working perfectly. So this is how we capture images from the virtual machine and we can create new virtual machines from the created images. Now we'll delete this Linux VM because it's no longer required the uh, original one at the top. Slick, uh, select delete and yes to proceed further. And it's been removed. Now we'll see how to download the Linux virtual hard disk, the VHD, from Azure and how to make use of that. First we have to generalize the Linux VM. Web server has already been installed as we know on Linux VM2 and it's working fine. Now we will generalize this Linux virtual machine 2 and we'll see how to download a VHD for this Linux VM. Click on connect and copy the SSH command. Open up the cloud shell and run the command SSH VM admin and then the IP address of the VM. We'll click yes to proceed and then enter the password. We've successfully logged into the Linux VM2 here. Uh, we have to deprovision this virtual machine. Run the command sudo wa agent deprovision plus user force. So we're going to deprovision this virtual machine with users. If we use force in the command it will ask for a it will not ask for the yes or no question. Press enter to proceed further. So the command has been successfully executed. We'll quit from this VM. And now we have to stop and deallocate the Linux virtual machine number two. 
and we run the command az vm deallocate resource group name and virtual machine name. After that press enter. It will take some time to stop and deallocate. Alright, we can see the command is executed. We'll now see whether it's been executed or not successfully in the GUI. Alright, and you can see under this data there what's happened. We'll now down download the OS disk from this virtual machine. Click on the machine name and go to disks. This is the OS disk we have to download. So just click on the disk. And then we can see the export option here. Here we will export this operating system disk. For that click on export. And we have to specify the seconds that the URL expires in and then click on Generate URL. Here we can see that URL has been successfully generated. So we'll copy it and open it in a new tab. It will download the operating system VHD file. Download has been started and it may take a little bit of time to complete. After the completion of the download, we have to upload that VHD file to our storage accounts. Go to the storage accounts and select the storage account. Click on blobs. And we have to upload the file under VHDS. Upload that file here. And here we have successfully uploaded the VHD file that we downloaded. After that we'll create a disk from this VHD file. Click on more services. We'll search for disks here and when it appears we can click on disks. Click on add here. We have to specify the name of the disks. I'll specify the name as Linux VM3. And after that we'll use the existing resource group, i.e. RGP Linux VM. Select the account type as standard HDD. Select the source type as blob storage. Storage blob. I'll uh, browse for the source blob, then go to the storage account, select VHDS, then select mydisk.vhd here, then click select. Next we have to choose the OS type. This is the Linux virtual disk, so I'll have to select Linux here. I'll give the disk size 31 gig. And after that click on create. This will create a new disk for the my disk VHD which we uploaded in the storage container. After that click on create. So a new disk will be created in a few minutes. Here we can see that the uh, Linux VM3 disk has been successfully created.
Now we'll create a virtual machine from this disk. For that, click on uh, that disk. And here we can see the option to create disk. If we want to change the type of this disk, then we can change here. I'm not going to change it for now. After that, we'll create a new virtual machine from this disk. Just click on create VM. And here we have to give the virtual machine name. I'll specify it as Linux VM3. After that, I will use the existing resource group, i.e. RGP Linux VM, and then OK to proceed further. Here we choose the VM size. I'll select the VM size as A0 Basic. After that, click Select to proceed further. Keep all the default settings and I will change monitoring as disabled. Click on OK to proceed further. And we can see the summary of that virtual machine. We can see the virtual machine is created from the private disk Linux VM3. After that, click on OK to proceed further. This will deploy a new virtual machine, Linux VM3. Go to the Virtual Machine tab, and we can see the Linux Virtual Machine 3 has been created and is currently running. VM3 has the web server that's already installed from the disk that we created earlier. Therefore, the web server should work on this uh, VM3. All right, we'll test the web server. Go to network settings and open port 80. Click on add inbound service type HTTP and after that click on advanced settings protocol type is any and then click on OK we see the rule has been created we'll test whether the web server is working or not get the public IP address which we'll copy under the overview tab. I will just need to paste it into a browser window and you can see the web server is working correctly there. So this is how we download and upload VHD files. I'll now delete the resource group which we've created for this VM. For that, go to the resource group and click on the resource group name. After that, click on delete resource group. This will delete the resource groups, images, disks and virtual machines which we created. After that, click on Delete to proceed further. It may take some time. And you can see the resource group has been removed. So that's all we need to do for this particular module. Thanks for watching. I'll see you on the next lesson.
In this lesson we're going to discuss availability sets. First we have to create an availability set. So we'll go to more services and we'll do a search in the search bar for availability sets. It'll pull up one option only, we should do. We can click on it and it takes us to availability sets where we can begin. Click on create availability sets here. We'll have to specify a name. I'll give it the name Linux uh, AS. After that select subscription and uh, next I'll create a new resource group. I'll give the resource group the name RG Linux VM. Location set there. Uh, there are two fault domains. Virtual machines in the same uh, fault domain will share the same power and physical network switch. We have to choose update domains. Virtual machines that exist in the same update domain will restart in the plan maintenance window. Azure will never restart virtual machines in two different update domains simultaneously. So it depends what uh, options you want. You can see that you can uh, set it up to five in the update um, domain slider bar. Next option is to use a managed disk and I'll select it as yes aligned. After that click on create. We'll use this availability set further to create new virtual machines. It'll take a few moments to create the availability set and you can see it's created here. If you want to see more details you can click on the name You can see more information here. If you want to move this availability set, you can move it to another resource group as well if you wish. And you can see what the available virtual machines are in this available set in the virtual machines tab. Now we're going to create the virtual machines for this availability set. Go to the Virtual Machines tab and here we'll create two new virtual machines for the availability set. So click on Create New Virtual Machines Ubuntu Server 16.04 and then click on Create We'll have Linux VM1 for our first machine. HDD Kalyan P. I'll set password and then confirm the same password. Subscription type. I'll use existing resource group, which we have created quite a few times. RG Linux VM location, and then proceed further. Choose the VM size. Scroll down to A0 basic, just here. Click on select to proceed further. You can choose the availability set here. 
And if you click on that, our created availability set should appear. And you can click on that one. After that, we'll keep the default settings. I'll change monitoring to disabled as usual and then OK to proceed. Here's the summary. If you're happy with that, you can click on create. So this will create a new VM in the availability set. We can see the status of the deployment of the VM in the Virtual Machines tab. Creating at the moment. And now it's running. If you want to see the details, just click here. Here we can see the availability set information. Just click on that. And you can see which availability set that the VM has been created in. Note that the availability set can only be configured while creating a virtual machine. You must recreate the virtual machine to move it in or out of an availability set. So you can close the wizard now. Now we need to create one more virtual machine. So we're going to go through uh, the same the same steps as before but we'll obviously change the name. So this new virtual machine will be created in a new fault domain. We'll update the domain. You can see the status of the VM in the virtual machines tab. It'll be creating for a moment and then move to a running state once it's created. There we go. So we've got VMs one and two Go to the availability set and have a look at how these uh, VMs have distributed. So select the availability set. You can see Linux VM1 is in fault domain 0, update domain 0. Uh, VM2 is running on fault domain 1 
and update domain one. So uh, in this way the availability set will distribute the VMs across different fault domains and update domains for higher availability. Now we'll see a few more options for this availability set. Uh, activity log is here. If you want to add any tags you can do so here. If you want to see the virtual machines that are related to this availability set we can actually click just here on this tab. These are all the VMs that are running on this availability set. After that if you want to see properties you click here. If you want to add any locks you can do so just here. So this is um, an overview of how we work with availability sets. We'll now delete the availability set and the VMs which we created. We won't be needing them for uh, the next lesson. So go to the resource group. Uh, we'll delete the resource group which we created for this lesson. You click on delete resource group. Now this will delete the availability set and also the VMs that we created. So click uh, delete resource group. Type the resource group name in the box and click on delete to proceed. And you can see the resource group, uh, resource group has been deleted. So that's the end of the lesson. Thanks for watching. I'll see you on the next one. In this lesson, we'll discuss networking. As all resources such as VMs, cloud services, VM scale sets, and Azure app service environments can communicate privately with each other through the Azure Virtual Network or VNet. A VNet is a logical isolation of the Azure cloud dedicated to your subscription. You can implement multiple VNets within each Azure subscription and Azure region. Each VNet is isolated from other VNets. You can connect VNets to each other, enabling resources connected to either VNet to communicate with each other across VNets. You can use either peering or VPN gateway or both to connect VNets to one another. Now we'll look at internet connectivity. All Azure resources connected to a VNet have outbound connectivity to the internet by default. The private IP address of, of the resource is source network address translated or SNAT to a public IP address 
by the Azure infrastructure. On-premises connectivity. You can access resources in your VNet securely over either a VPN connection or a direct private connection. To send network traffic between your Azure virtual network and your on-premises network, you must create a virtual network gateway. You configure settings for the gateway to create the type of connection you want, either VPN or Express Route. You can connect to your on-premises network to a VN net using any combination of the following options. Point to site, site to site, express route, a load balancing next. Azure provides multiple services for managing how network traffic is distributed and load balanced. DNS load balancing is an option, application load balancing, network load balancing. Now moving on to routing. Azure creates default route tables that enable resources connected to any subnet in any VNet to communicate with each other. You can implement either or both of the following types of routes to override the default routes that Azure creates. User defined, border gateway protocol, Now we'll look at a practical session of how we actually put this into action with Azure. First we'll see virtual networks. Now we'll see how to create the new uh, virtual network. Click on add. We have to specify the name of the virtual network here. I'll give it the name My VNet. After that, we have to specify an address space and a subscription. I'll use an existing resource group, AZ Resource Group, which you already know how to create. Then we select the location. We can see the subnet settings and we have to specify the name. If you want to change the name of the subnet, we can change it here. I'll give the name as my VNet dash subnet. After that, the address range. If you want to enable this, uh, virtual network for the service endpoints, we can enable it here. Uh, we won't do that for the purposes of this exercise. We'll click on create to proceed further. And we can see that the, view no um, the new virtual network has been successfully created. If you want to see the details, just click on the network you created. And here you can see the options available. This is the activity log after the overview. If you want to specify any tags, you can do so here. We're not going to create any tags at the moment. If you want to troubleshoot any issues, click on Diagnostics and it would 
uh, look to solve problems or help you solve problems. You can get a solution for most issues here. Now we'll look at a few more settings for the virtual network. If you want to see the address space for the virtual network, just click on address space and you can see it displayed here. If you want to see connected devices, click on connected devices. You can see the devices that would be connected here. Subnet details is next. Obviously this shows the subnet details. Next you can see DNS servers. If you want to add one you can do so here or edit the default settings. If you want to create peerings click here. This peering is nothing but we can combine um, into two, uh, two virtual networks into one. If you want to create peering just click on add peering. After that we have to give the name to the peering. I'll specify new peer as the name. After that if we have any networks in the classic model we can select here and we don't have any. So I'll use the uh, resource manager. If we know the resource ID of that virtual network we can select it here and enter that resource ID. I'm not going to use this option. Then we have to select the virtual network here and I will select the existing virtual network. Just click on virtual network and we can see the existing one that we can add peering. Here we can see the SI network which we can use for peering. Just click on SI network. After that we can select the configura uh, configuration settings here. Here I'll enable allow virtual network access. There are a few more options here. Allow forwarded traffic, allow gateway transit, use remote gateways. Uh, we're not going to choose this option. Just click OK to create a new peer. It may take some time for the peering to become uh, created. And we can see the new peer here. If we want to choose this option just click here and we can see all the peering details. If you want to delete this peer just click on delete. After that click yes to proceed further. And this way we can create and delete a peer in virtual networks. Now we can See that peer has been successfully removed. We'll go to service endpoints. If you want to add any service endpoints we can do so here. Just click on add. After that we have to select the service here. I'll select the uh, services Microsoft Storage and after that select the subnet. Here I'll select my VNet subnet and then click on add. And here we can see that the service endpoints are successfully added. If you want to configure virtual networks in the storage account we can click here. Now we'll see how to delete this service endpoint. Select the service endpoint that you want to delete click here and then click on the delete button. After that um, if you want to see the properties of this virtual network click on properties 
and here we can see the resource ID, resource group, subscription name and subscription ID. After that if we want to create locks for this virtual network we can do so here. If you want to create any automation scripts we can click and add here. If you want to see the diagram of this virtual network then you can click here. This is where you would see the diagram if we'd connected some devices together. Alright, now we'll have a look at how to delete this virtual network. Go to the virtual networks, click on here, select delete, click on yes, This will delete the virtual network which we created. Now we'll look at the application gateway. Click on more services and search for application gateway. Just click on application gateway and we can create one here. Click on create We can create a new application gateway here. As of now we're not going to create one. Next we'll see another network um, as a resource. Click on more services and search for DNS. Select DNS zones. If we want to add any DNS zones, we can create them here. Just click, uh, click on create DNS zones. After that, we have to specify the name for the DNS zone. After that, select the subscription. I'll select the existing resource group and then click on create. Now this way we can create DNS zones in Azure. And for now we're not going to create a new DNS zone here. Just click OK to proceed. And next is Traffic Manager Azure Service. Click on more services and search for Traffic Manager. Select Traffic Manager Profiles and we can create Traffic Manager Profiles here. This Traffic Manager Profile is to de de define the set used to distribute user traffic to service endpoints in different data centers. Just click on Create Traffic Manager Profile if you want to create one. We have to specify the name select the writing method and I'll select geographic select the subscription and then I'll use the existing resource group and then click on create this will create a new traffic manager in the Azure portal and we're not going to do that at the moment just click on close to discard the changes Next we'll see Express Routes. For that click on More Services and search for Express Routes. Select the Express Route Circuits. And if we want to create any Express Route Circuits, uh, click on the blue button. Here we can also import the Express Route circuit. To create a new one, we have to provide the circuit name, provider, peering location, bandwidth, SKU, and billing model. And then click on Create. We 
we won't be doing that at the moment. So we'll come out of that and we'll look at network watch services. Go to more services, search for network watcher. And you can see the details here. From the overview you can see the details of the Network Watcher. Next you'll see the monitoring settings for this Network Watcher. First click on Topology. We have to select the resource group here. Select the subscription and resource group here and after that select the virtual network. Here we can see that no network watcher is present in this subscription. And there's no network watcher for this virtual network. We'll look at connection monitor next. Currently this is in preview mode. If you want to create a new connection monitor then click on add here and we can create a connection monitor here. We have to give the name, virtual machine name, destination, virtual machine name and port. So this is how we create a connection monitor but we're not going to do so today. Uh, next is network diagnostic tools. If you want to see the IP flow the verify you can uh, do so here. Here you have to specify the resource group, network interface, packet details, local IP address, local port, remote IP address and remote port. After given all these details you'll be able to get the IP flow. After that we'll see the next hop Here we have to specify the resource group, virtual machine, network interface, source IP and destination IP address. After giving all these details, click next hop. After that, if we want to see the security group view, we can select here. Here we can see the inbound and outbound rules, subnet, network interface and default rules. If you want to see the VPN diagnostics we can select here and we can see the packet capture details. Here we can see the packet capture details, connection troubleshoot, uh, if we have any issues with the source and destination we can troubleshoot the connection here. And here we have to specify the source description, resource group, virtual machine and port. After that we have to specify the destination resource group, the virtual machine and port. After that we'll see the network subscription limit. Here we can see the subscription limit for our subscription and then option logs. Now you can see the um, NSG flow logs here and diagnostic logs. All right, there's a lot of services you can make use of and you can certainly create your own network and uh, check each option to see how it's affected and uh, look at the troubleshooting. But uh, this was an overview and enough just to get you um, up to exam level. Thanks for listening.
In this lesson we'll discuss virtual machine scale sets. Just talk about a bit of the theory first behind them. Virtual machine, virtual machine scale sets are Azure compute resource that you can use to deploy and manage a set of identical virtual machines. With all VMs configured the same, scale sets are designed to support true auto scale and no pre-provisioning of VMs is required. So it's easier to build large scale services that target big compute, big data and containerized workloads. For applications that need to scale compute resources out and in, scale operations are implicitly balanced across fault and update domains. Now over to auto scale. To maintain consistent application performance you can automatically increase or decrease the number of VM instances in your scale set. This auto scale ability reduces the management overhead to monitor and tune your scale set as customer demands change over time. You define rules based on performance metrics, application response or a fixed schedule and your scale set auto, auto scales as needed. For basic auto scale rules, you can use host based performance metrics such as CPU usage or disk I.O. These host based metrics are available out of the box with no additional agents or extensions to install and configure. Now we'll see the practical session of the virtual machine skill sets. Alright, so first we have to create a VM image. We'll create a new virtual machine. After creating the VM, we'll install a web server on the virtual machine. I'll create a custom image from that Linux virtual machine. Click Create to create a new VM. Select Ubuntu server and then the server version. After that click on create. After that we'll have to specify the name. I'll just use Linux VM here and select the this type as HDD. After that give the username as Kalyan P. Password and confirm password. I'll create a new resource group, specify the name as RG Linux VM. After that click on OK to proceed further. Here I'll choose the VM side as A0 Basic. After that click on Select. Here I'll keep all the default settings and I'll change the monitoring as disabled. After that click OK to proceed further. We can see the summary of that virtual machine. Click on create to proceed. And this will deploy a new virtual machine. Here we can see the machine is creating. It may take some time. And we can see the machine has been created and the status is running. So we'll now connect to the VM, copy the SSH details there, and 
we'll reconnect our uh, bash session here paste in the SSH and click on yes and then the password alright so we can install the web server here from the command line if we so wish we'll just update the packages which we've done quite a few times in different videos here we can see the packages are successfully updated after that we have to run the command sudo apt-get minus y install nginx this will install nginx web server on this VM and then press enter alright so you can see the nginx web server has been successfully installed we'll need to open up port 80 through Azure so we'll click on the VM and then go to networking and then click on add inbound rule select services HTTP and then click OK to proceed further you see port 80 rule has been created now we'll test the web server for this virtual machine copy the public IP address of this virtual machine and paste it in a new tab and you can see the web page has successfully loaded for the web server go to the Azure portal create an image for this VM to create a virtual image first we have to generalize this virtual uh, this Linux VM we'll go to the uh, command line and run the command sudo wa agent deprovision and press enter this command will deprovision the virtual machine press enter to proceed and then press Y after that type exit to exit from here and go to the Azure portal to stop this VM click on Y and then it will deallocate this virtual machine and you can see it's been deallocated we have to mark this Linux virtual machine as generalized run the command az vm generalized resource group name and then vm name so we have marked that virtual machine as generalized after that we'll create an image for this Linux VM go to the virtual machine and click on capture and here we have to add the image name I'll specify it as Linux VM image I use the existing resource group RG Linux VM and then click on create to proceed further right, the VM image has been created successfully to view it we have to go to all resources and you see the VM image has been successfully created here 
Now we'll use this Linux VM image to create virtual scale sets. Now we'll run a command to create virtual machine scale sets. Run the command dz vmss create. And then after that resource group name, scale set name, image vm image name. Upgrade policy, automatic instant count to, admin username and uh, gen generate SSH keys. After that you press enter. The command has been executed, it may take some time to create this virtual machine scale sets. This command will automatically create a load balancer for this virtual machine scale sets. Alright, we can see the command has been successfully executed. Now we'll check whether the VM scale sets have been created in the GUI. Go to Virtual Machine Scale Sets and you can see Linux scale set has been successfully created with two instances in the resource group RG Linux VM. Now we'll see more options for this Linux scale set. Just click on Linux scale set and here we can see an overview of the Linux scale set. And if you want to see the instances we can get to that uh, the instance details here. Here we can see two Linux virtual machines are running. After that we'll see scaling, we'll change the instant count and we can enable auto scaling here. Next we'll see storage, scale sets use the manage disk, operating system next. Here you can see the operating system. If you want to change the size of the Linux scale set we can do so here. Just select the new VM size and click on select. I'm not going to change the VM size at the moment. If you want to see the properties, uh, click on the property tab. After the creation of the virtual mach uh, machine scale sets, a load balancer will also be created. You can see it's been created for the virtual machine scale sets. Just click on that load balancer and then check the details here. On the right side you can see the summary of that load balancer. If you want to change any settings we can change them here. You can uh, ch change and edit the settings of the load balancer. Alright, so I think that's enough for um, for the moment. We'll be discussing a new topic in the next lecture, but thanks for watching.
In this lesson, we'll discuss different Azure database types. First one will be SQL databases. The Azure SQL database is a relational database as a service using Microsoft SQL Server Engine. SQL database is a high performance, reliable and secure database you can use to build data driven applications and websites in the programming language of your choice without needing to manage the underlying infrastructure. SQL database is a general purpose relational database service in Microsoft Azure that supports structures such as relational data, JSON, spatial and XML. It delivers dynamically scalable performance and provides options such as column store, indexes, indexes for extreme analytic and analysis and reporting and in-memory OLTP for extreme transactional processing. Microsoft handles all patching and updating of the SQL code base seamlessly and abstracts away all management of the underlying infrastructure. SQL Databases shares its code with the Microsoft SQL Server Database Engine. With Microsoft's cloud-first strategy, the newest capabilities of SQL Server are released first to the SQL database and then to SQL Server itself. This approach provides you with the newest SQL Server capabilities with no overhead for patching or upgrading and with the new features tested across millions of databases. SQL databases deliver predictable performance at multiple service levels that provides dynamic scalability with no downtime, built-in intelligent optimization, global scalability and availability, and advanced security options with near zero administration. Scalable performance and pools. With SQL database, each database is isolated from each other and portable, each with its own service tier with guaranteed performance level. SQL databases provides different performance levels for different needs and enables databases to be pooled to maximize the use of resources and save you money. Adjust performance and scale without downtime. SQL Database offers four service tiers to support lightweight to heavyweight database workloads. Basic, Standard, Premium and Premium RS. You can build your first app on a small single database at a low cost per month and then change its service tier manually or programmatically at any time to meet the needs of your solution. You can adjust performance without downtime to your app or to your customers. Dynamic scalability enables your database to transparently respond to rapidly changing resource requirements and enables you to only pay for the resources that you need when you need them. Elastic pools to maximize resource utilization. For many businesses and applications, being able to create single databases and dial performance up or down on demand is enough especially if usage patterns are relatively predictable. But if you have unpredictable usage patterns, 
He can make it hard to manage costs and your business model. Elastic pools are dissolved to solve this problem. The concept is simple. You allocate performance resources to a pool rather than an individual database and pay for the collective performance resources of the pool rather than for a single database performance. Next we'll see the Azure database for MySQL. Azure database for MySQL is a relational database service based on open source MySQL server engine. It's a fully managed database as a service offering capable of handling mission critical workload with predictable performance and dynamic scalability. Develop applications with Azure database for MySQL leveraging the open source tools and platform of your choice. Azure Database for MySQL is a relational database service in the Microsoft Cloud based on the MySQL Community Edition database engine. Azure Database for MySQL delivers built-in high availability with no additional cost, predictable performance including pay-as-you-go pricing, scale on the fly within seconds, secure to protect sensitive data at rest and in motion, automatic backups and point-in-time restore for up to 35 days, enterprise-grade security and compliance, or just performance and scale within seconds. Azure Database for MySQL service offers two service tiers, basic and standard. Each tier offers different performance capabilities to support lightweight to heavyweight database workloads. You can build your first app on a small database for a few dollars a month and then adjust the scale to meet your needs, the needs of your solution. Dynamic scalability enables your database to transparently respond to changing resource requirements. You only pay for the resources you need and only when you need them. Next we'll look at Azure database for PostgreSQL. Azure Database for PostgreSQL is a relational database service based upon the open source Postgres database engine. It's a fully managed database as a service offering capable of handling mission critical workloads with predictable performance, security and high availability and dynamic scalability. Develop applications with Azure Database for PostgreSQL leveraging the open source tools and platform of your choice. Azure Database for PostgreSQL is a relational database service in the Microsoft Cloud built for developers based on the community version of open source PostgreSQL database engine. Azure Database for PostgreSQL delivers built-in high, high availability with no additional cost, predictable performance using inclusive pay-as-you-go pricing, scale on the fly within seconds, secure to protect sensitive data at rest and in motion, automatic backups and point-in-time restore for up to 35 days enterprise grade security and compliance. 
All those capabilities require almost no administration and all are provided at no additional cost. These capabilities allow you to focus on rapid application development and accelerating your time to market rather than allocating precious time and resources to managing virtual machines and infrastructure. Now we'll look at Azure Cosmos Database. Azure Cosmos Database is a globally distributed database service designed to enable you to elastically and independently scale throughput and storage across any number of geographical regions with a comprehensive SLA. You can develop document, key, value or graph databases with Cosmos Database using a series of popular APIs and programming models. Azure Cosmos DB is Microsoft's globally distributed multi-model database. With the click of a button, Azure Cosmos DB enables you to elastically and independently scale throughput and storage across any number of Azure's ge geographic regions. It offers throughput, latency, availability and consistently guarantees with comprehensive service level agreements, something no other database service can offer. Azure Cosmos DB Capabilities Turnkey Global Distribution Multiple data models and popular APIs for accessing and querying data Elastically scale throughput and storage on demand worldwide Build highly responsive and mission critical applications Ensure always on availability Write globally distributed applications the right way. Money back guarantees. No database schema index management. Low cost of ownership. And now we'll see the Azure table storage. Azure Table Storage is a service that stores structured NoSQL data in the cloud, providing a key attribute store with a schemaless design. Because Table Storage is schemaless, schemaless, it's easy to adopt to your data as the needs of your application evolve. Access to Table Storage data is fast and cost effective for many types of applications, and it is lower, typically lower in cost than traditional SQL for similar volumes of data. You can use table storage to store flexible data sets like user data for web applications. Address books, device information or other types of metadata your service requires. You can store any number of entities in a table. And a storage account may contain any number of tables up to the capacity limit of the storage account. Azure Table Storage stores large amounts of structured data. The service is a NoSQL data store which accepts authenticated calls from inside and outside the Azure cloud. Azure tables are ideal for storing structured, non-relational data. Common uses of table storage Storing terabytes of structured data capable of serving web scale applications. Storing data sets that don't require complex joins, foreign keys or stored procedures and can be denormalized for fast access. Quickly querying data using a clustered index. Accessing data using the OData protocol and LINQ queries 
with WCF data service and .NET libraries. You can use table storage to store and query huge sets of structured, non-relational data and your tables will scale as demand increases. OK, so in this lesson we discussed uh, different Azure databases. Thanks for listening. I'll see you on the next lesson. In this lesson, we're looking to how to create an SQL database. For that, click on SQL databases. And then create SQL databases. We have to specify the database name up here. I'll call it new SQL. After that, we'll select the subscription and then create a new resource group. We'll give the resource group name as RGSQL. After that, select the source. Here I'll select the source as blank database. After that, I'll choose the server settings from here. Now here we're going to create a new server and we'll give the server a name over here in the top box. I'll give the server name PKALSQL. After that, enter the server admin login. Here I'll give the admin name as Kalyan P. After that, enter the password. Then I'll retype the password, select the location. Uh, click select to proceed further here's the option want to use the SQL elastic, elastic pool I'll choose not now then we have to choose the pricing tier so we'll click on that I'll choose the basic tier and click on apply to proceed. Click on create to proceed further. Here we can see that the new SQL database has been successfully created. Now we'll see the options for this SQL database. For that, click on SQL database. And we can see the overview of this SQL server up here. Server name, which can be used to access the SQL database. 
If you want to set a server rule, we can set the server firewall rule here. Just click on set server firewall. Here we have the option, allow this SQL to access Azure services. If there's any IP address which we are accessing from the outside of the Azure services, click on add client IP. This will add the client IP address from where we are accessing this Azure portal. If you want to add a new rule for the virtual machine, just click on a rule name. After that, give the virtual machine name. We have to choose the starting IP and ending IP address. I'm not going to add any rule here at the moment. Click on save to save the client IP address details. This will update the firewall settings for the SQL database. You'll get a success notification and you'll click on OK to proceed. We'll close out that window and from now on we can access this, this SQL server from the client machine for the IP address that we entered previously. Next we'll look at the activity log. Here we can see the activity log of this SQL database. If you want to add any tags we can add them here. If you want to query this SQL server click on query editor here. Click on login here. Enter the password of this SQL server and then click OK to proceed. Here we can see that we have successfully logged into the SQL database. We can see tables, views and stored procedures. Now we'll create a test database here. For that we'll issue the command create database test db and then click on run. And this will create our test database. We can see that the query has been successfully executed. We can query the SQL database from here. Next look at the pricing tier. If you want to change the pricing tier for this SQL database this is where we do it. So we've got four options. Basic, Standard, Premium and Premium RS which we discussed earlier. You can close this window. If you want to create any geo replication for this SQL database, just click on geo there, geo replication, and we can create a failover group here. First, we have to choose the location. Here, I'll choose the location as West India. After that we have to select the secondary type here. Just click, uh, click on secondary type. After that if we want to change the target server settings just click here. Now create a new server here and I'll give the target server name as TPKALSQL. Select the server admin name. I'll give the server admin name as Calium P. Uh, enter a password. 
and then retype the password. After that, click on select. And after that, set the pricing tier. To uh, This will create a failover server for this SQL database when you click OK. Here we can see that all the data has been replicated to the failover server. Here we can see the secondary server has been successfully created in the location West India. Now we'll see a few more options for the primary server. First click on Geo Replication. Here we can see that it's been successfully replicated to the secondary server at the secondary location. Next we'll look at auditing and threat detection. We can enable the auditing and threat detection over here. After that, uh, if we want to check any vulnerability assessment, we can do so just down here. We can see the vulnerability assessment here, and we can see data discovery and classification. Here we can see uh, the data discovery and classification details, and we can see dynamic data masking here. Next we can see transparent data encryption and we can enable the data encryption details here. If we don't want encryption then we can turn it off. After that we can see the connection settings here. We can get the connection strings for different applications here. And next we will see the sync to other databases. If you want to create any new sync group, click on add a new sync group here. Then we have to specify the sync group name, sync metadata, and we have to specify automatic sync conflict resolution. By specifying all these options, we'll create a new sync group and it will sync to other databases as well. After that, if we want to add Azure Search, we can do so here. And next we'll see the properties of this SQL database. These are the properties. If you want to create any locks, you can add it here. Next we can see the monitoring settings here. And this way we can create SQL database in Azure services. As well, we can also create a secondary database. Next, we'll see the secondary database. Just click on it here. You can see all the settings of this uh, SQL database. And we'll look at how to delete databases next. For that, go to Overview and then click on Delete. We have to type the database name here, i.e. new-sql. Click on Delete to proceed further. Here we can see the replication database and replication server. You can see the replication type, partner database and partner server. Just click on delete to proceed with this secondary SQL database. Here we can see that the secondary SQL server has been successfully removed. I'll remove this SQL server as well. 
So that click here and select delete. Click yes to proceed further. And here we can see that the SQL databases have been successfully removed. Now I'll just remove the resource group which we created for the SQL database. Just select it and then select delete resource group. After that enter the resource group name RGSQL in this instance and click on delete to proceed further. And you can see the resource group has been successfully removed. Alright, so we've discussed the SQL database in this lesson. Thanks for listening. I'll see you on the next lesson. In this lesson we'll discuss Azure database for MySQL Server. For that go to More Services and search for MySQL. Select Azure database for MySQL Servers. Now we'll create a new Azure database for MySQL Servers. Click on the blue button there. We'll enter the server name at the top. I'll specify the server name as my SQL01. Then I'll create a new resource group called RG MySQL. Here we can see that the server name is already in use. So I'll give the server name as CalMySQL. Server admin name CalYAMP. Cal after that, enter the password. We'll retype the password after that. and uh, select the location after that. Uh, I'll select Central India. We'll choose the MySQL version here. I'll, I'll choose the latest version and then we select the pricing tier. I'll select basic. After that, click OK to proceed further. Click on Create. This will create a new Azure database for MySQL servers. Here we can see that my, a new MySQL server has been successfully created. Now we'll see different options for this MySQL server. For that click on SQL server. In the overview options we can see the details of this MySQL server. If you want to reset the password uh, we can do that up here. And we can see more details of this MySQL server here. If you want to see the activity log, we can get the activity log details here. If you want to add any tags, we can add them here. Next we'll set up uh, different settings for this SQL server. If you want to add firewall rules, we can do so here. 
just click on connection security and you can see the setting options if you want to access SQL for different Azure services we can edit so up here so this uh, gives access to all Azure services If you want to set the SSL settings for this SQL database, this is where you enable it. You can add any firewall rules. If you want to add My IP, just click on Add My IP and we can add them here. Next, we'll see connection strings for different applications that we can use. Just copy the connection string settings and make use of these in the development of the application. And next we'll see the server parameters. These are all the server parameters for this MySQL server. If you want to change the pricing tier, this is where you do it. There are three options, basic, standard and premium. You can select any any one of these three. After that, if you want to see the properties, then you just click on properties and it shows you the MySQL server properties. And if you want to add locks, this is where you can do it. Uh, you can see the monitoring settings here. These are the monitoring details. Now we'll see how to connect to this MySQL server. Click on Cloud Shell. Here in the command MySQL host SQL server name and username. After that press enter. After that, enter the password. We've successfully logged into the MySQL server, which we created. Now we're in a few commands to test whether the MySQL server is working as it should be. First of all, run the command status. This shows the all the details of the server. We can create a new database, run the command, create database and then database name. After that press enter. We can see it's created uh, a new database here. Uh, if we want to see the databases we've created, run the command show databases. And you can see that these are all the databases that exist in, in this MySQL server. To quit from this MySQL server, type Q, backslash Q, and then press enter. So if we've quit from the server at the, this moment in time. Now we'll see how to delete this my, uh, de delete this MySQL server. Click on MySQL server, and at the top uh, under overview, you can see the delete button. Click on that. Type the uh, server name at the top. After that, we can see the databases that we're going to remove. Click on delete to proceed further. We can see that it's been successfully deleted. After that, go to the resource group and delete the resource group, which we've created for this MySQL server. Click on delete resource group. 
After that, type the resource group name here and then click delete. May take some time to delete this resource group. Here we can see that the resource group has been successfully removed. Alright, so a quick overview. In this lesson we discussed, the, uh, discussed Azure databases for MySQL Server. We'll discuss a new topic in the next lesson. Thanks for watching. In this lesson we're going to see how to create app services in the Azure portal. For that we go up to app services, click on create app services. These are all the existing app services which we can create on the Azure portal. We can directly work on uh, development of the application. There's no need to bother about any hardware profiles in the background. Azure will take care of all the server configurations for you. So basically this lets you concentrate on the development of the application. So we'll create a web app. Just click on the web app here. Click on create to proceed further. Enter the app name here. I'll enter the app name as Pakal, P A K A L. Select the subscription. After that, I'll create a new resource group. I'll give the resource group name RG App. After that, we have to choose the OS version. Uh, which we're going to use to develop the application. I'll choose the OS as Windows. Then we have to choose the app service or location. For that just click here. Click on create new. I'll select the location as South India. After that we can choose a pricing tier. I'll choose the free one for now. You can peruse all the benefits of all the other ones in your own time. Click on select. We have to give the app service plan name here. I'll call it my app. And then click on OK to proceed further. After that we can choose the application insights down here. Applicant application insights help you detect and diagnose um, any quality issues with the application that we are developing. For now we'll not select this option. Click on create to proceed further. Here we can see the web application has been successfully running and now we'll see more details of this application service. For that just click on application and we can see more details of this application service from the overview. Now we'll test 
whether the app service is working uh, correctly or not. Copy the uh, URL and we'll paste this into a tab, a browser tab. Alright, so the app service is working correctly at the moment. So this is uh, how we deploy an application in the Azure portal. We'll look at more details of this application service. Here we can see that the FTP host name and uh, we can upload the files to this FTP location from here. After that we can see the activity log. If we want to add tags we can do so here. If we want to diagnose and solve problems we can select it here. And we can diagnose these solutions from here. Next we'll look at the deployment settings. Just click on quick start. Here we can develop an application on this app service. Next we'll look at deployment credentials. You can add deployment credentials for FTP here. Next we'll see deployment slots. We can add a deployment slot here. We'll look at deployment options and we have to choose source. So click on choose source and you can choose any source for the, uh, the de this deployment option. I'll choose the local git repository and after that set up basic authentication. Here we have to give the deployment username and password after that the performance test and next option is continuous delivery preview if you want to configure this one we have to click on configure and we'll see the settings of this application service click on application settings and we can see general settings here. We can see .NET Framework, PHP version, Python version and different versions of this application. After that if we want we can enable the debugging mode and after that we can see application settings. If we want to add any new setting we can add here. If we want to edit connection settings we can edit here. After that we can see the default documents here. If you want to add a new document we can add here. And here we can see the handler mappings. Finally we can see the virtual application and directories. If you want to add any new virtual application directories we can add here. Next we'll look at authentication or authorization. If you want to enable app service authorization, we can do so here. Next, we'll see manage service identity. If we want to register with Azure Active Directory, we can enable it here. If you want to enable backups with this app service, we can enable it here. Next we'll look at custom domains. If you want to add any custom domains this is where we do it. If you want to add uh, SSL certificates just click on this tab here. And next is network settings which can be edited here. Likewise we can see many settings for this app service. If you want to add My MySQL in this app you can click the My SQL in App button and then we can configure MySQL.
Next we'll see the app properties. Here we can see the app service details. If you want, we can see the app service plan here. If we want to see the quota settings, we can do so here. And if we want to change the app service plan, just click on change app service plan. Now we can see development tools. If we want to clone the app, just click on clone app. If you want to see the console, just click on the console. Next we'll see advanced tools. Likewise we can see many development tools here. Next we'll see mobile settings for this app service. Just click on easy tables to create a table for this app service. To configure easy tables click here to continue. We can create an easy table database here. For now I'm not creating any databases. After that we can see easy APIs and data connections. Likewise we can see many settings for this app service. Have another look through in your own time and by all means have a play and try different things. But we've reached the end of this lesson for now. Thanks for watching. In this lesson we'll discuss additional Azure services. First we'll look at web apps. Web apps is a service for hosting web applications, REST APIs and mobile backends. You can develop in your favourite language, for example .NET, .NET Core, Java, Ruby, Node.js, PHP or Python. You can run and scale apps with ease on Windows or Linux virtual machines. Web apps not only add the power of Microsoft Azure to your application such as security, load balancing, auto scaling and automated management. You can also take advantage of its DevOps capabilities such as continuous deployment from VSTS, GitHub, Docker Hub and other sources, package management, staging environments, custom domain and SSL certificates. With App Service, you pay for the Azure compute resources you use. The compute resources you use is determined by the app service plan that you run your web apps on. Web app benefits. Multiple languages and frameworks, DevOps optimization, global scale with high availability, connections to SAS platforms and on-premises data, security and compliance, application templates, visual studio integration. Now we'll look at the app service. Azure app service environment is an Azure app service feature that provides a fully isolated and dedicated environment 
for securely running app service apps at high scale. This capability can host your web apps, mobile apps, API apps and functions. App service environments ASEs are appropriate for applications and workloads that require a very high scale, isolation and secure network access, high memory utilization. Customers can create multiple ASEs within a single Azure region or across multiple Azure regions. This flexibility makes ASEs ideal for horizontally scaling stateless application tiers in support of high RPS workloads. Next we'll look at Azure Functions. Azure Functions is a serverless compute service that enables you to run code on demand without having to explicitly provision or manage the infrastructure. Use Azure Functions to run a script or a piece of code in response to a variety of events. Azure Functions is a solution for easily running small pieces of code or functions in the cloud. You can write just the code you need for the problem at hand without worrying about a whole application or the infrastructure to run it. Functions can make development even more productive and you can use your development language of choice such as C++, F++, Node.js, Python or PHP. Pay only for the time your code runs and trust Azure to scale as needed. Azure Functions let you develop serverless applications on Microsoft Azure. Features of Azure Functions Choice of language Paper use pricing model Bring your own dependencies, integrated security, simplified integration, flexible support, open source. Azure Functions is a great solution for processing data, integrating systems, working with the Internet of Things and building simple APIs and microservices. Azure Functions integrates with various Azure and third-party services. These services can trigger your function and start execution or they can serve as input and output for your code. The following service integrations are supported by Azure Functions. Azure Cosmos DB Azure Event Hubs Azure Mobile Apps, Azure Notification Hubs, Azure Bus Service Queues, Azure Storage, GitHub, On-Premises, Toilo. Now we'll look at the Azure Container Service. The Azure Container Service makes it simple to create, configure and manage a cluster of virtual machines that are pre-configured to run containerized applications. This enables you to use your existing skills or draw upon a large and growing body of community expertise to deploy and manage container-based applications on Microsoft Azure. It uses an optimised configuration of popular open source scheduling and orchestration tools. This enables you to use your existing skills or draw upon a large and growing body of community expertise to deploy and manage container based applications on Microsoft Azure.
Now we'll look at Azure Batch. Azure Batch is a platform service for running large scale, parallel and high performance computing applications efficiently in the cloud. Azure Batch schedules compute intensive work on a run on a managed collection of virtual machines and can automatically scale compute resources to meet the needs of your jobs. With Azure Batch you can easily define Azure compute resources to execute your applications in parallel and at scale. There's no need to manually create, configure and manage a HPC cluster, individual virtual machines, virtual networks or a complex job and task scheduling infrastructure. Azure Batch automates or simplifies these tasks for you. Now we'll look at Service Fabric. Azure Service Fabric is a distributed systems platform that makes it easy to package, deploy and manage scalable and reliable microservices and containers. Service Fabric also addresses the significant challenges in developing and managing cloud and native applications. Developers and administrators can avoid complex infrastructure problems and focus on implementing mission critical demanding workloads that are scalable, reliable and manageable. Service Fabric represents the next generation platform for building and managing these enterprise class tier 1 cloud scale applications running in containers. Next we'll see Web and Mobile. Web App is a fully managed compute platform that's optimised for hosting websites and web applications. Customers can use App Service on Linux to host web apps natively on Linux for supported application stacks. Mobile apps in Azure App Service build native iOS, Android or Windows apps or cross-platform apps using Xamarin or Cordova. Azure Search adds search capabilities to your custom web or mobile apps using Azure Search, a managed cloud search service. Security and identity. Security Center to get visibility into and control over the security of your Azure resources. Key Vault to safeguard and manage cryptographic keys and secrets used by cloud applications and services. Synchronize directories and enable single sign on with Azure Active Directory. All right, we've covered quite a few additional services there. Thanks for listening. In this lesson, we'll discuss a few more Azure services. First, we'll discuss Azure Functions.
after that go to more services and search for functions. After that you can select function apps. Azure Function is a serverless compute service that enables us to run code on demand. We don't actually have to explicitly provision or manage infrastructure. Here I'm not creating any uh, new Azure functions as of now. I just wanted to show you the facility. Now we'll look at Azure containers. Go to the more services and search for containers and you'll see container services there. Azure Container Instances offer the fastest and simplest way to run a container in Azure. Again, you don't have to provision any virtual machine and you don't have to adopt a higher level service. To create container services, just click on Create Container Services. You have to fill in all these configuration details if you want to create the container services. Now, I'm not going to create any because it's not required more than this for the exam. We'll look at another Azure service instead. We'll look at Batch. Go to More Services and search for Batch. Batch Accounts. Azure Batch is to run larger scale, parallel and high performance computing batch jobs efficiently in Azure. Azure Batch creates and manages a pool of compute nodes. It installs applications that we want to run and schedules jobs to run on the nodes. To create batch accounts, just click on Create Batch Accounts. You have to fill in the account name, subscription, resource group, location and storage account. By filling in all these details we can create a batch account. Next we'll see another Azure service. Service is Fabric Azure Service. So we'll click on more and search for fabric and we'll see service fabric clusters. The Azure service fabric is a distributed systems platform. It makes it easy to package, deploy and manage scalable and reliable microservices and containers. To create a service fabric cluster, just click on the button here. Again, you have to fill in all of the fields before you do so. We can also change the operating system to one of our choice. Next we'll see queue storage. For that go to the storage account, select storage account And we can see queue storage here. Just click on that. Azure Key Storage is a service for storing large numbers of messages. These can be accessed from anywhere in the world for authenticated calls using HTTPS or HTTP. To create a new queue, just click here. Here I'll give the queue name as Q2. After that, click OK. This will create a new queue storage. You can uh, see a few more options here. You can edit the metadata. Access policy details can be edited here. And you can delete the queues just at the bottom here. 
You can click yes if you want to delete the selected storage queues. Next we'll see table storage. For that go to storage accounts and select the storage account where the table storage account exists. We can see the table storage here. Just click on tables. Azure Table Storage is a service that stores structured NoSQL data in the cloud providing a key store with a schemeless design. To create a new table just click up here. We need to give the table a name. Here I'll give the table name as Table 2. After that click OK. This will create a new table storage. We can edit the access policy here. If you want to uh, delete this table storage just click on delete table storage. Click on yes to proceed further. In this way we can create table storage as uh, the Azure portal. Next we'll see Azure Cosmos DB. Azure Cosmos DB is a Microsoft globally distributed multi-model database. To create Azure Cosmos DB just click on the create Azure Cosmos DB button. Here we have to give the ID, API, subscription resource group and location details to create a new Cosmos DB. Now I'm not going to create any at the moment. So we'll just come out of that. Now we want to look at Redis. So I'll type Redis and it's Redis caches we're looking for. Redis caches is uh, based on a popular open source Redis cache. It gives you access to securely dedicated Redis caches managed by Microsoft and accessible from any application within Azure. To create Redis cache just click here. Here we have to give the DNS name, subscription, resource group, location and pricing tier details. After giving all the details we can create the Redis cache. Now I'm not going to create any here. Now we'll see the site recovery. For that go to more services and search for recovery. Select recovery service vaults. Azure, recovery, uh, Azure site recovery helps us to ensure business continuity by keeping business apps and workloads running during outages. To create a recovery service vault, just click on Create Recovery Service Vaults. Enter the name, subscription, resource group name and location. After creation of the recovery service vault, all the applications are replicated to the secondary region. In this way we can make sure that all of our services are available across all the regions in case of any outage. Next we'll look at HD Insight. You'll see HD Insight clusters when you do a search. This is a fully managed full spectrum open source and analytic service designed for enterprises. To create HD Insight clusters just click on create HD Insight Clusters on the blue button. You have to fill in all these options to create a new HD Insight Cluster. To create custom size settings and apps just select here. 
After filling in all these details we can create a new HD Insight cluster. Next we'll see Dev Test Labs. For that go to More Services and search for Dev. Here we can see the Dev Test Labs. Developers and testers will use this service. Azure Dev Test Labs is a service that helps developers and testers. They can quickly create environments in Azure while minimizing waste and controlling cost. To create a new Dev Test Lab, just click it down here. Next we'll see Security Center. More services, do a search for security. Select Security Center. And here we can see the overview of this security. Here we can see the recommendations, security solutions, alerts, events, etc. This will automatically provide prevention for compute networking, storage and data. If you want to see the solutions for any particular service just click on the service under prevention. It will automatically display any recommendations. In this way, you can see the security center details. You can see recommendations on the left, security solutions under prevention. Next, we'll see activity, uh, sorry, log an analytics. You can search for logs. And here we can see log analytics. Log Analytics is a service in Azure that monitors our cloud. To create Log Analytics, just click on Create Log Analytics here. After that, select Create New and specify OMS Workspace, Subscription, Resource Group and Location. We can choose the pricing tier here and after that click on create. This will create logs for the Azure services. Next we'll see the scheduler. For that go to more services and search for schedule. Click on scheduler uh, job collections. The Azure Scheduler allows us to declaratively describe actions that need to run in the cloud. To create a scheduler job, just click on the blue button. You have to sp uh, specify the name and job collection to be configured. Select Create New here. We have to give the name of the job and select the pricing tier. I'll choose the free one. I'll specify the resource group and location. That's a brief summary of how you do it. Again, you can do some more of this in your own time. After selecting this pricing tier, you have to choose the subscription, action settings and schedule. Next we'll see Azure Advisor. For that go to More Services, search for Advisor, select Advisor. Azure Advisor is a personalized cloud consultant that helps us follow best practices to optimize our Azure deployments. Here we can see the overview of the Advisor. 
we can see the advisor is loading. And here we can see the high availability, security, performance and cost. If you want to see the sticky uh, security recommendations, just click here. Here we can see the follow security center recommendations. In this way we can get advice advices from the um, recommendation advisor. Click on high availability if you want to see that. The performance advisors we can select here. And you'll see any recommendations that may be suggested or not. Next we'll see application insights. For that go to more services and search for insights. Just select application insights. This is an extensible application performance management service. It's aimed at web developers building and managing apps on multiple platforms. To create application insights just click on Create Application Insights and you have to give the name, application type, subscription, resource group and location. After that click on Create to create application insights. We won't do it at the moment. So that's covered uh, quite a few of the um, extra parts that I didn't mention earlier. Please have a look in your own time. Have a play with it on your free trial and I'll see you in the next lecture. Thanks for listening. Okay, we've come to the end of the course, so here's a project we've put together for you to attempt. Don't worry too much if you get a bit stuck, you can always look back at the earlier videos. In this picture we can see three virtual machines, Windows Azure Load Balancer, a user who's accessing the Load Balancer. In this project, create three virtual machines and open port 80 for all three virtual machines. Also create a load balancer and make use of it uh, for all three virtual machines. Open port 80 for that load balancer as well. After that, uh, which, which whoever the user is accessing the data load balancer must access the data. Okay. Have fun with the project, read the Azure documentation also. But uh, we've come to the end of the course, I hope you enjoyed it. Drop some comments on the forum and most of all please uh, let us know when you pass the exam. Best of luck.